Hello. Hi. How are you? Good. Um, have you gotten the Google Doc link yet? Okay. So you've got two POs listed on there. Um, one of them is going to uh, preside session one. One of them is going to preside session two. Um, you know, do a put their names in random.org and see what it spits out. This is this is normally where we'd have them draw numbers, but you know, yeah. for, um, and then I mean, other than that, you know, the two sessions go. Okay. And everything's good. Great. And then um, docket? Do they set docket or is it preset? Um, the um, there there are two separate dockets: one for session one, one for session two. Okay. So they're preset. All right. Great. Yeah. They'll, they'll set at the boat. They'll set the agenda at the beginning of each. Okay. Um, awesome. Yeah. And then at the at the end of session two, um, you'll have an option to mark best presiding officer. Uh, and if you could also just text me your choice so that we just make sure that what's in the computer matches what you actually want. Okay. And then we're good. And that's just me since I'm the parlor, right? Yeah, yeah. Can we be given the um, ability to go ahead and rename ourselves? Oh, you know what? Let me make the parliamentarian the host. That's one reason I came in here. Yeah. All right, you should be able to rename and the parley is now the host. Awesome. Hi, Jordy. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Hanging in there. Another beautiful day in sunny Las Vegas. <laughs> mm. All right. If you need anything, you've got my number. Uh, you know, let me know. Um, you know, otherwise, I will leave you to it. So it starts in about 15 minutes here and then... How many, how many contestants are there again? Uh, there should be 12. Okay. So, yeah. And in the session where the um, alternate PO isn't presiding, they are a full speaker, you know, eligible to be ranked and everything like that. Great. So we have 12 contestants, four judges, so there should be 16 people total, not including. Mm -hmm. So yep. we don't have six people here right now. Should we wait till 1155 and then discuss docket then? Or fifty um, or until they arrive. I know we're waiting on a couple people, but just to get a sense of which two bills we want to do before we set order, yeah. did anybody want to do the one regarding abortion clinics? Okay, it's okay. I know. <laughs> Senator we can Martinez. put that third. Then let's yeah, we can third. put it third. And worst comes to worst, if you don't want to speak up, excuse me, on the second one, you can speak on the third. No, it's okay. Okay, cool. Um, anybody else opposed to skipping that one? Okay, well, let's wait for everybody and then I'll ask again, but it's good to know just so we can keep that in mind. Uh, I have a quick question for the parley. Sure. Can you let us know who the two POs are for this round? Yes. Uh, they are Senators Crowley and Tom. I'm going to, I think, right. flip a coin to decide who goes first per tab. That's what and they then do. So after they do their coin flip, why don't we ask what the um, presiding officers would prefer to speak on? That way we ensure that their, what the bill that they want to speak on gets preferred. Yeah, so I guess I guess what I'll do is I'll flip the, the the coin to determine who gets to choose which session they want. I think that's sort of how we'll go at it. Um, let me find a coin. Google Coin works too. <laughs> or you can have Siri flip a coin. Yeah, that's what our last parlay okay. did. Like, <laughs> I like that idea. I will do, I will do Siri. Let me get my phone. <laughs> so how is everyone's day going? Fun, I guess everybody's here. It's like we've come like full circle. I've seen um, most of you.
let's get splits before we go ahead and we set the docket so that everyone like we know where everyone's going to um figure that part out two four is everyone present i'm counting right now two four six eight ten eleven we're missing one contestant I think. Senator Verma, I, I don't know if you were here when we announced it, but um, you won't be on the PO track. You got your speaking. Just I, I know you. Um, we were talking about that. Like they just told us. I don't know if you missed it though. Not POing. Okay. We have fifteen. We're just waiting on one more. Okay. Yeah, so just to clarify, Senator Crowley is a PO, and who is the second PO? Yeah, Crowley and Tong. Uh, so I'm going to assign Crowley heads and Tong tails, and then oh, thank you. Syria flip for me. And then whoever whoever wins that that coin flip gets to determine which session they want to PO. Um, are both of you here? Just checking because we can just do it now. Okay, cool. I'll just do it yeah. now. So Crowley is heads, tongue is tail. I'm gonna put it up here so everyone can hear it. Okay, Siri, flip a coin for me. Is that, is that how we do it? It's heads. <laughs> okay, so Crowley, you get to decide which session you want. Um, I'll preside the second session. Okay. Then Senator Tong, you're gonna take it over for me real soon. Yep. Since everyone's here, can we go ahead and get splits now? All right. Uh, okay, so first for pharmaceuticals. How many people wish to go on the affirmation? Can you please raise your hand or placard? One, two. I was hoping. Okay. Sorry, two? I was hoping to sponsor as well. You want to sponsor? Okay. So, okay, so two, um, three. Okay, three people want to go on the affirmation. All those who wish to go on the negation for pharmaceuticals, please raise your hand or placard. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, that's quite a bit. Okay. You do C first because if there's a better even split, it would make a lot more sense. Yeah, that's why yes. we're going to go ahead and get um, split before we set the docket. Yeah, I can go off on that bill for okay. pharma supply chains. Yes, that'd be great. That'd be very great. Um, okay, vaccines. Who wants to go off on vaccines? One, two, three, four, five, six. All those who wish to go neg on vaccines? One, two, three. That sounds slightly better. Okay. Yeah. Can we do C first? I mean, I like both bills. I just prefer C first. Yeah, I'm okay with C then okay, A. Instead of using numbers like C or A, let's actually use just the, the titles to make it a little bit more clear. Oh, I'm sorry, but the vaccine one. Yeah, okay. Wait, wait, one second, um, Senator Gorin. So for yeah. um, Senator Crowley and Tong, which one does like, do either of you have one that you don't want to do out of those two so we can take that into account? Well, I'm POing this session because uh, Senator Crowley already chose um, her preferred session, so. Oh, okay, we're doing, okay. I thought it was like split in the middle. Yeah, that makes more sense, okay. Um, and then for the last one, if we were to do crisis pregnancy centers, who wishes to go AF? One, two, three on the negation. So either we have like people who are not yet, who are not voting or, okay, uh, Senator Farage, what were you saying? I'm just trying to like pull up my case to see which one to do. Okay. Wait, do you think we're only gonna get through two, right? So there's a high probability that we'll only get, only get through two, but the thing is, if we end up with like, we can't have three speeches done on the same cycle, so, um, so, I'm sorry, on the same side. So putting in a third one, just in case that ever happens so that everyone can get in their two speeches. Okay, and then for the POs, um, we're I think of taking a 10 minute recess in between so you guys have time to like maneuver your sheets and stuff like that. So I think there's, that will account for some time too. There's one, um, um, we're each POing different session. sessions. Oh, I forgot, my I bad. I was confused bad. about that too. I yeah. was like, oh yeah, it's just one session. Then I was like, wait, there's two. Yeah, okay. two sessions. I mean, can I just say something? Um, on the split on the first one and the the second one, if I remember correctly, it's like five three. Five three doesn't mean you call cycle. Like, if we could get everyone to actually vote on that, just to see where they are, and at least try to commit to one side. I mean, I think that would probably be a good okay. thing. So why don't we go ahead and we redo, we re vote on everything? 
Okay. Um, so I would just say that like quickly, there are some people who prefer speaking like late round and haven't made that determination yet. So that's why I'm personally not voting in these, if that makes sense. Okay. That makes a little bit more sense. Okay. So all those who wish to go on the affirmation of vaccines and know for sure at this moment, please raise your hand or placard. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. On the negation of vaccines. One, two, three, Okay, so if uh, four, so if anyone's prepping, we need more neg on vaccines. All those who wish to go AF on pharmaceuticals, please raise your hand or placard. One, two, three, three. Okay, all those who wish to go on the negation of pharmaceuticals, please raise your hand or placard. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so if anyone wishes to go ahead and speak on um, vaccines and hasn't decided yet, we need more neg. And then we'll go ahead and just get the splits for the last one, just in case, okay? Everyone who wants to go app on pregnancy centers, please raise your hand or your placard. One, two, three. Okay, all those who wish to go on the negation? None, okay. So good thing we have that listed as the last bill because we'll most likely not um, prioritize that. Um, I'm prepared to sponsor vaccines. And if anyone wants to, it'll be up to the presiding officer gods, yeah. we'll just see what happens. I was thinking about sponsoring that one as well. So we'll see and what happens. Senator Dilip Kumar, which one were you planning to sponsor? Um, pharmaceuticals. Okay, so that would that would probably be very helpful. And then for, for the rest of it, it'll be up to chance. Sorry, just a question. So is the split more even for the vaccines one? Because I thought they were both not. Yeah, I think we're going to start with vaccines because it was pretty even. And then pharma had like one off, but we can figure it out like maybe during that break or after people speak, they can start prepping. You know, that's um, Okay, I'll nominate them that as the docket. Okay. Vaccines, pharma, and then crisis. I can go ahead and write that into the chat here. Yeah, we have everyone now, so I, I can informally open up that docket nominations. If, if um, I'm going to go ahead and prefer or nominate one with pharma first because, unless I'm wrong, I thought that had a more even split. No, I think vaccines has a more even split. I think okay. as people said, I think she had mistakenly said pharma after we took, I mean, vaccines after we took the one for pharma. But yeah, the first one that we split on was vaccines. That was pretty even. Second one was pharma and it was a little bit uneven. Mm -hmm. So are we, is there two or just one nomination right now? So um, there's only one. Okay. Yeah. But we'll, nom we'll nominate the docket after the PO takes over in two minutes. Okay. Let's see. Something for me to do. Sorry, I'm a little bit confused. So for the vaccines one, is it that people need to flip to the negation or just that people who currently don't have a speech need to write one for the negation? That's correct, the latter of your, of your two statements. And in the chat right now, I'm going to send my uh, presiding officer sheet. Let me know if you can't see it or if you can. Do we have all the judges? It's four judges, 12 competitors. Yep, everybody's here. Cool, cool, cool. Wait, sorry, I was one of the people that like flipped on like the, the vaccine one. What side wasn't heavy again? Um, vaccines, we need more neg. We need more, okay. okay. Uh, yeah, Judge Mayor, I uh, just wanted to see if you're here. Awesome.
This is a very long minute. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, it is officially 3 p.m. Eastern time. I'm going to turn it over to Senator Tong, who is our presiding officer, uh, who will officially begin this session. All righty. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, I have no idea what time of day it is anymore. Uh, my name is Senator William Tong, that's spelled T-O-N-G, from the state of Illinois. Uh, and I'm going to be your presiding officer for this first semifinal session. Can you believe it? We have two of these. So buckle up, everyone. This is going to be a fun ride. Um, I'm just going to go straight into my uh, presiding officer procedure. Uh, basically, pretty standard compared to what you've been used to for the past four uh, sessions. I'm going to have a standard NSDA timing signal. So there's this green card at two minutes, yellow at two and a half minutes having elapsed, then red at two minutes and 55 seconds having elapsed. I'm going to put up both hands once you get to three minutes, and I'll count you down to 310. I'll let you finish your sentence, but then afterward, I'm going to cut you off. For questioning, we'll be using 30 second blocks of direct questioning. So that's back and forth. After all sponsors and first negations, uh, we're going to have four such blocks. And then after all subsequent speeches on any piece of legislation, we'll have two of such blocks. For that, I'm just going to wait until you get to 25 seconds, then give you a 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Cut you off right after. I'm going to call on speakers and questioners separately, first with randomness, then precedence and recency. Uh, so precedence and recency, just as a reminder, are um, the number of times you have spoken, as well as the uh, when you last spoke. Um, everyone here should basically know what those are referring to, but just in case you need the clarification. All right, if you wish to make a motion, vote on legislation or a motion, uh, speak, question, etc. just raise your placard to the camera. And before we continue, could everyone just raise it to the camera right now so we have it positioned well, you we don't have any problems going further. All right, Senator Gorin. Great, thank you, we'll put those down. Um, because the tournament rules do not allow for me to run an open chamber, unfortunately, uh, I'm going to ask that if you need to leave the chamber that you make a point of personal privilege in the chat. I'll respond to that as quick as possible. I'm going to ask that no more than two senators are gone at a time from the chamber um, so as to respect your fellow competitors and that you only leave in between speeches or in between speeches and questioning. Unless it's, uh, and, and then that two person rule, obviously, unless it's an emergency, if I can see you doing the bathroom jitters in your seat, then um, I'm just gonna let you go. Uh, if you wish to make an amendment, uh, kind of same deal as before, you would just put it in the chat, uh, say, I move to submit an amendment to the presiding officer, and then we'll walk through the motions with that. Finally, for some online specific procedures, number one, if you would like to use a personal timer during your speech. I'm completely fine with that as long as the judges and the parliamentarian are. Uh, just remember that my time signals do take precedence, so make sure to pay attention to those. Also, if you freeze or are otherwise rendered completely inaudible for seven or more consecutive seconds during your speech, I'm going to stop your timer, tell you first in the chat, then uh, verbally that you have frozen, and we're gonna wait for you to fix the problem uh, and then I'll consult with the judges and the parliamentarian as to when you should start uh, in your speech. The tournament has provided for about 10 minutes of tech time if we need any of those uh, things to be accommodated for. And then obviously because equity is an important goal um, for not only me as a presiding officer, but, but for the tournament as a whole, we will uh, wait for people and let you figure out your internet problems. Are there any questions? Senator Yoon. This is actually a question for the parliamentarian, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, how hard is the hard cap? Uh, you mean the? I mean, so far we have not had a hard hard stop um, in you know false tournaments. So I imagine that it's going to be the same. Okay, thank you. But you know, you guys only have an hour between uh, sessions, so and you probably want to get through. So we'll 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 see as as we go. Um, mm -hmm. Any other questions? If not, then I'll take agenda nominations. Are there any such nominations? Senator Farage. Assuming the floor is already open for docket nominations, I move to nominate docket A, which consists of first, vaccines, second, pharma, and third, pregnancy crisis centers. Are there any other nominations? Seeing none, I'm going to close the floor. That means 
The docket for this session consists of first vaccines, which I believe is SF1C, then big, uh, then uh, pharmaceutical uh, supply chains, which is SF1A, and then finally crisis pregnancy centers, which is SF1B. Does anyone need me to send the legislation or read the legislation for that matter? If not, then uh, we'll proceed with debate. Thank you, Senator Farage. Um, the first uh, item off the docket is the legislation regarding vaccines. Are there any sponsors? Uh, Senator Martinez. Thank the chair. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Senator Martinez. I'm speaking on the affirmation of this bill as the sponsor. If any of my judges, parliamentarian or presiding officer are not ready, let me know. But other than that, I am always ready to begin. Thank you. This Tuesday, I'm taking my family on a special trip to CVS. We're finally getting vaccinated. I am thankful that we are afforded peace of mind knowing that we can safely access vaccines and medical attention. But for thousands of Americans in our diverse nation, it is impossible to overcome the rejection and challenges they've experienced from the healthcare system. So first, let's access the problem with clinical vaccine trials. Clinical studies need to reflect the population better. First, let's understand how clinical studies for vaccines occur and what the Food and Drug Administration must do. The FDA on December 14th of last year explains that there are three phases. In phase one, generally healthy and unexposed people are used as subjects. While in phase three, the problems in prior stages are alleviated and compared against a placebo. Phase two is what we wish to target, in which subjects with varying health issues and of diverse backgrounds are meant to be tested. The issue is, unfortunately, these key groups are not being allowed to participate. And this is especially problematic in when reflecting our nation's demographics that currently Black Americans account for roughly 13%, but make up only 5% of clinical trial participants. Latinos account for roughly 19% of the population in the US, but make up only 1% of all clinical trial participants. Because of racial and ethnic factors, many different medical afflictions are not properly being studied. This also extends into other groups underrepresented in clinical trials. Spong and Bianchi write for the Journal of American Medical Association on January 23rd of 2018, explaining that children, older adults, pregnant and lactating women, and individuals with physical and intellectual disabilities have limited evidence-based therapies optimized to their specific medical needs. Yet combined, these groups comprise as much as 58% of the US population. Our medical data ought to properly represent the people that make up our country, which is why I propose we adopt standards for the FDA to initiate when overseeing clinical vaccine trials. Section one of my legislation outlines that the administration will now use more stringent standards. This is further explained in section two, where we outline several requirements. The first, including restricting majority homogenous studies kept at 60%, and emphasizing efforts to keep clinical trials diverse in age, gender, race, and health circumstances. In fact, the good thing is we've already started. In November of 2020, the FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research issued a comprehensive guidance statement recommending standards of diversity within clinical vaccine trials. And some of the recommendations include methods like making eligibility easier and medical services more accessible. In fact, beginning efforts to improve diversity are truly making a difference. The Kaiser Family Foundation tells us on January 26th of 2021 that even though their trial diversity was not perfect, Pfizer and Moderna made efforts to be more diverse than any other previous vaccine study in their COVID-19 clinical vaccine trials. Yet the independent data they collected found nearly similar data. It's time we confront the disparity between healthcare and diversity in the US. The first step to bridging that gap is my legislation. Thank you, Senator, for that speech of three minutes and one second. Three minutes and one second. Questioners, please raise your placards. Any and all? All right. I will go first to Senator Yoon. I thank the chair. So, Senator, are marginalized people banned from joining clinical trials, or are they hesitant to join them in the first place and thus are, like, underrepresented? They're hesitant to join them in the first place, and also there's limited access to where these clinical trials occur. Well, I would argue there isn't limited access, just not enough people sign up. If a group distrusts Big Pharma because of historical wrongdoing, why should we incentivize these companies to like go after them? Right. So a lot of companies like Pfizer and Moderna made efforts to increase trust with those communities. And part of that is also investing- Why in is that a good thing? Because more people participate in trials, so we have better- Thank you. Thank you, Hey, Senator. So in the past, if I go to get a clinical trial, are there usually more seats available than people signing up? I'm not sure you could tell me. 
yeah, of course, most clinical trials take a long time to get full. If we add all these stringent concerns under today's legislation, wouldn't it take much longer for a trial to be completed? No, because one of the recommendations from the FDA was making eligibility easier. The stringent standards are for so you're saying it should be easier for people to get experimental it's therapies, easy. even if there could be easier for people safety to concerns. qualify because a lot of people of color have to have a medical certification. So vaccine producers like Pfizer and Moderna are already working towards more diversity, right? Yes. If the private industry is already doing that, why do we need government intervention telling them what to do? Right. So that's just Pfizer and Moderna. We don't see that with other major pharmaceutical companies. There's a lot of big pharma companies in the United States that aren't making those efforts. That's why when I tell you that there's a lack of diversity in clinical trials, it's greatly affected because people of color aren't participating. There's only a handful of vaccine manufacturers in the country. That's two of the biggest ones. Thank you, uh, Senator Crowley. How effective were Pfizer and Moderna in increasing diversity in their trials? I mentioned that they weren't effective as other companies, but they were greatly improved in diversity than any other vaccine trial historically. Right. So even if you increase access, doesn't there still exist this distrust that makes minor marginalized communities not want to participate in trials? Right. That's why the FDA made these recommendations to improve trust in the medical, like in the healthcare system. And part of Right, but so the FDA has already done that. So what access, access teaches healthcare. under case bill? Thank you, and there's the time has elapsed. Thank, Thank you. Negation speakers, please raise your placards. Any and all negation speakers. It's quite early in the debate for there to be such one-sided debate. Let me check the chat. Okay, uh, thank you for the parliamentarian for letting us know. Okay. Um, the chair highly frowns upon a one-sided debate, but it must go on. So all Motion. Senator Verma. I move to a quick 30-second in-house recess. Seconds. Any objections? 30 seconds starts now. Okay, so who has a neg prepped or is almost done prepping one? Yeah, I thought we had like four people. Oh, I have a neg, but it'll take me like five minutes to finish up. I flipped, I flipped like at the last second. I was going out. So I don't have like a full fleshed out. Yeah, I guess I can flip too, but I'm not ready yet. How much time would you need? It kind of depends on who else speaks because it kind of depends on the clash in the round as well. Great. 30 I seconds. Well, you all were supposed to come prepared to some. I thought you guys had like ready. All right. The 30 second recess is up. Um, would you like to extend that or are we going to move on with an affirmative speech? Senator Frosch. I move to extend this recess by an extra two minutes. Seconds. Any objections? Seeing none, it's two minutes just now. I'll be ready in two. All right, all the judges are back. We have about 15 seconds left. The recess has elapsed.
there are no other motions, then we'll continue with the debate. Negation speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Dilip Kumar, thank you. Hi, everybody. That's Senator Dilip Kumar. I'm just going to ask if anybody is not ready to let me know. If not, I'll just get started in about 10 seconds. Everybody's good. Very good. Good. Perfect. <clears throat> As the, COVID, as the COVID-19 vaccination drive began in the United States, many doctors described receiving the vaccine as a dose of hope. But it seems what today's debate desperately needs is a dose of reality. Let's understand the reality of today's legislation. So what's the biggest cost when you pass? It's endangering the speed of vaccine production in the United States. In, fa in fact, Caroline Chen of ProPublica explains on February 11, 2021, that clinical trials in children, which this re re legislation requires for authorization of a vaccine, require age de-escalation studies, where researchers slowly move into lower age groups to study the effects of a vaccine safety and eff effectiveness. So why do they do this? That's because children, especially young children, often require lower dosage levels of a vaccine to achieve the same levels of efficacy as adults. Certain vaccines actually require you to reformulate the drug altogether for use in children. So when you pass today's legislation and require children to, include, to be included in those clinical studies before you authorize the vaccine in the first place, there's two possible options that pharmaceutical companies can do. First of all, you incentivize pharma companies to skip the de-escalation process altogether. That's incredibly dangerous because you're increasing the risk of adverse events to the children participating in the trials. Senator Martinez, you wanna improve faith in these vaccines? Let's start by not forcing these companies to endanger their participants in the process. But second and far more likely, pharma companies now have to wait until they finish the de-escalation studies before they get authorized by the FDA. Senator Martinez talked about the effectiveness of the Pfizer and Moderna clinical trials. Let's use those trials as a template to quantify just how long that additional wait is. The U.S. National Library of Medicine explains on April 13th, 2021, that age de-escalation studies of the Moderna COVID vaccine in children ages 6 months to 12 years aren't expected to be finished until June 2023. That's two and a half years after the FDA gave an emergency use authorization for the Moderna vaccine in adults. The ultimate cost of this legislation is the lost time between beginning a trial and authorizing that vaccine. Hundreds of thousands of Americans die while we wait for these studies to finish. The affirmation tells you about the harms of a less strict vaccination process. In the worst case scenario, we've seen one life lost because of COVID vaccines in the entire country out of 131 million Americans who've been vaccinated. Compare that to the hundreds of thousands of our constituents that are going to die because of the slowness of our vaccine approval process every time they wanna create a new vaccine. Weigh those impacts, the negation wins every time. Vaccines may be a dose of hope, but today's legislation is a dose of despair. I'm urging you to fail. Thank you, Senator, for that speech of three minutes and three seconds. Questioners, please raise your placards. I will go first to Senator Lynn. Hi, Senator. Hi. So it already takes a while for companies to have to go through all these de-escalation processes, right? Yeah, for the most part, it takes about two and a half years. <laughs> yeah, since it's slow and it doesn't give them any profit to run those trials, why do they do them in the first place? Like, I don't understand how they could just bypass them after you pass this legislation. They're not just going to bypass them. They're just not going to authorize the vaccines in children. What happens then? You have all these children in our population who aren't getting so vaccinated. they're just not going to do testing on children. How do they get vaccines to the children in the end then? They can't if you pass this legislation. That's no, the issue. That. Thank you. Senator Martinez. All right, let's clarify this. So today's legislation explicitly mentions children. Where are children not being included when we get to phase three of vaccine trials? Um, they're not being included right now because generally trials are first done in adults, then you de-escalate to children right. if you prove safety in adults. But this legislation explicitly says children in section two. So why won't we see better vaccine efficiency for children now that they're able to be tested under my standards? They're tested regardless, but what you have to do is take much longer to Thank approve you, the Senator vaccine. Under this bill. Hi, Senator. So your main concern here is safety of the vaccines, right? So Honestly. what happens if the FDA is in oversight of these vaccines? What's to say they won't be safe when being administered? 
My issue isn't safety, it's speed. The longer we take to approve a vaccine, the more people die while we wait. When you have more people working on solutions, don't you get a solution faster? We don't have more people working on solutions. We have the same number of people. Why? Wouldn't it incentivize more companies to create more vaccines? No, you don't. You make it that much harder for them to run the trials. Pharmaceutical companies are going to run away under under this legislation. Thank you, Senator Nakajuno. Okay, so like Pfizer and Moderna trials, for example, right? They approved it for adults because they did the clinical trials on them like since like last summer, and now they're on children, right? Sure. So if you go under Senator Martinez's legislation, they're there from the start, meaning that they get approved faster for children, right? I would differentiate between an emergency use authorization and full authorization. Normally, vaccines aren't authorized under an EUA. We're under an EUA yeah, so right now. So then your whole time constraint goes away because the only reason the Pfizer vaccine was so no, fast. No, people die because of other vaccine issues as well. Thank you, Senators. Time has elapsed. Uh, Senator Gorin, for future reference, please try to raise your placard a little uh, higher up in the camera and then earlier on um, for the question period. With that, uh, speakers on the affirmation, please raise your placards. Senator Gorin. I thank the chair. For the judge's reference, my name is Senator Gorin, spelled G-O-R-I-N, and I'm speaking for the first time in this session in the affirmation. So when everyone's ready, can I please get some sort of smile, nod, or indication? Thank you. All righty. Research is formalized curiosity. It's poking and prying with a purpose. Author Zora Neale Hurlston is right. And it's up to this Congress to purposely inject good policy in clinical research initiatives, which is why we must affirm. First, passing today's legislation improves the quality of pharmaceutical products and accuracies in results. That's because today's legislation increases the diversity of people included in all clinical trials, not just vaccines. In cross-examination, Senator Dilip Kumar asks if recommendations work. Why do we need it? Because they actually don't work. The Food and Drug Administration reports on March 31st of 2021 that despite federal guidelines promoting diversity and inclusion in clinical studies, many pharmaceutical companies fail to meet the standard because they are non-binding recommendations. A JAMA Networks open study found on March 4th of 2021 that less than 2% of clinical trials followed these recommendations. The same FDA article further reports that while clinical trial participants should represent patients using the medical product, this doesn't often does not happen due to racial and ethnic minorities being underrepresented in clinical trials. This is especially concerning since people of different ages, ethnicities, and conditions react differently to different medical products. So Senator Yu, increasing and improving trust is always a good thing because you end up with better quality medication. But how exactly does today's legislation improve the situation? Because by mandating the pharmaceutical companies you adhe to adhere to those standards. Section 2B requires that 60% of participants cannot consist of the same demographic in terms of ethnicity and gender in all clinical trials. And Section 2C requires pharmaceutical companies to demonstrate actively involving underrepresented groups. Senator Dilip Kumar, efforts to towards inclusion does not mandate is not mandated for children, but rather it incentivizes these companies to try to include children within these studies. The only mandate is that it cannot racially be based on only one group. That's a step towards the right direction towards inclusion while ensuring protection of underrepresented groups. Because the National Center for Biotech Information reports on October of 2011, that federal regulations detail protections for certain vulnerable uh, groups to ensure that the health of the individuals, such as pregnant women and the fetus, are unharmed. In cross examination, Senator Yoon asked if we should increase diversity in clinical trials. Let me answer that because the World Health Organization and the National Institute of Health corroborates this year that despite children being adults due to differences in neurological and biological developments that trigger different responses and side effects, they are often provided with treatments that are only tested on adults. The same article further explains that the best way to provide children with treatment is through research designed specifically for them. Senator Dilip Kumar, that's exactly how you help children. The impact of today's legislation goes beyond just testing procedure itself to how pharmaceutical companies uh, approach treatment. Because what from the University of Davis reports on October uh, 31st of 2019, that diversity in clinical trials yields improvement in treatment quality for all patients. Because now pharmaceutical companies must demonstrate success amongst different demographics of the population, not just one to gain FDA approval. Mm -hmm. Senators, it's our purpose to poke and pry at the practices and infirm to improve them. Thank you, Senator, for that speech of three minutes and two seconds. Questioners, please raise your placards. Any and all questioners, I'll go first to Senator Wu. Thank you. So if the precondition for market entry for any prospective pharma company is that mm -hmm. now you have to conduct a lengthy trial demonstrating success on an underrepresented group, does that make it easier to produce a vaccine or harder? 
Okay, so here's the thing. We saw this with Operation Warp Speed, actually, because like Pfizer and Moderna tried efforts to go ahead and increase like diversity, and we saw record numbers in terms of how vaccines were being produced. So is more vaccines on is more vaccines being available to the public better than less vaccines? Like different options. Good quality vaccines are working. empty. Hey, Senator. So you talked a little bit about some of the health health risks of not having diversity in your vaccine trials, right? Correct. Can you give me an example of when people of like different ethnic backgrounds had like different reactions to a vaccine? Right. I mean, like, for instance, like um, in terms of, I guess, if you were to like look at this different side effects based on like the conditions that they're living. Yeah. In. Can, can you give me an yeah. example of that? Yeah, I'm sure like there was like something to do with malaria, but it wasn't vaccine specific. It was more. Based exactly. On because with vaccines, you don't trials, see this happen. Our trials, genomes react in the same way. Trials is not just vaccines. It's everything. Thank you, Senators. Time has elapsed. Negation speakers, please raise your placards. Thank the chair. Thank you. Any and all negation speakers? Thank you, Senator Romke. Hey, y'all. This is Senator Romke. Uh, didn't expect to be going this early, but, you know, YOLO. Anyways, um, if I can get a thumbs up from all my judges, I'll be happy to get started. Awesome. 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 A recent study showed that a lot of people actually didn't want to be taken by ambulance to the hospital if they had a sudden emergency condition because it's just too expensive. And frankly, I agree. I don't know about you, but I'm not about to pay $1,000 for a ride in the Wii U wagon. Stand with me and the negation because at the end of the day, failing is the only way to ensure vaccine development proceeds properly. First, fail, because very few people volunteer for trials anyway, and adding these restrictions hamper speed with no effect on safety. A Baylor College of Medicine study says, worldwide, there are about 350,000 people who volunteered to be tested for the vaccine. And because of this, only 10% were, were Black or Latino individuals. First, we have to ask ourselves why this is happening. Usually, it's because white individuals have higher access to being tested, because usually they're wealthier. But that leads to a problem with today's legislation. Trials can't continue without getting these specific types of racial individuals in order to be tested. This greatly hampers speed, but what's important is it doesn't affect safety. A BMJ Journal article for medical professionals details how diversity doesn't matter as much as people believe when it comes to medical testing. In fact, with 99.999% of our genomes being the same, it doesn't really matter who the individual is that you're testing on just that you have a large enough sample size. Beyond that, a study between the FDA and Stanford details how requirements for clinical demographics are simply unfeasible because not that many people are interested in being in the trial in the first place. The Journal of Women's Health tells us that demographics requirements are not the easiest way to solve this issue. Instead, it's increased communication and improving trust in science. But second, let's see why passing today's legislation forces dangerous experimental treatments. Let's remember these, ty these types of uh, experiments are happening because they're still in trial. We don't know if they work yet. A a the FDA and CDC put out a report on how they recalled almost 6.8 million doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine because it caused side effects that weren't accounted for. Let's realize something. If we force these vaccines to be tested on, for example, pregnant women, we may see negative side effects in the test themselves. This is inherently important to today's debate. There's a reason we make sure that healthy individuals get the vaccine first, because it's easier to account for side effects in them. A University of Chicago study explains to us on March 10th that it's still not fully recommended for pregnant women to take the vaccine because we can't get enough people in. And beyond that, we can't understand how the vaccine interacts with how the body changes during pregnancy. At the end of the day, if we pass today's legislation, we force these companies to take this route of testing on these people before it is safe to conduct those very tests. At the end of the day, what matters most is the health of our constituents. And by passing, you're mandating vaccines that aren't safe and that aren't ready to be unleashed on the public. If right now we're experiencing a pandemic because of a virus, let's not worsen it with ineffective treatment and ineffective care. Stand with me and fail. Thank you, Senator, for that speech of three minutes and seven seconds. Questioners, please raise your placards. I will go first to Senator Gorin. Hi, Senator. So where in today's legislation are we forcing vaccine trials to take place for pregnant women? In section C, it says the FDA must have all vaccines that are no. passed involve pregnant women, children, okay. older adults, and all okay. that. So, but that's not part of like the final like destination, right? So essentially- The legislation the says all of these, you know, all of these 
the like today's legislation, the only group. mandate in today's legislation is that there be diversity in terms of uh, uh, racial. The state's diversity includes people with in terms of efforts for Hi, so section 2C actually says that they just had to make clear efforts to involve these groups of people within the process as a whole. Why yeah. can't involvement with things like pregnant women or children happen in stage three like they normally do, but just make sure that they are involved? Okay, let me differentiate something here. Pregnant women doesn't happen in stage three of like the actual clinical trial process. It happens in vaccine development. And the reason that's important is because normally these groups try you're to roll out vaccines for just healthy individuals that? before are starting these risky trials. Are you saying the corporations don't try? Thank you, Senators. Time they has do, but at a later date. Thank you, Senators. Just wanted to check with the parliamentarian. You turned your camera off. Is everything fine? Oh, yeah. I just had to take a sip of water. All right. Thank you. Um, all speakers on the affirmation, please raise your placards. That will go to Senator uh, Farage. I think the chair, can everybody hear me okay? Just to make sure my mic is working great. All right, thank you so much. Um, assuming that there's nobody who needs more time, I'm just going to get started here. Inequity plagues this nation's history. So much so that we can see the remnants of it in most every facet of modern society, whether it be in housing, criminal justice, or medicine. Inequity exists where it should be eradicated, and it thrives where it's forgotten. But today's legislation finally brings it to the forefront in the life or death situations we need it in the most. So pass this legislation. First, Senator Dalip Kumar wants to roll out vaccines as soon as possible, and Senator Ramkey says that they don't believe that diversity will make a difference. Realize that hasty actions are going to put more Americans at risk. Senator Martinez told us in the very first speech of today's round, correctly, that it is morally right to test all races. I want to talk about how clinical trial diversity is about far more than just morals. It's literally about science. MIT professor David Glifford in the December 2020 study described, described that there was a study where they used artificial intelligence and machine learning tools to run trials with vaccines that were very similar to Moderna and Pfizer. And among white participants, their immune systems rejected the vaccine less than half a percent of the time. But for Asian and African Americans, their immune systems rejected the vaccine 10% of the time. And in the most extreme cases, this immune system reaction could completely nullify the vaccine and make it ineffective. Passing today's legislation allows us to better catch these inconsistencies before the vaccine becomes mainstream. So Senator Dalip Kumar, we are making sure that vaccines actually work. But why is it so important that we have a credible vaccine? It makes medical care far more effective. Johns Hopkins University last December explains that with more diverse clinical trials and thus vaccines that were finally de designed for specific symptoms and specific, precondi specific preconditions faced by marginalized groups, emergency visits to the hospital are able to be reduced by up to 44%. So Senator Dalip Kumar, if you want to talk about saving lives, realize that better vaccines are going to save more lives. It isn't just in our best interest to ensure vaccines are as effective as possible. It's our solemn duty to the safety of our constituency. But finally, Senator Ramke explains that the reason that diverse trials are so slow is because members of marginalized groups just don't have access to them. I would contend that it's not just about access, it's about historical mistrust. For decades, we need to realize that BIPOC individuals have been mistreated across our country, especially across the medical field. The only way for any of us to ever get rid of this mistrust is if we start making our trials more diverse and building this trust over time. Let's recognize that if we want to truly break down the racism that still plagues our society, we have to pass today's legislation. Thank you, Senator, for that perfectly timed speech. That was three minutes. Questioners, please raise your placards. All right. We'll start with Senator Dilip Kumar. Hi. Hi, so true or false, we authorized three COVID vaccines that are safe and effective in all races, genders, and ethnicities in the past 12 months. That's true. They're not fully effective because what's happened is we're still testing on people like pregnant women. So somewhat effective, but yeah, not perfectly. 
for as much as we know they're effective. If we've already seen other companies, pharma companies do this, why do we Right, you talked about Newspeak specifically, the difference, the difference between an emergency rollout and a rollout that normally takes many years. So in an emergency rollout, we were able to get these- Thank you, so right there, like six months. Yeah. Thank you. So you just alluded to the fact that these vaccines we have in place are simply not accurate as we want them to be. So what's to say that these new vaccines we're gonna make are gonna be more accurate? Won't they just be less Because less now we're accurate? testing them on more people, ensuring that not well, like, certain people- These two companies accurate. test them on so many people and they're still not accurate. If we have less people they're being tested on, won't they be less accurate? It's not less people. We're ensuring that the group are more diverse. But Senator Remke just said you have less answer. We're ensuring that there's more diversity so that certain immune systems aren't going to reject them at higher rates. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Speakers on the negation, please raise your placards. Senator Wu, thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Senator Wu, first time today, spelled W, two letters, super simple. Any indication when you're ready, I'm happy to begin. And if you need anything else from me, just let me know. Cool. Grab a timer. When engaging in legislative discussions about public health, it often becomes very muddled as to the role of this legislative body. Sometimes we are so hesitant to act in the favor of preserving autonomy and sovereignty, but particularly our foremost priority during things like public health crises is saving and extending American lives. What I mean by this is that any other consideration must come secondary. I actually agree with most of the affirmative positions so far. Senator Martinez, you're correct. A lot of pharma companies aren't making efforts in the status quo to include underrepresented populations. For the remainder of my time on the floor, I'm going to break down to you how if every single drug company takes this legislation seriously, the highest ground of the affirmative, you create systemic barriers to market entry and further constrict the availability of the vaccine options for millions of at-risk populations. Why? Because first, interpret section 1C's broad mandate in one of two ways. Either A, it says that these trials must take place in order for the FDA to grant vaccine approval in the first place, or B, it says that the FDA is formally establishing a new mandatory standard for any vaccines they have pr already approved for public consumption. Either way, formalizing a new standard of conduct for vaccine trials impossibly increases the standard of competitiveness during public health crises like the coronavirus by imposing new standards on market entry. What Senator Dilip Kumar tells you is that trials get longer and longer and we de delay the ability uh, the vaccine rollouts for the general public because companies can't attain the approval of the FDA. But even more than that, after you pass this legislation, it infinitely increases the competitive standard necessary to achieve that certification. David Siranowski of the peer-reviewed Nature Journal explains in November of 2020 that once a vaccine receives emergency FDA authorization, what we saw was given to Pfizer and Moderna months ago, trials of subsequent vaccines will become far more complicated. Companies starting new trials will have to show that their vaccines are better than those granted emergency approval, making trials longer and more cost prohibitive. Realize, Senator Farage, this isn't a casual investment into public health or a decision based on the lives of some Americans. It's all American lives on the line. When companies are forced to lengthen and expand their clinical trials in order to meet the heightened threshold for FDA authorization, there's one crippling implication. If certain market entrants seek FDA certification and they now have to beat out existing options, the basic presumption of quality rises. Senator Gorin, I agree with you. Vaccines need to meet a certain basic standard of quality. But insofar as you are infinitely increasing that standard, it delays the deployment of vaccine options specifically for high-risk groups. Look at the text of this legislation. What it mandates is that a prospective vaccine manufacturer must demonstrate success or inclusion of underrepresented groups in their trials, even though that means if they can't, that deployment is delayed infinitely. Fulfill your obligation to save lives. Please vote this legislation down. Thank you, Senator, for that speech of three minutes and 10 seconds. Questioners, please raise your placards. I will go first to Senator Farage. Is emergency authorization the same as approval? No, those are two different types of things, okay, but okay. once a certain Good. vaccine- Good. You know that, let me ask the rest of the question. Okay, so in the case that we're having these like really fast trials that need to be done, like in the case of COVID, wouldn't we be able to grant emergency authorization still after we pass this legislation? 
Absolutely. Okay, and would those be subject to these Can I finish my answer real quick? Approval? There's a really important explanation here. So Go the ahead, distinction Jesus. between emergency authorization and subsequent trial authorization is that all of those subsequent Thank manufacturers you, have to meet the increased standard. Thank you. Hi, I just want to make clear what Section 3.2c actually says, because it just says that corporations have to demonstrate interest or demonstrate effect into this. It doesn't say that if these groups aren't available or aren't needed in the first place, that they have to be included. No, I actually, I'm going to give you guys the benefit of the doubt. And I say all companies are going to actively include all underrepresented groups in their vaccine trials. I'm telling you that increases the standard of competitiveness no, for FDA authorization infinitely. I'm telling you that section that section that you're specifically referring to doesn't do that. Thank you, Senator Lynn. Uh, Senator Martinez, I understand I made a mistake there. Um, I will keep out uh, for your placard next Thank couple you. of weeks. Um, we'll move on. Uh, all speakers on the affirmation, please raise your placards. Senator Nagarjuna. Uh, on a post. I thank the chair for the judge and chamber's reference by Senator Nagarjuna, N-A-G-A-R-J-U-N-A. -A. I know it's a bit hard to pronounce, so Senator N is completely okay. Just uh, any indication when you're ready would be great. All right, uh, cool. When seeds of mistrust are rooted into our country's science that harms our well-being, it's our duty as Congress to instill trust. Today, we're presented with a unique opportunity to do that, and that's ultimately why you affirm. But since its founding, America's healthcare system has never given minorities the treatment they deserve. In 2005, the National Academy's Institute of Medicine found that every single minority group is more likely to receive lower quality health care than white Americans. And given that history of mistreatment, it's no wonder that many minorities don't trust American healthcare, and that hasn't changed during the pandemic. Senator Farage broaches mistrust. Let me quantify it. The NAACP found in fall of 2020 that only 14% of African Americans trusted the vaccine, and that number didn't get much higher among Hispanic Americans with a sky high trust rating of only 34%. These levels of distrust are hurting our country right now, and they will continue to hurt us in future pandemics unless we do something. And creating equitable vaccine trials is the first step in the race to forge a safer America. Senators Martinez and Farage already explained how underrepresented minorities are in vaccine trials, but Senator Romke tries to tell us that that doesn't matter. Senator Romke, this is specifically deadly because Dr. Namaje Bumpus at John Hopkins University explains on December 8th, 2020, that vaccines can affect people differently based on their race. So we don't have nearly enough data to know whether the vaccine is effective for those who need it the most. Senators Dilip Kumar and Wu, you are so concerned about the timeline of this vaccine. First, on children, this bill literally speeds up the process because children don't have to wait to have trials after the adults. Second, Senator Dilip Kumar, even though it doesn't, if including minorities for some reason would uh, increase the time it took to make the vaccine, but the vaccine is safer and ensures their safety, I think the choice to make there is clear. Senator Romke, you want to increase trust in the vaccines. I agree as well. That's why Dr. Wayne Frederick, the pre president of the Howard University wrote on September 11th, 2020, that it's going to be easier for minorities to trust the vaccine when they know it will actually work for them. Now, let me be the first to explain the reason this is so crucial, because minorities tend to work in jobs that put them at higher risk of disease. This pandemic has already taken away so much from minority communities, be it their ability to congregate in places of worship or the lives of their family members. The last thing that should be taken away from them is their ability to work safely. But the Urban Institute finds in December 2020 that Hispanic, African Americans, and Native American workers were 10 percentage points more likely than white workers to have jobs that put them at a high risk of contracting disease. Senator Wu says that people at risk need the vaccine. Yes, they need a vaccine that's ready for them, Senator Wu. If there is anyone who needs to be vaccinated, it's these Americans. And their mistrust in our healthcare system is not a fault of their own. It's one of this Congress. Although this isn't a difficult issue to diagnose, it certainly be an issue to, won't be an easy issue to cure. Even still, there is hardly an issue worth curing more than this one. Thank you, Senator, for that speech of three minutes and six seconds. Questioners, please raise your placards. Any and all questioners? I will go to Senator uh, Yoon. Thank you, Chair. Senator, so what exactly is the different racial response to like COVID-19 vaccines? 
like this is like this isn't targeted to like covid vaccines in general right like the evidence i give you literally says that there isn't enough evidence from vaccines overall to be like oh there is no way there's going to be a different response for my right so can you can you tell me one major vaccine that has like had these disparities no again the evidence tell you there hasn't been enough data from before to make that claim and we can't take chances with that in the future because theoretically there would be different responses just because it's not an empirics okay Sarah absorbs senator crowley Hi, so do delays in vaccine development cost pharmaceutical companies money? Uh, I don't know, you can tell me. Yeah, they actually do quite a bit. So what happens when pharmaceutical companies lose profit? They like don't make as many vaccines. Or... Right, wouldn't that be more damaging in the long term if the yeah, that's like less pharmaceutical drugs companies in general, right? Like when, when it's that important that we need that many, that's when it goes into emergency authorization, right? Senator Wu was just talking about that. But that's when all these restrictions they don't have to on be one drug, emergency authorization doesn't say you need to produce no, but that's like for one vaccine, one though, and that's when you don't thank you. All negation speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Yoon. Uh, I think the chair for the reference of the chamber that Senator Yoon spelled Y-O-O-N rhymes with moon, cartoon, or even baboon. Uh, I go by any pronouns. Is anybody not ready at this point in the debate? Wonderful. I'll just get right into it then. All right, we'll begin. I applaud the temerity of the affirmation in trying to make the medical world more diverse, but I want to make something crystal clear. They're wrong. Senator Farage, there comes a time where virtue signaling diversity doesn't outweigh the real lives affected by our actions. Negate. The most important point this round is simple. Pharmaceutical delay and the deaths it causes. Senators Dilip Kumar and Wu on my side touch on this, but in the wrong way. So let me tell you why. As the Brookings Institute tells us in June 2017, minority groups are disproportionately underrepresented by trials because minority communities largely distrust pharma. Senator Ronke touches on this, but allow me to explain why. Long ago, Big Pharma would use people of color like guinea pigs, causing distrust. That's why CNBC reports in March 2019 that companies have a really, really difficult time getting people to come in the first place. So when Senator Martinez says that people of color are barred from these trials, she's fabricating the truth. These companies would love it if more people would show up. They just don't want to come. And here's the one thing Senator Ronke missed, the impact. We've seen a consistent theme of slowdowns on the, neg on the negation, but no impact. Impacting, so I will. As the Urban Institute notes in January 2016, getting people of color to proportionate levels in trials would add months to years to the trial process. But as the Harvard Business Review notes just last fall, every day of lost medical innovation kills north of 500 people in the long run. This means trying to get diversity in just one type of life-saving medicine loses north of 100,000 lives in the future. Nothing can outweigh that. And as Senator Nagarjuna concedes, POC need this medical innovation the most. Now, even though we proved we outweigh the affirmation, let's refute their side. First, Senator Martinez tells us that it's important to include marginalized people who haven't been historically. I asked the Senator one important question. Why is it important to include marginalized groups in these trials? The Senator doesn't answer me. So let me answer it instead. As the American Public Health Association tells us in October 2019, it's not. A black body is the same as a white body, is the same as an Asian body, is the same as an Hispanic body, and the longstanding myth that different races are really biologically different is born in racism. Analyzing the 36 most important vaccines and pharmaceuticals since 1970, all of them showed little to no clear disparity between racial rejection. So Senators Gorin and Nagarjuna, bodies can be different in size and shape, but not fundamentally and not enough. Then Senator Gorin tells us children need to be included, citing the World Health Organization. Sure, then write stricter regulation frameworks, including children only, not for racial diversity, which drags and loses POC lives. After, Senator Farage tells us about David Gifford's study on how Asian and African Americans reacted to differently to white Americans. This is incorrect on two fronts. First, these people weren't tested. It was a new type of computer modeling that predicted this, not tested it, and this new modeling, which has been, has been rejected by four different peer reviews for inaccuracy. Second, I quote David Gifford himself in the MIT CSAIL lab, quote, there are obviously many other factors to consider. Conceding this computer modeling is literally not accurate yet. Prefer already evidence of the past 36 vaccines over a rejected computer model. Diversity is important, but diversity isn't as important as saving the lives of POC who need it the most. Thank you, Senator, for that speech of three minutes and seven seconds. Questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Martinez. 
So people of different ethnic backgrounds have different health issues. For example, people who are African-American are more vulnerable to sickle cell. People who are Ashkenazi Jewish are more vulnerable to Tay-Sachs. Oh, How yeah, yeah, you're right, you right. the impacts on those diseases? Okay, so you're right on that front, right? There are right, some marginal so differences. Fail? Wait, wait, right. There are some marginal differences. Not enough over the marginal. past 36 facts. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Over the past 30, let me them. answer your question. Now, over the past 36 vaccines, there's been such a marginal difference that you don't vote we on have that. thousands of diseases to discover. Why shouldn't we protect those people? Please, okay, so over like Dr. Juna. Okay, so let's operate under your evidence that there is no biological difference between different ethnic groups. Simple question, are vaccines mandatory? I would assume not, no. Yeah, no, they're not, right? People don't have to get them. But if they aren't tested on minorities, then minorities don't want to get them. 14% of African-Americans trust the vaccine. What's the point of having a vaccine out for them if they're not going to take it? Well, I would answer that on like two fronts, right? First, most people will end up getting the vaccine for convenience, even if they don't dis. Like, I mean, if they, they distrust it and say they're not going to get it, I'm okay, sure right? Not so, get okay, it. wait, wait, wait. So, I don't trust the vaccine that much either. Thank but you, once Senator, I see the time has elapsed, we get it. Thank you. Speakers on the affirmation, please raise your placards. Any and all affirmative speakers, Senator Lynn. Thank you. I think the chair that Senator Lynn just spelled L I N for the first time today. Whenever y'all are ready, just let me know and I'll get started. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Awesome. At a point in time, it stops becoming willful ignorance and starts becoming knowing and still choosing to do nothing about it. When people of color all across America have told you there is a problem, as representatives, it's your job to then alleviate that issue. Pass today's legislation because it's what you should be doing on two different fronts. The first is on trials even being able to happen in the first place, because this is the main advocacy that the negation has told you so far, right? Senators like Dilip Kumar, Ramki, Wu, and Yoon, and the catch point you've heard throughout the entirety of this round is that the vast majority of negation speakers tell you and rest their impacts all on assuming that these requirements are too time costly and too difficult for corporations and for researchers to even be able to meet. Senator Dilip Kumar starts you off by telling you that because it'll take longer to reach these requirements, crucial trials or even other safety missteps are going to take longer and groups like children are going to be forgotten. By passing that this bill in section 2C focuses specifically on children, there are two main reasons why recruitment isn't nearly as difficult as the negation paints it as. The first is explained by Deloitte Center for Health Solutions in August of 2018, where they explained that in increasingly in the digital aid, technology-aided approaches can include advertising websites and online patient communities. Senator Ronke tells us that this disparity in accessibility is because white people tend to be wealthier. But considering that low-income constituents demonstrate more of an interest in clinical trials because they get paid, that line of reasoning doesn't stand. When you have increased advertising and an increased accessibility, you have more people who are willing to go through these things because they have a monetary incentive for them. And in September, 2017, when the start of antidote allowed patients in the United States to search close to 14,000 trials, in those isolated incidents, you did see increased numbers of people recruiting for these things in the first place. But I will admit that this study isn't foolproof, right? But when you pass this legislation and corporations need to make a profit and need to get out their solutions quickly, you increase investment in technology into other recruitment ideologies like these. But the second reason is because during a state of public emergency, you wouldn't even need to get through these requirements in the first place. Every single one of these impacts they talk about is really based on COVID-19. But we declared a public health emergency on COVID-19 last year. In incidents like these, we would have to bypass these regulations and keep on going in the first place. But the second question is if vaccine trial diversity even matters. Senator Romke and Yoon tell us that because most humans' genomes are the same, diversity ultimately doesn't matter. But the New York Times just last month explains that even with COVID-19 vaccines, we can see the result of discrepancies within the healthcare system. Out of people reporting severe side effects, 80% were women, and 44 out of 47 people experiencing life-threatening anaphylactic shock were also women. This is the biggest issue I have with the negation because you're willfully ignoring people who are going to die at the hands of untested and unsafe clinical trials. Safety only thrives in herd immunity. Herd immunity and increase in safety only happens when people think they can trust their government and trust their medical researches. That's why you pass. Thank you, Senator, for that speech of three minutes and seven seconds. Questioners, please raise your placards. You know, all right. That will go first to 
uh, to Senator Romke. Hey, Senator, would you agree? Like, let's use COVID-19 as an example. In this like rush development, the diversity standards can't be held as high as in like a normal time frame, right? Yeah, that's why we give them emergency access. Yeah, so how many people have received the vaccine? About a lot of people. Yeah, like 500 million. Have we seen any mass recalls of vaccines because of like health concerns? We actually have. You see like J and J vaccines being taken away right yeah, now. Yeah, but why was that? Was it because of like a problem with the vaccine or a problem with its storage? I'm not saying that diversity standard can be too much. Hey, Senator, so if vaccine hesitance for an approved vaccine is as high for minorities as the affirmation says, why would people be willing to enroll in an untested clinical, clinical trial? Because obviously it's not 100% of these groups, right? But once you do have more diversity in the system, the people who don't trust it, which is primarily people of color, are going to become more trustful. Why would they trust it in the first place to increase that diversity? You never reach those impacts. Because I said not 100% of Black people have distrust in the medical system, but there is a large amount. Sure, but not enough people to enroll these Thank you, Senators. Your time has elapsed. Speakers on the negation, please raise your placards. Senator Crowley, unopposed. Hi, that's Senator Crowley speaking for the first time today. Any indication when you're ready would be great. Great, I'll go ahead and begin. In the 1972 Tuskegee experiment, 201 African-American men were told they were being treated for syphilis, but in reality were kept off of all medications even after penicillin was discovered. Scientists watched as disease ravaged 200 black bodies despite having the tools to protect them. It's no surprise that the black community does not trust the pharmaceutical industry. The affirmation wants you to believe that they changed that. The results of believing that myth would be devastating. I am failing. This debate breaks down into three questions. I want to answer them to explain why the negation wins. The first question is why is trial diversity important? The affirmation led by Senator Gorin tells you that we need to know how to treat different races. But then Senator Romke says that 99% of our genomes are all the same, which is why Senator Yoon explains that response among races to drugs varies very little. Here's the quantification that no one gives you. A 2014 study in the clinical pharmacy if, oh God, pharmacology and experiments found that variations in how people from different ethnic groups responded to medications only varied in 20% of drugs from 1970 to 2013. Only 20% of drugs actually produced different responses. Not all of them, as Senator Farage would have you believe. The lives lost by passing outweigh. But the second question is, will minorities even participate in these trials at higher rates? The affirmation led by Senator Martinez and Gorin say it's about access. So yes, they will once we give them access. But then Senators Romke and Yume again say that it's about minorities des desire to participate in trials at all. The answer to this question is always going to be no. We've been increasing trust in these trials for decades. Yes, the Washington Post finds in 2020 December that 42% of Black Americans would not take the COVID vaccine or participate in trials despite being affected by it at higher rates. The result is that they will never participate in these trials. The record numbers that Senator Gorin gives you, a CBC News article posted on article April 15th of 2021, explains that only 7% of that Moderna trial were actually Black Americans, even though Moderna went out and forced themselves to recruit more Black Americans into the trials. The last question we need to ask is what will efforts at inclusion actually do? Senator Dilip Kumar says this will extend the time of trials and then Senator Yuen speculates this could lead to delays in time to market. I want to look at what's happening right now in the status quo. The same CBC article explains that after Moderna tried to increase inclusion, 1.2 million doses of the COVID vax that were slated to arrive in Canada at the beginning of April have been delayed for two months. There are two impacts of delays. First, pharmaceutical companies lose money. The clinical researcher finds in February of 2017 that for every day a drug is delayed, pharmaceutical companies lose $8 million. The second impact is lives. There's two warrants. Warrants. Yoon simply says that when trials are delayed, more people lose their lives, 500 in the long term. But I'll give you another one. When R&D is cut due to profit lost, Thank less you, drugs Your are time produced. Is elapsed. You fail for lives. Thank you. Uh, that was a speech of three minutes and 10 seconds. Questioners, please raise your placards. 
That will go first to Senator Gorin. Hi, Senator. So are clinical trials just vaccines or also medication? Both. Okay, so what happens when medication is given is ineffective? People don't you give me the twenty percent. You give me the twenty percent number, right? Yeah. So when people take medication that's ineffective and they think that they've had the situation solved, they don't get further assistance. Is that correct? Further help? I mean, not necessarily. Right. So, but but doesn't that put their lives at risk? Because if they take ineffective medicine, they think they've they've been cured, and then suddenly that they're still when you pass. Like you're still going to have ineffective you, medicine. And you're still going to have low response rates. Okay. So if one in every five drugs is going to have different results based on your race, isn't that a reason to pass? No, I'm saying it's not worth the millions of lives you will lose. So for those, delays. for like all of the people taking those one out of every five drugs, we're just going to let them face different results and potentially. Okay, first drugs. of all, you're not going to actually change that because Black Americans won't even participate in these trials. Okay, well, how do we develop trust? But second of all, I'm that? saying it's a simple way. Like, we develop Lee trust you that it will cost 500 lives for every okay, delay. So and I'm question, telling you, it's already causing two we months develop of delays trust overnight, or overnight. We're losing more trust? lives in the negation. Or yeah, we develop time has elapsed. All right, so uh, Senator Romkey, I believe, yes, has dropped out of the call twice. Um, for the parliamentarian, should we wait for him this time or just move on? Yeah, I mean, it's it's been an hour. I'm, I'm happy to just take a couple minute or two break. Just, to, just we to also break. just have one speech left on this bill, so I'm I don't if I don't I don't know if anyone in, or the judges or parliamentarian would like for us to to just finish debate first or. Wait for Senator Rumkey. Did I'm he sorry. already speak on a bill? He he's already spoken. Um, it's just Senator Verma, I think. Okay, then let's just keep going. Okay, all right. Um, with that, uh, all speakers on the affirmation, please raise your placards. All right, seeing none, the chair highly frowns upon a one-sided debate. Speakers on the negation, please raise your placards. Senator Verma, you have the floor. I thank the chair for the benefit of my judges. I am Senator Verma, V-E-R-M-A, speaking for the first time this session from Scottsdale Preparatory Academy in Arizona. May I get some sort of indication when you are ready? Good, 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 great. All right. Senators Martinez, Gordon, and Farage want to talk about the red, the white, and the blue of our democracy. But I only see the red of the blood, the blue of the bruises, and the white of the bandages with passing this bill. This bill is no needle in a haystack when it comes to implicit harms. Stand with me and fail. First, you fail because of COVID variants. This point has not been brought up in the entirety of today's debate. I agree with the affirmation that something needs to be done about vaccine accessibility to further demographics and ethnicities. But this bill is simply not the solution because it's lack of specificity and restrictions. First, let's talk about how COVID variants even exist. The BBC says on January 6th of this year that the variants have different oranges but share a mutation in a gene that encodes the spike protein, which the virus uses to latch on and enter the human cell. These are the same human cells that are vaccinated. But when you pass today's bill, you actually increase the amount of mutations because there are more vaccine variants in the human cell. The link is such. Section 2 in the bill says 60% gives no minimum amount of people being clinically trialed. In addition to this, it doesn't require such companies to oblige by certain regulations to ensure greater safety. Unfortunately, the impact doesn't stop there. Senator Farage, in questioning with Senator Dilip Kumar, concede to the fact that these vaccines we currently have are not as accurate as we want them to be. But I'm confused. If you have more diverse and smaller trials, unlike Moderna and Pfizer, won't you have even less vaccine accuracy? And to put pregnant women and children at risk on today's bill, I refuse to do so. Don't believe me. Believe Kylie Rogers in 2021, where she tells you that these non-mainstream companies working on vaccines are not safe to say the least. Let's side on probability, not recklessness. Fail. There's been a lot of rehash on the side of the negation, but let me spend the rest of my three minutes refuting my fellow senators. Senator Martirez and Gorin say the same thing when you talk about these minorities getting the attention they need, but you might as well stab our most vulnerable constituents with the empty needle. I care more about solving the problems right the first time than keeping my seat in Congress. Senator Yoon and Senator Romke already addressed this on my side, but let me take this a step further. Understand that the way to solve the problem is to directly target it by having specific minority-only clinical trials, because in the affirmation world, you're still producing vaccines that are not specific to any ethnicity group, increasing the problem. There's no solvency. Senator Naguranja and Faraj, your points have gone uncontested until now. You both are concerned with the vulnerability of minorities. First, you fail to understand that these minorities around each and are each other a majority amount of time. Their vulnerability is actually less. Second, understand that the way to take people out of these situations is to lift them out of poverty. This bill prolongs the effects of COVID, keeping them suppressed for even longer. 
Don't believe the affirmation when they themselves don't even know what they're talking about. Senator Lin, you talk about advertising. Look to France. The Guardian told us in 2021 that they tried such campaigns you speak of and they actually lost turnout for vaccinations. You might as well advertise death sentences because this bill, you're digging innocent lives into their graves. The United States has always had the motto, a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. It's time to start being inclusive of all people the right way. Stand with me and fail. Thank you, Senator, for that perfectly timed speech of three minutes. Questioners, please raise your placards. Any and all questions. All right. Um, that will go first to Senator uh, Martinez. So why are clinical trials supposed to be diverse? So clinical trials are supposed to be diverse to help like low income people or minorities or different demographics. No, I mean, in terms of the results from the trial, you want a, a proper population makeup within your trial, right? Okay, sure. But if you're making one vaccine that's supposed to help everyone, you're not solving the problem. But isn't you, it dangerous to use homogenous groups? Because the entire point of having these two six separate groups don't react the same way. Bias, if it's, they it's don't react the same way. You need to have randomly assigned patients. We're just going to see bias. Thank you, Senator Yoon. Uh, hi, Senator. So um, say that we concede every point on the affirmation this round. We tell you these like developmental drags like kills 100,000 people per life saving medicine. Doesn't that like outweigh everything, even if we concede it? No. OK, so what happens is in, in the AF world, you're actually developing like non effective drugs. What happens here is that you're actually having a uh, you're prolonging the effects of COVID, meaning that if you want to say, OK, in the short term, you lose lives in the long term, you're losing even more lives. OK, so you said that we should also establish minority exclusive trials. If the reason that POC don't like trials is because thank you, Senator, time has lapsed. Senator Romke, we noticed that you dropped out of the call twice. Are, uh, have you fixed your Internet issues or do you need anything from us? Uh, no, I'm running off a hotspot. My router literally caught fire. So hopefully we'll all be good now. Okay, whatever you need to do, just go ahead and do it. We don't want your house burning down. All right, um, I see there are a number of motions on the floor. So Senator Farage. I move to the previous question. Seconds. Second. All Second. in favor, any against? Then we'll move to voting procedure. Um, all who wish to pass today's legislation, you would like to send it to the president's desk and the House of Representatives. Please raise your placards and keep them up. All right, pass, 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 pass. Thank you. Okay, I count Gorin, Faraj, Nagarjuna, Martinez, and Lynn. Five. And then all who want to defeat today's legislation, you would not like to see it leave the Senate. Please raise your placards. I count Yoon, Wu, Crowley, Dilip Kumar, Verma, and Ramsey. Six. Zero abstentions. And on a uh, vote of five to six to zero, um, today's legislation does fail. Uh, my condolences to the sponsor. Senator Dilip Kumar. Any natural right to debate. I move to a five minute recess. Seconds. Second. All in favor? Any against? All right, for our viewers home at C uh, watching C SPAN, you have five minutes. One more thing. Can we get like a resplit, like now that yeah. the first oh, yeah, bill is done? so that we don't end up with like a full minute recess before everyone starts talking. All right, all those who wish to go on the affirmation of pharmaceuticals, please raise your hand or your placard. One, two, three, four, three? Or was there a fourth three. hand that came up and went okay, down? Sorry, no, I'm not on the affirmation, I'm confused. I was, I was confused. Okay, I'm gonna call again, okay? All those who wish to go on the affirmation of pharmaceuticals, please raise your hand or placard. One, two, three. Okay, all those who wish to go on the negation. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so seven? seven. Okay. Okay, so I'll be writing an affirmation speech. Yeah, so if you haven't written a speech yet, go ahead and go into the affirmation. Mm -hmm. Lovely. And then, Senator Dalit so, Kumar, you said you were interested in sponsoring? If nobody else wants to, I'm willing to. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I can I go like later on to yeah, sure. I'll um, Senator Tong, when does our break officially end? Just so I'm aware. Um, sorry, I have to convert. So you're in PST. So right now it's 108. It is one. Okay. Um, so be back at around uh, 112. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. How many more um, app speakers did we need? Does anyone know? Um, we uh, had so we had three, one. and then everyone else basically was a nag except for Senator Crowley. So um, if you can write an F speech, you should probably write an F speech. So we, we need, need two more? 
we need we need two more. Well, one person flips, then it becomes even if they if they voted on neg. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I think here you, it would be great if you could flip to the app. Thank you. We have about a minute left. Thirty seconds. So if you're at your desk or wherever you're judging or competing, just turn on your camera, let us know you're here. All right, the recess is officially over. Uh, before, before we continue, Senator Verma, are you there? All right, we'll wait for him to come back just a little bit. And then Judge Ragu, your camera doesn't seem to be working, but could you just verbally let us know if you're here? I think they just dropped out the call. Okay, uh, I see him. And then Judge Ragu. Okay, thank you. And Senator Verma is also back. Um, then with that at 3.13 uh, CST, call this session back into order. Um, the next item off the docket is SF1A regarding pharmaceutical supply chains. That was a mouthful. Um, are there any sponsors? Senator Dilip Kumar, thank you. I thank the chair. Hi, everybody. It's Senator Dilip Kumar, D-I-L-E-P-K-U-M-A-R, speaking for the second and probably last time this session. Can I get a smile or a thumbs up when you're ready? Good, good, good. Perfect. <clears throat> there is no imperative greater in this Congress than protecting American lives. But in our complacency, we've lost over 500,000 Americans to a pandemic that has devastated our economy destroyed our public health infrastructure and demolished faith in American exceptionalism. 
I'm calling on this Congress to pass my legislation because American health is the greatest responsibility of this Congress. So what's the crisis we're facing right now? Look to the CFR on August 14, 2019, when they explain that China dominates the US pharmaceutical supply chain with 13.1% of import lines coming from China alone. On top of that, that's a severe undercount of American dependence on China since it doesn't factor in the billions of dollars of pharmaceutical imports that China exports as well. But on top of that, let's look to India as well. The U US International Trade Commission explains in a May 2018 report that U.S. pharmaceutical imports of finished pharma products from India are valued at over $6 billion. So why is it so dangerous that we're so dependent on these other countries? Look at what happened just one month ago. Reuters explains on March 4, 2020, that due to the surging COVID-19 cases in India, the country banned the export of 26 active pharmaceutical inputs. That's devastating to the global supply chain because countries like India and China are the global manufacturing hubs of these life-saving products. If you want to ensure that the pain of spring 2020 and the entire year afterward finally end, it's time we take action. So how do we solve that? You pass my legislation. First, let me direct you to sections 1A and 1B, both of which increase and incentivize domestic pharmaceutical products. So not only do we increase the security of our supply chains, we give jobs to hundreds of thousands of American workers working in this sector. But on top of that, we disincentivize foreign production as well. Look to sections 1C and 1D, which place tariffs on pharmaceutical imports and finished products coming from India and China. And just in case anybody's worried about products that come during the COVID-19 pandemic, we delay the implementation of those two sections for an additional year, so we don't have to deal with that crisis while we're also facing a pandemic. But why is that so important? On top of creating more American jobs, you also increase the safety of our pharmaceutical products. The Wall Street Journal explains on April 14, 2015, that the FDA has had considerable trouble inspecting Chinese pharmaceutical drugs because they refuse to give visas for monitoring agents. But by passing this bill, you circumvent that entirely. You not only disincentivize importing drugs from countries like India and China, you incentivize domestic production where we can actually ensure safety. To the negation, prove to me why your impacts outweigh safer drugs and American lives. When they can't, you pass. We have lost 566,452 of our constituents to the COVID-19 pandemic. That's 566,452 reasons to pass. Thank you, Chen. Three minutes and nine seconds. Questioners, please raise your placards. Any and all, all right. First to Senator Wu. Thank you. Is there a PPP shortage like right now? In the status quo, yeah, to some extent. Great. So your best solution to that through sections 1A and 1B is to stimulate investment into these domestic manufacturing. Does that solve yes. for the short-term PPP shortage right now? This legislation isn't meant to solve all of our short-term problems. It's but, a but, long-term investment to make sure that the COVID-19 pandemic doesn't But happen. we disable American businesses' ability to buy offshore immediately. That's delayed by a year. We deal with the temporary PPP regardless. Okay, so one of your impacts in the bill is creating jobs, right? I don't want to promise a constituent a job for like one year or half a year when this like, there's no need for this anymore. So what happens to all those jobs? There's plenty of need for this in the long term. Domestic form Pharmaceutical production is a very like fast growing industry and in the long term, you're going to so create- So if we're not involved in international like productivity, won't we be sure. behind the scale in the United States? No, we're not behind international productivity. We're just shifting global manufacturing back to the United States. Okay. Chair absorbs Nakajuna. Does, do China and India like rely on like our pharmaceutical products at all? To some extent, sure. Yeah, like, like China literally like relies on us for like finished drugs, right? There's a reason they didn't cut out the finished drugs during our ongoing trade war because they need them. Yeah. Why would they just stop them out of nowhere and we'd stop getting ours? Um, they're not going to stop them because they need us just as much as we that we them. They don't have the investment in the infrastructure. Yeah, and they're the cheaper ones. So what's the point of that? Drugs, we can. Yeah, but we need them because they're so much cheaper and people can actually get them in their no, hands. we can make that Thank right you. here with more innovation. Martinez. So why are we so reliant on drugs from other countries? Why? Because those are the global manufacturing hubs. Companies like companies like to go there for cheaper labor. Right. They're more accessible for people to use. Why should we cut off one of the most accessible uses of drugs here in the United States? 
I'd argue that if you make a $5 billion investment, we can increase innovation and make those production plants right, just as cheap here in the US. Here that permit companies to abuse price gouging. How do we, we stop that? Deal with that Thank you, Kim. Like time has elapsed. Thank you. Speakers on the negation, please raise your placards. Right, I'll wait for, okay. Um, off of uh, press, uh, off of recency, that'll go to Senator Martinez. I thank the chair. Hello again. It's Senator Martinez now on the negation. Again, I'm always ready. If my presiding officer judges Parley are not ready, let me know. But other than that, I'll happily begin. Thank you. During our last debate, we saw a piece of legislation fail out of concerns that America's most underrepresented and low income constituents would never reap the benefits of programs that sought to help them. Yet the same senators, like Senator Dilip Kumar, fight to restrict any sort of medical access to these groups, choose a narrative, and choose to fail this bill. First, you fail today's legislation because it hurts low-income Americans. Senator Dilip Kumar, I asked you in questioning why foreign production is so important. You said because it's cheaper. So it makes no sense that we would now restrict this cheaper access to medical supplies under your advocacy. Section 2D of today's legislation puts a 2% tariff on pharmaceutical inputs and a 4% tariff on pharmaceutical products coming from India. However, this is extremely problematic. As Global Business Reports quantifies for us on February 12th of 2020, explaining the generic drugs industry continues to strengthen itself as a key pillar of India's burgeoning economy. As the largest provider of generic drugs in the world, the sector contributes to 40% of the United States' generic demand with Indian companies approved by the FDA. But who exactly buys these drugs in the United States? Brown, Tolley, and Talbert write for Pharmacy Journal in March of 2016. In their study, they found that individuals lacking medical insurance are disproportionately likely to suffer from negative health outcomes and barriers to health services than individuals with private and public insurance plans. They are also more likely to use generic drugs because of their lack of insurance and because patents by American companies rely a cost that is unable to be overcome. Today's legislation jeopardizes the health of millions of low-income and uninsured Americans whose reliance on generic medication cannot be replaced. Unless efforts are made to restrict the use of patents and the abuse of corporations that gouge prices, this bill only makes healthcare inaccessible. But second, you fail because it decreases access to PPE. I understand Senator Dilip Kumar in his speech told us that today's legislation is implemented in one year, meaning we no longer have to face a problem of the COVID-19 pandemic. However, just last month, Dr. Fauci told us that we'll be wearing masks well into 2022 after the implementation date. And right now, hospitals are still experiencing shortages. Bruce Lee, not the martial artist, writes for Forbes on January 18th of 2021, explaining that hospitals are still experiencing PPE shortages because there's a lack of cooperation between the federal government to purchase equipment and distribute it to these facilities. But now Section 1A is telling us that the federal government can no longer make those purchases. And the problem is, Holland and Knight Law tells on April 13th of 2020 that N95 Five masks, for example, are a major import to the United States, but roughly half are made in China. However, when we restrict foreign imports, we can no longer have access to important PPE. This pandemic will never end as long as the government delays our response. That's why you fail. Thank you, Senator, for that speech of two minutes and 58 seconds. Questioners, please raise your placards. Any and all questioners. All right, we'll start with Senator... Uh, Dilip Kumar. So a yes or no question, did India and China ban pharmaceutical exports when they had public health crises within their own borders? Like environmental concerns? No, public health problems like COVID. Yeah, they had to shut down manufacturers because they couldn't have people spread a disease. Yeah. So what's the point of lower costs for these drugs if we don't get them when we actually need them? So the thing is, they're still exporting to us. In the last couple of years, they're still exporting more generic drugs than we would ever produce in the United States. Because Your production Adam, fell off 50% when we needed them last years. year. How was Senator that? Verma, were you interested in the questioning block? I'm no longer interested. Okay, Senator Dleep Kumar, would you like to question again? Okay, go ahead. Sure, so how is it helpful when they took away um, like domestic production that exports to the United States when we actually needed that PPE so badly? So all production globally decreased, but we're still getting a majority of foreign equipment 
from other countries. That's why I argue that it makes no sense to cut off that avenue we have because there's not a lot of cooperation with American companies. Sure, why don't we incentivize that innovation and that cooperation by investing in those companies under this bill? No, that's not what today's legislation is doing. It's essentially making it harder for us to create those partnerships. Senator Crowley. Does this bill place tariffs on imports from other countries in the Indo-Pacific, for example, where we buy cheap drugs? Um, no, it only mentions China and India, but I'm arguing the problem with cutting off our trade with India is that they give us the, like, probably the largest portion of our generic drug market. So no other country- Right, because we have a relationship with India. What if we establish a relationship with other producers in the Indo-Pacific no and- No other country in that region can make up the losses. I'm talking about 40 Because they're not, a, there's not a market for it. Because we're purchasing from Thank India, you, Senator, there's no market Williams. for other countries. Senator Crowley, would you like another block? Dilip Kumar? Anyone else? Come on, I'll question myself. I don't think the rules permit for that, but thank you for volunteering. With that, I'll absorb the last block and we'll move on to affirmation speakers. Please raise your placards. All affirmative speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Farage, thank you. Once again, that's Senator Farage speaking a little bit earlier than I expected, but understandable because there wasn't that many people on this side. This is how it's spelled. Please let me know if you're not ready. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Just one year ago, this nation was forced to face a reality that rocked American hospitals. No, I'm not talking about COVID-19. I'm talking about the realization that our dependence on foreign drugs could spell out disastrous consequences for hospitals that are already teeming with illness. But pass this legislation and we end that concern here. First, I want to address the point of cost. Senator Martinez spends their entire three minutes expressing concern about the cost of drugs increasing, but recognize that that's unlikely to happen. An October 2019 report by Janet Wilcock, the Commissioner of Food and Drugs for the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, explains that the biggest barriers to domestic production of drugs is that it requires a large factory site and a large workforce. This explains why drug production is growing inside China, but it's falling inside the United States because there are just fewer labor re regulations in China and there's more funding to get this done. But under today's legislation, we are supplementing companies with loans from the Small Business Administration, which is effectively solving for the concern of production cost that Senator Martinez brings up. But even more significant, we give U.S. companies the ability to compete amongst themselves and also against the tariffed goods from China and India. Senator Martinez, if U.S. companies cannot keep prices low enough for all Americans, they aren't going to be able to compete with the tariffed goods. So in the end, we ensure that your bank account doesn't decide whether or not you can afford the medication that you desperately need. But Senator Wu asks in cross-examination about whether or not we're going to experience a PPE shortage. And Senator Martinez also discusses this in their speech. Recognize that domestic production is already happening. A January 2020 article by Maya Anderson of the Becker Hospital Review explains that HCA Healthcare has entered into a joint venture with A Plus International to expand access to personal protective equipment by manufacturing surgical masks inside the United States. We've already seen companies who are stepping up to the plate and ready to take on this new burden. We're not going to face a shortage in the status quo because production is already happening. But finally recognize that today's legislation protects Americans from the weaponization of pharmaceuticals. A December 2019 article by Doug Palmer of Politico explains that there is a huge concern over the security risks of U.S. dependency on China for generic medications. For relations to China to escalate, they could easily cut off our supply of medication, leaving Americans stranded. If living and legislating through a global pandemic has taught us anything, it's that we should always prepare for the unexpected. If we let China's dominance over our medical supply continue while tensions continue to rise, we put millions of lives at risk. Mothers unable to get medication to lower their children's fever or adults unable to get the heart attack prevention they need to keep them alive. At the point where China's dominance over our medical supply threatens our constituents, we have to do something about it, affirm. Thank you, Senator, for that speech of three minutes and nine seconds. Questioners, please raise your placards. 
Senator Wu. Hi. Thank you. Hi. So in a world where no American agencies or departments can purchase from any offshore source, does that limit or expand the like sustainability and like reliability of our supply chain? Right. I understand. It's going to limit it, but recognize that we're also expanding production in the U.S. So it's going to be like overall, we still have access to that supply. Sure. Localized production, is that more or less vulnerable to domestic disruptions? It's going to be less vulnerable because we have oversight over that domestic production. Thank you. Send and we have right quality. Why would China like randomly like cut off like supply to us? Like you say they have like dominance over our medical supply. Right. Because China is looking for anything they can use for leverage. If we were to see tensions escalate, China could easily cut off yeah, the supply. Like our tensions with China have already been like really high. Right. But they, they were they, actually so bad at the yeah. beginning of the pandemic that this was a huge concern. Yeah, no, no, no. But the thing is, when they if cut off like, trade, when, when they, happen, No, let, let me, like when they cut off trade with us, they specifically left out our full like drugs because they need them. So we have leverage on them. No, we don't have leverage on them. They're the ones who Thank produce you, it. We need time to start the Thank you. Speakers on the negation, please raise your placards. All right, uh, that will fall to Senator Gorn. I thank the chair for the judge's reference. My name is Senator Gorn, spelled G-O-R-I-N, and I'm speaking for the second time this session in the negation. When everyone's ready, can you please give me a smile, nod, or some indication? Lovely, perfect. Thomas Jefferson once promised life liberty, and the pursuit of low cost medication. And while it may be a hard pill to swallow, today's legislation violates that oath and hurts more than it heals, which is why we must negate. First, passing today's legislation increases the cost of drugs, contrary to the claims of Senator Farage. That's because today's legislation severely limits the free market by implementing tariffs. A study conducted by the University of Massachusetts published in October of 2018 found that increasing market access to drugs improves competition, which reduces drug costs. An FDA study further quantifies on April of 2020 that products with a single generic producer sees a 39% decrease in average manufacturing prices, but with six or more competitors, we see a 30 uh, sorry, we see costs reduce over 95%. Senator Crowley asks, why not go to other countries? The answer is we already are doing that. But when we have an increased market, the costs reduce substantially more. The U.S. International Trade Commission quantifies in 2019 that each year the U.S. imports about 102 million kilograms of drugs from China and 98 million kilograms from India, making them our top two importers, which today's legislation targets with tariffs in sections 1C and 1D. Senator Deep Kumar, tells you that this is a bad thing, but I disagree because our imports are key to increasing our market competition to lower costs, life-saving drugs for our constituents. Moreover, passing prevents Americans from having access to medication by weaponizing it. Politico explains on April 10th of 2020 that one of the largest national security threats in the U.S.-China trade war would be implementing tariffs on everyday medication taken by millions of Americans, which is why both the U.S. and China decided to deliberately not implement tariffs on pharmaceuticals. But that changes the moment we pass because we violate our deal with China, enabling them to implement retaliatory tariffs even before our 5 to 10 percent uh, tariffs per Section 1T take effects next year. That puts American lives at risk because our supply chains are not prepared for that. Senator Farage, even if we provide funds for our pr production in the United States, that still takes time to develop. We cannot afford that when China is going to be implementing retaliation right away. Next, Passing today's legislation threatens our ability to help our constituents in a time of crisis. That's because Section 1 of today's legislation prohibits our federal agencies and departments from purchasing finished pharmaceuticals and medical equipment from outside the U.S. The Center for Strategic and International Studies reports in April of 2020 that at the start of the pandemic, the government's emergency stockpile of essential medical equipment was depleted, forcing the Department of Health and Human Services to purchase over 500 million FDA-approved respirators and face masks to meet the demand. Our federal departments are essential to ensuring our medical community has the necessary equipment and ammunition needed to combat disease, especially during situations like the pandemic. Passing threatens our ability to stop, respond to future shortages of medical equipment, not just uh, PPE, Senator Farage, it goes beyond. Senator Dilip Kumar, we can boost domestic markets, but do not find the helping hand. Senators, we must guarantee life, liberty, and low cost drugs. Uh, thank you for that speech of two minutes and 59 seconds. My apologies for holding up the wrong sign. Um, we're going to go through questions first, then we're going to have a short in-house recess for uh, Judge Barry to fi uh, fix her technology issues. With that, uh, all questioners, please raise your placards. Okay. I will go first to Senator Farage. Hi, 
Okay, so you said competition decreases costs, right? Okay. okay, so US companies are not competing with foreign companies. Doesn't that mean that prices decrease? Okay, here's the problem. It's going to take time for these US companies to go ahead and develop this treatment, right? Right, and that's why we're giving them funding. But yeah, I'm saying, I agree, we should give them funding, right? But I don't think we should ever implement tariffs. Okay, so how else are we going to incentivize US companies to start producing? We're going to give them funding without implementing tariffs. They're not mutually exclusive, but today's legislation puts them together. Okay, but then how do we ensure that they can expand? Why would other distributors ever purchase US goods at its infancy of development if you have Chinese goods that are also at a lower price? Like you have to implement tariffs, don't you? Here's the thing. When we develop medication, the US is like leading in medication, right? So that means that we're producing like- Well, apparently we're not. Innovations. Like you said. We're actually, we, we are one of the number one um, creators of in our, leaders in R&D compared so, to any other nation. That's why countries purchase from us. So that means that we're very able to develop even more drugs even now. Yes, Thank you, vendors. Time has elapsed. Speakers on the affirmation, please raise your placards. I thank the chair. Thank you. Any and all affirmative speakers? Um, seeing none, the chair highly, Senator Farage. Uh, I just wanted to ask, does Judge Barry need us to stay? Yeah, we need, we need a little bit of time. Okay. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'm just going to leave and come back. It's just lagging a little bit. I was still able to hear you fine, Senator Gorin, so please don't be concerned about that. I just want to try and get it resolved really quickly. I'm so sorry. I'll be right back. All right, then we'll automatically uh, enter an indefinite recess. If this is a recess, can we just like see who's left and who's going where? Because people are about to get... Let's do split yeah, more half. an indefinite recess until... Um, so there are some... All those who wish to still speak on today's legislation, can you just raise your hand or placard so we can get a count? One, two, three, four. Senator Lyon, you're on AF, right? Are you on AF? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and ask for AF and egg splits now. All those who wish to speak on the affirmation of this piece of legislation, please raise your hand or placard. I'm One, flipping. two, okay, two. I'll All also flip, but it'll take me some time. So after they go, I can go. Okay, so yeah, three. I probably go after another next speech. Okay, perfect. That means you have three, and all those who wish to speak on the negation. One, two, three, four. four. Okay, so we're we're going we'll to be good. Fine. If we have three, yeah. Yay. Wait, so is anyone going to speak right now on the app, or are we going to break cycle and then go back to app after? I think it would work better if we broke cycle because then you'd have that extra neg in the end. You're right. It, That's it wouldn't make a difference in the long okay, run. It's whatever. There's someone that wants to like go up since we have this recess, maybe like. Well, actually, this is this is important. Can, do we have someone ready to go after this broken cycle? Because if we don't, we no. That, I think yeah, Senator Lynn. Ready to go. Oh, okay. What state is everyone from? Are we allowed to oh, say? Oh, yeah. California. 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 We're California. California. We're California. California. We just can't disclose California. school. So many California people. Yeah, there's like 40 million people in California. Dominance. <laughs> we do have a You're lot right. of people. It does make sense though. No, are there any people from Florida? No. I feel like I haven't seen that many Florida this people. You <laughs> Okay, you're repping for everybody. Don't worry. As the sole representative of Florida, I just want to apologize for like literally everything. <laughs> for Florida. <laughs> what apologize for? Um, we have like Publix and Disney World, but then we also have Florida Man and anti-maskers and just a lot of people running around. Just the fact that you made it through the last year is really impressive, so. Anti-maskers exist everywhere though. That's, 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 true. that's, that's true. Right. I live in like super liberal California, like, okay. um, and there are people outside protesting an, a non-existent mask mandate, mind you, every day. <laughs> I live in the capital, so we see those protests and we see all the Trump flat, like, People would drive down the freeway with like crowds of flags. Is I live in like Arizona, worst for education, worst for car accidents, and worst for COVID. <laughs> Is this anyone's last tournament? No. I think my we still really got spirit because this is my more tournaments final. This year. Yeah, this is my final like, goodbye. Really? It feels weird because. Yeah. I just, it's like every, the last six years have culminated into an online tournament. I know that's what I'm, I haven't been doing it for six years, but I'm pretty sad that we don't get to have like a final. I'm, I'm still going to try to debate though in college. Like, um, 
I talked to the debate team at my like uh, school and they're saying like they'll probably try to put in like a Congress division for high school. So if any of you are interested for in college. No, no, I mean like for oh. high school, they have a high school invitation. So if any of you are interested in going to Georgetown for a Congress division, let me know because I want to get it started. All right. Um, sorry to cut that short, but uh, Judge Barry is back. Um, is everything fine with your connection? Yes, thank you so much. I apologize, everyone. Sorry to interrupt. All right, no problem. With that, then any affirmative speakers? We didn't have any. Then we'll have to break cycle and go to the negation. Any negation speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Nagarjuna. Uh, to everyone, my name is Senator Nagarjuna, N-A-G-A-R-J-U-N-A. -A -A. Again, Senator N is completely okay. Any indication for my judges when you're ready to do it? All right. One, two, three, four. All right. I agree with senators on the affirmation. If there's one country we absolutely don't want to be reliant on for our literal medical supplies, it's China. So my issue with today's legislation lies not in its intention, but in its execution. You defeat today's legislation because of the effect it has on pharmaceutical prices. Sure, Senator Dilip Kumar, Indian finished drugs are valued so high, but it's because of how much we use them, not because they're expensive. The FDA found in 2011 that active pharmaceutical inputs or APIs from India and China are up to 40% cheaper than they are in the US, which is why 80% of our APIs come from those two countries. And yeah, the biggest point of debate in today's round is whether drug prices will increase or not. Let's finally look to precedence. Harvard University writes in 2019 that Trump's tariffs on Chinese APIs increase costs for pharmaceuticals in the US by $400 million. Senator Farage, prices do not decrease just because of competition. And take a wild guess to who that impacts. The Harvard School of Public Health in 2009 makes it crystal clear. It's the Americans that have the least that have the least to stand to lose the most. Senator Martinez tells us that people will have to start buying generic drugs, but they often have to resort to something much worse. When drug prices rise, they're given two options. First, drugs are a relatively inelastic good. For example, if milk becomes more expensive at the grocery store, I could just stop buying it. But when the prices of insulin rise, diabetics can't stop buying insulin. So they have to cut into their savings, their rent payments, their gasoline and other necessities. But second, Americans often cut back on their dosages to make each prescription last longer. The Kaiser Family Foundation finds in 2019 that 88 million Americans did this last year. And the US Surgeon General estimates in 2012 that 125,000 Americans died because they couldn't afford to take their medication as prescribed. And that is the effect when prices increase. When we affirm, we pick a fight against China and India, but we force our constituents to take the blows. Now, believe it or not, the solvency is that it's finally time we take a page out of China's book. Senator Farage is worried about Chinese dominance on our medical supplies, but that's category, categorically false because the Council on Foreign Relations writes on August 14th of 2019 that while the US does need China for pharmaceutical inputs, China needs the US for finished drugs like anti-cancer treatment, something imperative. However, the World Health Organization wrote in 2017 that China is increasing investment into developing their own finished drugs, which may seem problematic. But actually, we both have the same idea because the CFR highlights the key difference. Even amidst our trade war, China explicitly exempted the Finnish pharmaceutical club products from the US. They knew that as their domestic industry developed, their people still needed access to affordable foreign pharmaceuticals from the US. So it's a hard pill to swallow. But right now, China is making more humane policy decisions than we are. Far too often, doctors prescribe literal life-saving medication, yet our constituents are left with empty pockets. Don't let more lives be lost in the hands of the pharmacy cash register. Negate. Thank you, Senator, for that speech of three minutes and eight seconds. Questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Farage. Hi, so if China's developing those same drugs that we're producing, how did they rely on us? No, like I said, right, because they're making the more humane decision that even though like domestically they're working on stuff, their people still needed access to our finished products. Okay, That's why but, they didn't. 
But yeah. even then, we're still more reliant on them because while they have the products that we're also making, they, we yeah, don't have the products. That's clearly that they're not making, true because right? there's a reason Trump placed tariffs on them, but they exempted our. Okay, finish. so yeah, let's talk about Trump's tariffs. When those yeah. tariffs happened, were we like actually yeah, our, our drug prices increased four hundred million? Thank you, That's what happened. Senator Farage, would you like another block? No, thank you. Senator Dilip Kumar. If we subsidize five billion dollars of production under today's bill. Why would drug costs increase if we're literally giving them the money to keep it low? Yeah, because that like, that money, the five hundred billion, isn't going to giving our constituents drugs. It's going into research and things that we make our own drugs. So in the that's like maybe something in the long run. But for right now, you're leaving our constituents empty-handed. Isn't it going into research on how to lower those drug costs yeah, but for the long while term? that research is done, which takes decades on decades, our constituents are dying should, because they don't have the medicine. The Thank you, senators. Time has elapsed. Thank you. Speakers on the affirmation, please raise your placards. Senator Lin. I think the chair that Senator Lin spelled L-I-N. I spoke ninth on the previous bill, if that helps. Whenever y'all are ready, I'll be good to go. Awesome. Awesome, great, great. Despite parading ourselves as one of the best countries in the entire world, it's been made clear by other senators already and basically the entire international community that our healthcare system and pharmaceutical system is one of the worst in the world. But it's time that this bill, which actually aims to improve upon it instead of completely disaster it, is the only reason that you have to pass. Mainly because impacts of accessibility and price only go towards the affirmation. Prices don't increase when you pass today's legislation. Here's exactly why. Senator Nagarjuna, Martinez, and Gorin all tell you basically the same thing. It's going to be more expensive for distributors to purchase US-made APIs or US-made finished goods rather than foreign goods. And as a result, those prices have to increase to American consumers. But let's look at exactly what happened when tariffs were put on Chinese pharmaceuticals. Bureau procurement in 2019 explained that tariffs during the trade war were astronomically higher than the ones proposed by today's bill, with a 25% tariff on APIs compared to this bill's 5%. But despite speculation, we actually didn't see the disastrous effects the negation alludes to. There were no exponential increases in prices in pharmaceutical drugs through direct purchasing or even through government programs like Medicare and Medicaid. But Senator Nagarjuna tells us that we actually saw a $400 million increase in prices. Here's where he's mistaken. The Harvard publication in July of 2019 explains what that statistic actually was. Not an effect, it was a previous estimate. Newly imposed tariffs said could end up increasing healthcare costs of medical equipment by $400 million nationwide. That was the economist's impacts and statements before those tariffs actually went into a place. But that wasn't what happened when tariffs actually happened. What did we see though? Companies were forced to take an internal look at other operational processes to determine whether costs can be cut elsewhere without disrupting quality levels and delivery schedules. And companies made room to increase production of APIs domestically. Here is crucially why pharmaceutical companies can't simply just hike up prices to the point where people can't afford them. Because people can't afford them. The Atlantic in March of 2019 explains something that we all know. US drug prices can range from two to five times more expensive than every single other country. No one's disagreeing with that. But there is a reason why they aren't more expensive in the status quo than these current rates, because there comes a point where the balance between profit and accessibility are equal. Unlike many other sectors, pharmaceuticals make an astronomical amount of profit. These corporations and companies aren't hurt when you pass this legislation. They still have a very large cushion to fall back on. And crucially, just like Senator Nagarjuna said, American citizens don't get more spending power when you pass this legislation. If American citizens and the amount of drugs that they can afford stay the same, there is no way for pharmaceutical companies to increase their prices and decrease consumers and their profit overall. That's why you see the same impacts and the only positive effects are ones that affirmation speakers have already told you. You see increased stability, you see increased accessibility, and you have the domestic US market actually burgeon into the country that we wished it could be. That's why you pass. Thank you, Senator, for that speech of three minutes and seven seconds. Questioners, please raise your placards. All right, I will go first to Senator Gorin. Hi, Senator, what happened to EpiPen over the last year? I'm sure it's increased, yeah. 
it's substantially increased. It went from like 60 something dollars to $300. So because those ceilings were removed. So why won't these, since there's no more ceilings, why would these prices not like increase at least a little bit, if not a whole okay. month? Even by that logic, then you can just say that prices could increase at whatever time, because that wasn't prompted by like a decrease in foreign goods or anything. Right. But competition is what keeps costs low, correct? Yeah. Exactly. So when you decrease that competition, doesn't American drugs producers. companies now have an incentive to hey, increase you, you, competition from American producers? How long did those Trump tariffs on medicine last? Yeah, not that long. I'll agree with that. Right. They lasted seven weeks. And the reason they didn't make price adjustments was because it was so short, right? Yeah. Right. And we've given you like 15 different instances in which they do rise. And your only like piece of evidence is no. like this anecdote from seven weeks. How no, you've had this one incident that Senator Nagarjuna told you that I already said is false. It was coupled with the fact that these tariffs were only on for a short amount of time. But it was also because pharmaceutical companies can't increase things like generic. Well, well they, they generally can, maybe not by too much, but they will if they have to make more profit. Thanks, Senator. Senator. Most times elapse. Right. Speakers on the negation, please raise your placards. That falls to speaking order. Senator Wu, you have the floor. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Senator Wu, second time today, still spelled W-U, two letters. Any indication when you're ready, I'm happy to begin. Okay. Awesome. Um, okay, cool. Far too often when crafting policy, we forget these words. Our greatest wealth is health. We allow industry to put its own wealth over the teetering health of our people. This policy courts US business interests during a global pandemic. It ignores a very basic precondition. There can be no US business without first protecting US lives. And this has been the logic of the negative for this entire debate. Let's analyze this debate in the short and long term. First, in the short term, refer to sections 1A and B, which take effect immediately. That means that the federal government can no longer purchase any fully manufactured pharmaceutical supplies from other countries. At the end of the day, putting up a barrier to accessible offshore imports that are necessary to save American lives is not good policymaking. This is an implication on reversibility. Once you say that American agencies can no longer buy offshore, that immediately hurts the provision of preventative healthcare goods. Immediately. That's the key word. If there is a gap in medical goods, that gap needs to be filled expediently. Senator Martinez already explained to you how PPE shortages get immediately exacerbated under the world of the affirmative. But even if you don't buy that, mandatory domestic production cripples supply chain reliability in any case. The Information Technology and Information Foundation explains last June that if you force the localization of production for pharmaceutical goods, it exposes the U.S. to shocks that compromise the availability of necessary equipment. For instance, 50 pharmaceutical plants in Puerto Rico were hit hard by Hurricane Maria in 2017. The FDA then reported that 40 high-priority drugs given to American consumers would run critically short nationally if a disruption like that were to take place on our manufacturing chain again. So Senator Farage and I disagree on what happens when you mandate the localization of production. When you say only buy American, it exposes the domestic supply chain to vulnerabilities because now uniquely the geographic diversification that we currently get access to disappears. But long term, this is also horrible because shifting production to America enables escalatory pricing practices. Senator Gorin's analysis on tariffs is important here. And Senator Nagarjuna reiterates this effect again. But even if you don't buy either of them, listen to this. Senator Lin, in the face of a global pandemic, AARP tells us last June that entities in the U.S. pharmaceutical supply chain, including manufacturers and wholesale distributors, have exploited regulatory loopholes and raised prices on 245 life-saving drugs, including for cancer, ICUs, and COVID. On the other hand, foreign imports from places like Europe and Asia have strict government supply chain checks to check back against these companies escalating their prices. You don't have to be an expert on trade policy to understand this layer of analysis. If companies don't have to compete with offshore producers and American pharma gets unfettered access to the consumer block, that doesn't lower cost. It forces it onto the people. This policy puts two things at odds, wealth and health. Please fail. Thank you, Senator, for that speech of three minutes and seven seconds. Questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Lynn. 
Hi, so competition with Chinese or Indian products obviously decreases because there is a tariff, but it doesn't just disappear, right? Like they still ship to the United States. But nobody's buying from them. American agencies, American departments aren't buying from them. This bill prohibits that. But you just said that they were astronomically cheaper than U.S. products. Even with a tariff, they would still be competable, right? More competable than in the status quo. Who's buying from them? The American agencies that this bill expressly prohibits us from purchasing. That's only they, the federal that, government, not agents. That, that's not competition. Oh, like private businesses? Yeah, sure, there's no competition. So I love that last line of questioning. Do we completely end the ability for consumers to get these products from private entities or just the federal government can't buy them anymore? The federal government can buy them anymore. That's okay, so that means that Americans can still purchase these lower priced goods, right? Because through federal entities, I mean, not federal, private entities can purchase them, right? Right. So the analysis so here is. How do you access any of the effects that you talked about? Because the analysis here isn't that competition is the only thing that keeps prices low. Insofar as United States domestic pharma can exploit but they can still purchase endlessly, time has elapsed. Shifting it over doesn't help. Thank you. All speakers on the affirmation, please raise your placards. Senator Crowley. Hi, that's Senator Crowley speaking for the second time in this legislative session. Any indication when you're ready would be great. A few months ago, nearly a year after this pandemic began, we finally passed the $1.9 trillion response plan. Our delayed response to the health crisis upon us is nothing if not emblematic of the downfalls of our reactive, slow, and devastating policy. When this has cost half a million Americans their life, it's clear we need a change. Pass this bill. The main clash of this debate has been over the price of drugs, but the primary misconception everyone makes is that this bill is centralizing supply chains in the US, when in reality, it's diversifying them, meaning it disincentivizes from production from China and India, but it encourages them to produce in other countries, including the US. Senator Martinez and Arjuna, you argue that this will drive up prices by placing tariffs on the cheap imports of India and China. But then Senator Lin tells you that the $400 million price increase didn't actually happen. I'll explain why that is. Previous tariffs in this bill do not place tariffs on other countries that produce drugs and PPE at a cheap rate as well. In fact, a USA report released on April 10th of 2020 identified 180 potential Vietnamese PPE suppliers with the same capacity as Chinese and Indian factories to turn out millions of masks at the same cost. This bill simply encourages companies to establish business relationships with these new suppliers. The question we all needed to ask first is will companies actually comply with this and diversify their supply chains or will they raise prices? The Center for Strategic and International Studies explains on September 10th of 2020, that in a survey, 83% of American pharmaceutical companies said they have announced plans to diversify their global supply chains in the status quo. Senator Narvajuna, if prices do not change because companies will comply, neither will diabetics' ability to afford insulin or the uninsured's ability to buy ibuprofen. The impact is that when companies are buying drug ingredients from multiple countries and U.S. consumers are buying masks from multiple countries, the health of this nation is not at the geopolitical whim of China. Now I want to root this debate in the status quo. Here's where Senator Gordon's argument is really important. You argue that because we struggle to keep our stockpiles full in the status quo, we need to keep the federal government's access to cheap drugs. I would argue that the stockpile crisis of the status quo shows how the flaws of our current policy of stockpiling. The Cong Congress established the National Strategic Stockpile in 1999, but we stopped increasing funding in 2010. Critically, health crises didn't stop. The swine flu and SARS depleted our stockpile. For example, it used to have 90 million ventilators in 2009, but going into 2020, it only had 25 million. Meanwhile, individual hospitals, primarily low-income communities, had completely depleted their individual stockpiles. This is the comparative analysis nobody gives you. Passing fundamentally changes our policy of crisis response. Instead of relying on dying stockpiles from 1999, we provide a long-term incentive for U.S. companies to produce domestically and real-time address the nation's health problems. Half a million you, lives Senator, is the impact of COVID. Consider the impact of your vote. Fail. Thank you, Senator. That's oh, I didn't hear you. In seconds. All right, no problem. Uh, all questioners, please raise your placards. All right. 
That will go first to uh, Senator Gorn. Hi, Senator. So why did these hospitals turn to the DHS for help during a PPE shortage? Because their stock stockpile was depleted. Exactly, right. So why should we limit the ability for the United States to collect surplus? Okay, so what's happening right now is there is no surplus. The issue is that we don't need, we can't even fund this stockpile. It's depleted completely. It's depleted. That's why we need to rely on foreign countries to go ahead and increase. No, our we're already doing that and it's still depleted. That's why we need to produce domestically to make sure it isn't depleted. Thank you. Find us okay, so to produce drugs domestically, you need the ingredients to make the drugs, right? Right. Yeah, so does this legislation only tariff finished products or the inputs for them as well? Both. Exactly. So if you increase tariffs on these ingredients, doesn't it make it harder to produce the drugs you want made domestically? Okay, yeah. So first of all, I'm saying that like a lot of countries like Vietnam and other countries in the Indo-Pacific produce these same ingredients. We just simply don't have relationship with them. Yeah, We're but not tariffing those countries when you pass the and they can quality. get ingredients for the same price from Maybe other sources China as China. China. Thank you. China. Thank you. Speakers on the indication, please raise your placards. Senator, all right. Okay, uh, that falls to speaking order. That will go to Senator Ronke. Hello, y'all. This is Senator Ronke speaking for the second time today. Judges, just give me a thumbs up. I'll be happy to get going. Awesome, awesome, awesome. From the usage of my word, y'all, you could probably tell that I'm a representative from Texas. And the weather there is always the same. It's way too hot and way too windy. But my state has produced less hot air in the past year than the affirmation in the past hour. Stand with me and fail today's legislation. We have to ask ourselves two key questions. First, do prices and access to drugs decrease under today's legislation? And the answer is absolutely. But let's see why. The World Health Organization explains to us in May of 2005 that existent pharmaceutical tariffs at the time decreased access to ingredients by 41% and drugs by 39%. So we can tell that when tariffs are implemented, we lose access to the drugs at all. Representative Dilip Kumar establishes the entire affirmative position on the idea that domestic production can make up for what we can't get internationally anymore. But that doesn't make sense if we don't have access to the ingredients for these drugs in the first place. Beyond that, let me spit fire just like my internet router a couple minutes ago. Domestic production can never fundamentally take over for the drugs we get internationally. The European Center for International Politics tells us in 2017 that prices do increase, but let's see why. Senator Lynn proposes this idea that if you make prices too high, no one can buy it. Let's see why that never materializes. These companies are always one step ahead of us. Let's look to Novartis now. One of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in the world has produced a program that doesn't index a single price for the drug overall. Instead, based on your income, they charge you as much as they possibly can. So instead of seeing a single higher price tag, every single individual person who goes to purchase the drug has to pay significantly more. At the end of the day, we understand that prices increase and access decreases. So the negation wins on that entire side of the debate. But the second question we have to ask ourselves, do quality or any of these de developmental concerns ever materialize? And the answer is absolutely. On the affirmation, Mr. Dilip Kumar proposes this idea that domestic drugs will be of some sort of higher quality. That's not true. Let's realize there's an effective cap on quality and Advil is an Advil no matter where it's being produced. Just because it's produced in the US doesn't mean it's of inherently higher quality. Beyond that, Representative Farage on the affirmation proposes the idea that if we pass, then this gives China a weapon to just cut off our supply. That's also inherent, like a weapon against cutting China cutting off our supply. That's also inherently impossible because China isn't the only supplier in the region. We already have existing ties to India to purchase the same ingredients and pharmaceuticals. China won't risk cutting us off because we have an easy alternative. Let's do a quick case study. Who in the US government purchased the most pharmaceuticals? That's right, our military. The American Air Force explains to us that when we spend more on drugs, they are the ones who pay the biggest burden. In fact, they say bases that have to rely on only American drugs fundamentally get into more conflict and they have more wounded soldiers who never get cured. Stand with me and fail. Thank you, Senator, for that speech of three minutes and 10 seconds. Questioners, please raise your placards. 
That will go first to Senator Crowley. Hi, so in a time of war, why would we want our military medical aspects to be completely reliant on China? All right, I didn't get to like finish explaining this. The reason this is a problem is this legislation says we can only like these companies can only these like federal government people can only yeah, buy exactly. products. Yeah, exactly. So the in a time of war, yeah, if let, we let end up in there. a conflict with the China, they can't limit so our access to, to get, medical equipment. Can I answer the question? It takes an extremely long amount of time to get drugs from America to these bases. And they say that's a quantifiable problem. Thank you, Senator Verma. Yeah, so China will just cut So you talk about quality, right? How high yeah. quality are the drugs coming from China? Good enough. Like we, we Good if enough, there was okay. a significant quality problem with Advil, no one would be taking it. So Advil's from China? Uh, yeah, it's one of the many drugs that's produced there. Okay, sure. So let's just let's just broaden our scope a little bit more. When it comes to the international scale, right? Why is it worse that we're wanting better quality drugs by implementing these small tariffs? That's what I said. There's no increase in quality of drugs. It's the same drug. But there no is. We have more make. oversight. With more oversight, you increase but quality. But the quality of the Thank drugs you, is the same. Thank you. Time has elapsed. All right. Speakers on the affirmation, please raise your placards. Any and all affirmative speakers. Okay. Um, I had thought someone had said they were going to flip, but then we'll move on. The chair highly frowns upon a one-sided debate. Speakers on the negation, please raise your placards. Senator Yoon. Uh, I thank the chair for the recognition. Still, Senator Yoon, I think we might be running a little short on time, so I'll just get right into it. Anybody not ready, I'll, I'll take verbal objections. All right. Um, I will begin. I'd like to tell you about my father. My father is a good citizen, a hardworking person, and a loving father. He's a first-generation immigrant, veteran, and father of three. But he's also a mechanic, and being a blue-collar worker, he doesn't make much. Two years ago, my dad was diagnosed with two life-altering conditions. Yet like 17 million low-income Americans with life-altering conditions, he doesn't have health insurance. Like those 17 million Americans, he has to pay the little he has out of pocket for medication. And like those 17 million Americans, his life will be affected if we pass. Senators Romke and Gordon talked about raised prices in different ways. Let me crystallize the entire negative advocacy into one concise point and do what they didn't, impact. Failed to avoid destabilizing incomes for uninsured people. See, in the status quo, 17 million uninsured Americans are currently paying out of pocket for medicine their lives depend on. But as the Poor People's Project tells us in May 2018, the average uninsured American has to pay $5,000 per year out of pocket, while 40% of our citizens can't afford a $400 emergency. Here's why this is crucial. The corporate finance organization writes in June 2019, tariffs trickle down. What does this look like? Take a low income uninsured American. This point has been confusing. Let me clarify. This American has to buy life-saving medicine like say Prozac or methadone. Vendors like CVS purchase this medicine to sell at retail. If it becomes more expensive for both producers in India and China to move this medicine to America and more expensive for CVS to sell it to people, they all raise prices. Unlike what Senator Lin tells you, they logically pass it on to the customer. That's why the CFO tells us that these tariffs on medicine cost these 17 million low-income Americans on average $760 more per year. 17 million Americans right now that will have to choose between putting food on the table or paying the rent whose lives are drastically affected. That outweighs anything. But on the remaining aft rounds, first, both Senators Faraj and Dalit Kumar tried to tell us to diversify our supply chain and why this is important. I don't disagree. Here's why this point is non-unique, which hasn't been dealt with the entire debate. As the Congressional Research Service notes, the best way to diversify supply chains is simple. Make your domestic supply competitive. That is to say, the reason why we outsource our supply chain is because China offers better and cheaper products. Where they're wrong is their prescription. You don't have to tariff foreign sources when it damages people's lives. Senator Crowley, there's one question that deconstructs your entire case. Can you diversify supply chains without tariffs? The answer is yes. Just make domestic supply more competitive. But second, Senator Farage says that China will cut off all pharma. One response, as CNBC notes in May 2020, the reason why China won't leverage something as big as pharma is because the US can leverage things right back like their energy grid and their primary external food supply. It won't happen. But lastly, Senator Lin says prices don't rise citing the last trade war. I tell you that only lasted seven weeks and was too short for a market adjustment. But even then, as Grand Healthcare tells us, just last year, the vast majority of life altering drugs went up by at least 6.7%. This is basic economics. I invite you to my city where people are literally splitting insulin four ways while others go homeless to pay for medicine. Don't make it worse for 17 million people. 
Thank you, Senator, for that speech of three minutes and eight seconds. Uh, don't uh, mute yourself yet. You still have questioning. Questioners, please raise your placards. All right. I will go first to uh, Senator Crowley. Hi. So doesn't investing $5 billion in domestic supply under this bill make domestic supply more competitive? Absolutely. What I'm saying is that you don't have to get that $5 billion from tariffing goods, right? You can get it from anywhere else. You don't have Are to you tariff. getting it from anywhere else in the status quo? Well, we could just write different legislation or something like that to get that money elsewhere. Like this isn't just, especially if tariffs are so damaged. Where are we going to get that money from? Like we need you to can, produce you can taxes, taxes on anything else. Not, you don't have to do it with tariffs on people's medicine. I feel Thank like any, any other. Hi, so competition decreases prices eventually, right? I mean, yeah, I think we can all agree. On that. Are American drugs right now compatible with Chinese or Indian drugs? Well, I would say probably, yeah. They're not. That's why well, you're I would say like, no, no. So what China, yes, they are, because we have the technology to do this, right? Eli Lilly and companies like this establish the technology. They just make it overseas. Eli Lilly doesn't sell these type of drugs at the mass. They American sell insulin, Provozac. They sell a lot of things. It's just one example. Not, not at the, okay. Chair absorbs. Uh, all right. All speakers on the affirmation, please raise your placards. Senator Verma. I think the chair, for the benefit of my judges, I'm Senator Verma speaking probably for the last time, V-E-R-M-A. I know all of you are all ready, so I'm just gonna get in it. If anyone's not ready, please let me know or I'll go ahead and begin shortly. Okay, awesome. In a village in the Western part of Uttar Pradesh, India lies the world's oldest sharpshooter. While at first glance, she may come off as a wholesome grandmother, the 89-year-old Chandra Tumar has become a feminist icon across India for her marksmanship. Unfortunately, it seems like the negation could use her help because their advocacy is clearly missing the mark. Let's start supplying ammunition to the affirmation and shoot down the negative ballot. Let's wait. Senator Nadraginda, every single negation speaker talk about China. Allow me to clarify and bring an end to this debate. But this bill prevents Chinese companies from mistreating drugs. Senator Faraj, you brought this up, but let me make some more time to weigh the impacts. But because of our over-reliance on China, this Congress is blindly trusting China with the production of drugs. But why is that bad? Politico explains on April 10th of 2020, when FDA inspectors visited Hana Luina pharmaceutical facilities in the city of Anyang two years ago, they found significant devastations from current good manufacturing practices. In other words, Chinese companies were falsifying records when it comes to these drugs and the production of them, overall quality of them too. They further that these problems largely went unnoticed because they weren't and still aren't enough FDA personnel to be able to conduct on-site inspections in China. Metascape on September 28th of 2018 explains that one major example of this was from a drug, Vardasin. Vardasin is a heart failure drug, and because there was a shortage of that specific drug and many more due to our over-reliance on China, the FDA was forced to approve it. It turned out, however, that Vardasin was contaminated. A heart failure drug was contaminated. Ultimately, today's legislation inputs tariffs and provides $5 billion to produce pharma inputs on U.S. soil. We can regulate the production of these drugs. Ultimately, representatives, many of the drugs produced in China are life and death, and in no way should we be allowing contaminated drugs to enter U.S. soil. Enough clash about the rehash. Let's zoom out and broaden our impact. Senator Wu and Martinez talk about shortages when it comes to pharmaceutical supplies, but let's understand how this bill solves. But understand, the sky doesn't fall when we implement a small tariff. Senator N, on your side, that our reliance on China won't go away. And you also say in your speech that a lot of our products come from China. So let me make a direct link into the fact that adding another tariff on China, specifically on medicine, won't affect masks or any other supplies. Senator Crowley already talked about this, but let me further. The Council on Foreign Relations tells us in 2019 that tariffs don't cut off supply. Rather, they make the products better to offset prices of tariffs. Better products means more buyers, which companies get more money. This is also what Senator Yoon says. Senator Yoon, you said your last name rhymes with moon, but your arguments lie within the stars, unreachable by most. Senator Ramke, allow me to put out your fire. You talk about quality. It seems like the quality of your argument is almost as bad as the router. This is a perfect example. In the past, we've been using cheap methods for shirt torn fixes. This bill sets a long-term precedent. Let's stop trying to shoot a target that's not in sight. Let's aim at the right sites and pass. Thank you, Senator, for that speech of two minutes and 52 seconds. Questioners, please raise your placards. All right. I will go first to Senator Wu. Hey, so can you just explain to me the incentive for a company to reduce its price? So uh, 
companies will reduce the price when they have um, more supply, uh, more demand and they have to supply more. So what about the demand changes when you pass this bill? What happens is that when you have these tariffs, these companies have to create better products so that more people buy them. More people are incentivized to buy better products, meaning that the only way to offset these tariffs is through the better products, helping our constituents. If you're talking about consumers writ large, can't they just buy from these producers? Thank you, Senator. Or not we bend? Senator Martinez. No. So how did we find out about that contamination if it went unnoticed by the FDA? I'm telling you, it's because the FDA is so overflowing with all these like drugs that they don't have the but oversight to do so. With these tariffs, about the contamination, so you could tell us about it. Yeah, the solution is tariffs. When we have more tariffs, we have less okay, drugs trying so to be approved I, I just with more ask oversight. How we have that information? Because if the FDA is not doing its job, where are we getting this health? Information? We found out many years later because the FDA has an over reliance on China. Many years yeah, exactly. Later, we have the a tariffs will solve this problem because in Why the present we'll have less applications. I think the chair. Senator Farage. I move to the orders of the day, including previous question. All right. Uh, that is at the discretion of the chair, and I completely agree. So we'll move to the orders of the day. Um, first, voting procedure on this legislation. If you would like to pass today's legislation, you would like to see it become law, please uh, raise your placard and hold it up. Keep it up. All right. I count Farage, Crowley, Lynn, Burma, Dilip Kumar. It's five. You would like to defeat today's legislation, please raise your placard and keep it up. I count Gorin, Yoon, Nagarjuna, Wu, Martinez, Ramki. Uh, there should be no abstentions, right? Then on a vote of five to six to zero, today's legislation uh, unfortunately does fail. My condolences to the sponsor. All right, um, then we'll automatic, automatically move to adjourn at 4.15 p.m. CST. Um, just some, just a breakdown of today's round. We got through 22 questions and, fi uh, sorry, 22 speeches and 51 questions. Um, finished about 20 minutes earlier than uh, we were allotted uh, and failed two pieces of legislation in accordance with a decade of congressional tradition. Um, I would just like to thank all the judges, um, all the, uh, the parliamentarian and all the competitors. This has been a wonderful round. Special shout out to the seniors um, I'm not sure um, if I'll ever get to debate with you again in a round, so um, you have been wonderful. With that, I'll turn it over to the parliamentarian. Yeah, so we have a second session, so I think you'll still see everyone later on after uh, hopefully you guys get some dinner. Um, and uh, so yeah, that's 630 Eastern time, my time. Um, so judges, I don't know if you want to say anything before we break. Good job, everyone. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you for judging. And before we leave, can we go ahead and discuss next session so that we can go ahead and facilitate yeah, that? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Okay. So um, next session, we have three items on the docket. Um, that would be airlines, concrete, and American Rail. Let's get the splits before we decide on which bills to go ahead and speak on. All those who wish to go on the affirmation of airlines, please raise your placards. I can go on that. One, two three, four, five, six. Okay, all those who wish to go in the negation of airlines. One. There's only one person that wants to go neg. We have time. I, have, I, have, I can go if you need it. Okay, two. Go okay. Um, I can go neg. So that's why we have dinner break to prep it. Good thing we're doing this now. All right, all those who wish to go off on concrete, please raise your hand or placard. I can go off. I don't think I'm undecided. I want to do the concrete. I don't anticipate. Okay. I'm just going to call it. All those who wish to go neg? No? I okay. Don't we'll want more sand. Concrete. We can sink it. Like, I know like they build concrete boats and they like used to float those in at swimming pools to try to test them. But you know what? Let's just let it sink. When I saw the bill, I just thought of that one scene from Attack of the Clones. So I, I was really hoping if we got to it, someone would reference it. But go ahead. All those who wish to go on the affirmation of American Rail, please raise your hand or placard. One, two, three, four, five, six. All those who wish to go on the negation of American Rail, please raise your hand or your placard. I'll one, prep one. Two. I'll prep one two. Three. I'll prep a neg. I can prep four, a neg too. Five. Lovely. I'm glad we got the splits done. So Wonderful. 
So now that that's, that's done, I guess the only thing that happens is we'll go ahead and we'll do a split again to determine which bill goes first and which bill goes second when we return. And then following that, um, we'll begin debate. But until then, have a good you too. lunch break slash dinner break, I guess. <laughs> It's so are we to in order when we get back? Is that it? Yeah. And we probably won't end up doing Wait, same. wait, can someone answer this? Does precedence slash recency yeah. carry over between I think it resets. Okay. It resets. The full reset, really. Resets, I think. Thank you. Thank you. All right. See y'all. We'll later. Bye.
Should we do splits around like 325 as more people get here? Sounds good. Just to clarify, on the airlines one, we were um, heavy on AF, right? That's correct. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Hello. Are you okay from tab? Yeah, session one seemed to go okay, at least on our at least on our end. Okay, great. Yeah, everything was good over here. So we finished like. 10 minutes early, 15 minutes early, so that was good. Yeah. And um, this particular session, uh, this chamber is being live streamed. Okay. So I think, actually, I think it's already live. Um, so we've got a host going here, and the links will be up on the front page of Tab Room, and they're also in the uh, live document. Well, they may not be in the live document now, but they will be. Um, and yeah, other than that, you know, runs as before. Um, and then at the end of the session, Abby, you'll just let me know who your top PO is, um, in addition to marking them on your ballot and, you know, doing the parley ranking. Sounds good. Cool. Cool. So, yep, let me know if you need anything. Otherwise, good luck and have fun. Awesome. We'll get everyone just five more, ten more minutes before we start. Yeah, looks like looks like you've got your judges, so you know everything on that that way is good on my end. Great. We're missing one competitor, so we'll wait a, like a minute or two before we do splits. Are we still missing a competitor? Okay, we have 11 people, so we're still missing one. Oh, perfect. Perfect, everyone's here. Okay, so we'll go ahead and we'll start with splits on the different pieces of legislation so that we can determine the order. Okay, who would like to go ahead and give an affirmation speech on headline, on airlines, sorry, airlines? One, two, three, four. On the negation, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, that's decent. All those who wish to go on the affirmation of American Rail, please raise your hand or your placard. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All those who wish to go on the negation of American Rail, please raise your hand or your placard. One, two, three, Four. All righty. That one's a little bit more AF heavy. Um, and I believe Sorry, that I also have a neg on uh, rail. Okay, then that makes the split pretty good. Um, in terms of concrete, I believe we had come to the consensus to not prioritize it. I believe we should still stick it to the end of the docket just in case anything happens. Um, but other than that, I think that we pretty much have our docket set. Wait, so, so for the first one, what's the it was um it turned neg heavy all of a sudden? It looks like by one bill. By one bill, it was like, so it was, I think it was like six to five when we voted. 
Okay, I'll flip back to AF because uh, having two AF speeches in a row is favorable to having two negs. Okay, sure. I think that we should do rail, like uh, the high speed rail first because it looked a lot more even. Yeah, I was yeah. literally gonna say I think rail that. first would be enjoyable. Yeah, I'm down with that. Okay, so the, the docket I will go ahead and post in the chat will be American Rail followed by Airlines followed by Concrete. Yeah. Wait, sorry, maybe I missed it, but I thought that um, Airlines only had like one person who was over when it came to- Yeah, I thought Airlines had a better split. Yeah, I thought Airlines- Why don't we go ahead and do the count again, and then that way we can get a guarantee. Everyone who wants to go on the affirmation of American Rail, please put on your uh, put up your hand or your placard. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All those who wish to go on the negation of American Rail, please raise your hand or your placard. One, two, three. Okay, so American Rail is the one that isn't split yet. All those who wish to go on the affirmation of airlines, please raise your hand or your placard. One, two, three, four, five, six. All those who wish to go on the negation, please raise your hand or your placard. One, two, three, four, I'm five. Tomorrow. Okay. That's so yeah. six, five. We should start with airlines. We should start with airlines first as the initial statement. So here I will go ahead and type the final docket into the chat. It's labeled final docket. Um, that will be airlines followed by um, American Rail followed by concrete. Um, also, uh, I was just wondering, is anybody planning on switching for American Rail just so we don't have to deal with that issue? It's not a huge disparity between the split, but it would be great if you did. I think as we go along and then the uh, speaking order is established, then people might naturally split, uh, switch. Okay. Sounds good. And do we have a sponsor for the first legislation so we don't run into that again? I can sponsor. Perfect. Okay, okay. our round starts at 3.30, correct? PST? Uh, yeah. So a couple more minutes. Senator Crowley, you're our presiding officer. You can just take over as soon as that starts. Be right back. Senator Farage, I don't know if we could do that docket just because of the way the split is right now. Unless there's either a way, it's going to come down to being weird splits, right? Yeah, I know that Senator Martinez was also hoping to do that first docket. Well, I, I thought right now we have um, six five on uh, on airlines. There's no double cycle on airlines. Seven four. Right. We can we can always nominate both and just vote on it. It's not. Easy. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Also, I was just wondering, is there a specific reason why people would prefer the first docket over the second one? Preparation preferences, I'm guessing, or? Probably, yeah. Okay, because I was thinking we'd go through both bills, so. If at any point I my video stops, it's just because I take a sip of water or something like that. I usually come back right along. Okay, um, six thirty EST, Senator Crowley, floor is yours. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Senator Crowley, and I'm honored to be your presiding officer for tonight's round. Before we begin, do our judges have any paradigms they'd like to share with the chamber? 
anything, uh, you, you can just look me up on Tabber if you are that interested. I could say the same. Okay, great. Um, I'll quickly go over my procedure and then we can get started. So for speeches, um, I found that using colored, colored time cards, wow, are easier to see on the screen while you're speaking. So I'll give you two minutes. I read at three minutes and then I'll count you down from 10 starting at 305. And I'll cut you off at 3.15 and move on to questioning. For questioning, we'll be doing direct questioning. So I'll give you this red card at 20 seconds to indicate that there's 10 seconds left in your block. And then at 30 seconds, I'll move on to the next questioner. I'll be following precedents at random until that is set. If you'd like to be recognized for a speech or question, please just hold your placard up to the camera like this. And then don't lower until I've actually chosen on a speaker. And of course, I'll be sharing my precedents. Yeah. Um, Senator Carly, give us one second. So we're, we're going to let you. We're Are gonna there any questions on my procedure? Okay, I think you've reached the stopping point. Um, we're going to let you take a pause. There were a couple of lags for everybody. We went in and out here and there. So if you can just um, just do a tech check real quick, so that we don't have those issues in the future. Um, I, I'm happy to go ahead and run doc and nominations in the interim. Um, I, um, I, yeah, go ahead. Am I still lagging? This hasn't been an issue today. I'm not sure why this is happening. Now you're good. Now you're good. Okay, great. How much of the procedure did we get, if anyone? None of it? Okay, uh, great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know why that's happening. But yeah, let's do that again. So for speeches, I have found that colored time cards are much easier to see while you're speaking. So I'll give you a green card at two minutes, yellow at 2.30, orange at 2.55, red at three minutes, and then at 3.05, I'll count you down on my fingers till 3.15 when I will cut you off and move on to questioning. For questionings, we're doing direct questioning. So I'll give you this red card at 20 seconds to indicate that you have 10 seconds left. And then at 30 seconds, I'll go ahead and move on to the next questioner. I'll be following precedence and recency for speeches and questioning, and I'll be selecting speakers at random until that is set. Um, if you'd like to be recognized for a speech or question, please hold your placard up to the camera like this, and then don't actually lower it until I've chosen on a speaker. Are there any questions on my procedure? Hopefully that went better this time. You are completely clear. If this happens in the future, we'll triage it as we go. Great. Thank you so much. Spoke too soon. Okay, you're frozen again. Now you're not. I'm no longer frozen. You're good now. Okay, great. Um, I don't, I have no idea why this is happening. I'm sorry, y'all, but is there a DACA on the floor? Senator Gorin. A motion, I move to open the floor for DACA nominations. Seconds. Are there any objections? Seeing none, that is so ordered. Are Senator Gorin. I move to nominate DACA A, which consists of airlines, American Rail, followed by Concrete. Are there any further nominations? Senator Farage. I move to nominate docket B consisting of first American Rail, second airlines, and finally concrete. Great. I'll be sending these in the chat so you can keep track of which one is which one. All right, now we'll now vote on dockets. All those in favor of debating docket A, please raise your placards. I count seven. All those in favor of docket B. I count three, docket A has a clear majority. At 6.34, we will begin debate on a bill to help airlines weather the storm. Is there an authorship? Sponsorship. Senator Lin. I think the chair, that's Senator Lin, just spelled L-I-N. Whenever y'all are ready, I'll just get started. Amazing, amazing. Awesome, awesome. Since the start of COVID-19, 10 million people have lost their jobs, one third of small businesses have gone under completely, and twice as many people have become homeless 
than during the Great Depression. And in the name of frugality, we spent $60 billion bailing out airline corporations because of their own negligence. The perverse corporate intentions haven't been an isolated incident. They're endemic to America. Here is why it's so necessary to finally keep airlines accountable, simply to protect American workers. Bloomberg in March of 2020 explains that after the hit of COVID-19, the ability to pay their own workers ran dry for US airline corporations. And so as a result, the appeal to this very government to receive a bailout of $60 billion. The catch? US airlines spent 96% of their free cash flow on stock buybacks that same year. 500,000 American jobs were at risk as a result because the prioritization by their own company heads to emphasize the value of their stocks over livable voyages to their workers is the reason they were in trouble in the first place. And eventually we did mediate the issue, granting them that buyback with regulations under the CARES Act. But this incident isn't a one-time issue and it will happen again. It's exposed just how far we've let corporations leave their workers in the dust. American Airlines, for example, spent $12 billion to pay their workers in 20, 2019, but they also spent $12 billion in stock buybacks over the last five years. Forbes in April of 2020 explains that without prioritizing stock buybacks, companies could have increased workers' wages by $12,000 per person. Not only are workers' jobs at risk because of this negligence, but their wages aren't even as high as they should be. The reason why? So executives can line their own pockets. Harvard Business Review in September of 2014 explains this incentive. Buybacks increase the value of a company's stocks, which is why so many executives' compensation packages are tied and linked to it. Stock-based instruments make up the majority of their pay, and in turn, short-term buybacks drive up stock prices. In 2012, the 500 highest paying executive named proxy statements of US public companies received on average of $30.3 million each. 80% of their salary was because of higher stock awards. This country has essentially zero meaningful regulation when it comes to oversight of publicly traded companies. If you're a CEO or a board member, your choice is simple. Prudently and conservatively save money and plan for the unexpected, but probably eventual calamities or buy back stock at a furious pace and get a big raise in the process. It's clear what corporations have chosen time and time again. So what does today's legislation do to mediate this issue? Section one explains that airlines who spend 50% of free cash flows on stock buybacks in any one year of the five years would be ineligible to receive a bailout from Congress in the instance that they would want one. That's about half as much as companies right now do spend on stock buybacks in the status quo. It decreases the incentive for them to invest in stocks rather than their own workers and makes it so that you'd hold corporations to the same level that you hold the American people. Please pass. That's a speech of three minutes and five seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Tong. Thank you for your speech. So we can agree that these uh, executives engage in buybacks to line their own pockets, right? Right. They've been doing so for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. So would you say that they care necessarily about the well-being of their business or their workers or about their own profits? I mean, they're intrinsically tied together, but in the most immediate, their own pockets. All right, so why is today's legislation going to stop them if buybacks can give them more profits than actually caring about their businesses? Because they can't do buybacks as much. It gives a limit and a cap to it because they no longer want to go. But no, all it does is leverage buybacks, right? Are buybacks gonna continue once you pass today? Yeah. Yeah, so like what happens to like workers when they keep using buybacks, but the company loses more money because of this legislation? No, yeah, so obviously buybacks aren't going to just end, right? But companies, especially since the COVID-19 pandemic and emergency situations have become so clear, right. are do going they to- care, Do they care enough to bring it under that 50% threshold? Because like, like Senator Tong tells us, they're under these like executives that only care about their own pockets. Because without a cushion funding, they're going to go through the same situation again, except Congress won't bail them out. There is a minute of questioning remaining. Are there any further questioners? I would encourage the chamber to question. This is the first speech of the round. Senator Wu. Thank you. So in the future, when companies are going to have to be forced to be responsible with their money, they're weighing a probability of a future calamity happening and the need to be bailed out with a certainty that the stock buyback is going to inflate their costs, right? Or inflate their profit, right? Yeah. But the thing is, when looking at legislation, you have to look at the comparative right now, right? In the status quo, the other incentive just doesn't exist at all. Right. But in what case does a company say, you know what, I'm going to prioritize that 0.01% chance over inflating my shareholders. 
I mean, companies are doing it right 30 now. 30 seconds of question yeah. remaining. Are there any further questioners? Seeing none, we'll move on to a speech in the negation. All negative speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Nagarjuna. And before you begin, I'll notify the chamber that I'm sending the link um, to my sheet in the chat. If y'all could let me know whether or not you can access that. Great, Senator Nagarjuna. Okay, I think Senator Crowley, we're gonna let you go ahead and take that um, break real quick, just to let you reset. Um, you just want lagged in one more time. Um, so we'll just do an indefinite recess at this point um, until we have we have ten minutes of tech time, right? So uh, we will evoke that time right now and uh, take all the time you need. If if it if if it goes beyond that, then I'll I'll contact Tab and see what happens there. Just gonna wait for her to come back and respond. Everyone else is. My Wi Fi seems fine if that's what you're asking. Yeah, everyone else's is good, right? Because everyone else is experiencing the fact that Senator Crowley is. Okay. It's just a pause, yeah. Okay, just check. All right, good. Good, good, good. I'll probably just add five minutes onto the hard stop, 9.05 Eastern time. Um, but we didn't need it last time, so I think we should be okay. Okay, I'm back. Am I still lagging? You're good. Okay. Um, I sincerely apologize. I'm not sure why this is happening. Things that may have cut out, I've now sent the link to the sheet in the chat, and Senator um, Nargajuna has the floor for a negative speech. Thank you. For everyone's reference, my name is Senator Nagarjuna, spelled N-A-G-A-R-J-U-N-A, -A, speaking for the first time in this session. I know it's a bit hard to pronounce, so Senator N is completely fine. Just give me any indication from the judges when you're ready. All right. Perfect. Today's legislation does something rather unique. It sets out to solve a problem, yet ends up working in exact diametric opposition of that goal. But it's because this legislation actually exacerbates every issue that the affirmative tries to solve, you ultimately stand with the negation. I wanna make something clear for today's round. Stock buybacks continue whether or not we affirm. David Rode at Reuters writes in December 10th of 2015 that airline executives have incentive to conduct stock buybacks because they get bonuses whenever a company's stock price rises. They also have incentives to, ple to please their shareholders. The Sevens Report, a financial publication, finds in November of 2019 that a company's level of stock buybacks is the primary incentive for investors to buy that company's stock, since these buybacks essentially guarantee that the price will rise even if the company is doing poorly. So in corporate America, executives understand they can't just cut stock buybacks in half unless they're willing to put themselves and their company's shares in mortal danger. So Senator Lin, when Section 1 curtails companies' abilities to use free cash flows to repurchase shares, they end up using their debt. A debt-based buyback is exactly the same as a regular buyback, only instead of using money that the company actually has, they use debt. Senator Lin, you know what else happens when companies go too far in debt? They can't pay the same workers that you're so concerned about. Let's take a look at an example from recent history. On March 22nd of just last year, the Wall Street Journal reported that companies were banned from conducting stock buybacks using the few funds remaining on hand. As a consequence, the National Law Review found on May 27, 2020, that debt-based buybacks hit an unprecedented level of use in the past year. So why are debt-based buybacks uniquely worse? Well, it's not exactly optimal for businesses to take on massive levels of corporate debt. Annette Polson, the former chief economist at the SEC, writes that the more debt a company has, the greater its risk of bankruptcy since they're likely to default on their interest payments. And before you say we can trust these airline executives to make good decisions, Senator Lynn, we can't, or else we wouldn't be debating this piece of legislation. 
So when airlines start piling on debt, it won't take a once in a lifetime pandemic to thrust them into a crisis. Even a minor economic turbulence could knock them out of the air. And Senator Lin, you are so concerned about workers. When an airline can no longer stay in the air, thousands of workers and their families no longer have a way to stay afloat. So long as we don't stop companies from turning to debt or even make them save their cash flows, I'm unwilling to let selfish executive policies hurt even the lowest rung of workers. Senator Lin and I have the same idea. It's just the negation has the right execution. I'm as much of an optimist as anyone in this chamber, but being an optimist doesn't mean we ignore precedent. We have seen airline executives put their company's future on the line in the chance that they might gain something. If we're so against stock buybacks, we should just ban them entirely. We shouldn't temp tempt rich executives into a world of even greater risk. Ultimately, that endgame leaves no winners. Negate. That's a speech of three minutes and three seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Martinez. All right, so if large airline CEOs are now using buybacks to put money into their own pockets, then what money is left to pay for the employees' paychecks? That's exactly my point, right? They're right. using- But how can they be a CEO of a company that lacks zero employees? Because they think when they make those buybacks, there's that small chance of like making like a huge thing out of it. That's why buybacks happen in the first place. That's why we have this res res legislation. Right, that's why we're passing. It makes no sense for them to continue using buybacks no, if they don't have any employees it. running no, the company that gives them money in the first place. Do executives make more money when their corporation can last for the next few decades or if it immediately goes bankrupt? Yeah, but they don't think like that, right? There's a reason we're presenting- well, I thought you said that their number one priority is the amount of money they have, right? Yeah, exactly, Do you think that right? No, but, and they, th they think using these buybacks because that's the number one way. I tell you at the start of my speech, that because the, like the higher their stock is, the more money they make. These executives, executives are willing to go into bankruptcy and not have that level of They're willing to have their company go Senator into bankruptcy. Are buybacks bad? Yeah. Why? Because they like have these like, it's like puts their companies in debt and all this unless they like- Okay, so buy. Apple has been doing buybacks for the past like decade and we've seen their company go straight up and like airline companies are just as a monopoly. Why won't the trend continue? So, like, okay, so what does this legislation do to something like Apple then? Well, it doesn't. It just it just allows for these buybacks, which has been proven no, successful hurts, in like, the past. You're, you're talking about how like good Apple is, and because they've been using buybacks, your this legislation is what's going to like tear them down. No, it's there are not. thirty seconds of questioning remaining. Are there any further questioners? Senator Martinez or Senator Yoon, just seeing you. I think the chair. So, Senator, yeah, just building off that last line of question, why are they bad? Yeah, because when when companies go into buybacks and they don't like come through on them, like the stocks don't go up, they lose all of that money. Right. So do these companies make these bad decisions on purpose or do they have incentive to do? No, more because they money? think they like the stocks will go up and they make a bunch of money. Right. But that doesn't always happen. That OK, so if we prove to you that buybacks help the economy more than they hurt, would you vote with no, us? It hurts the airlines because when we pass similar okay, so legislation, we like what happened last year, I give you the evidence. They started using debt based buybacks. No one in this chamber the should have a question that. has now elapsed. We'll move on to a speech in the affirmation. All affirmative speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Martinez. Thank the chair. Good evening, everyone. I'm Senator Martinez. I'm speaking on the affirmation of this piece of legislation. I'm always ready to begin. If my judges, PO, or Parley are not ready, please let me know. But other than that, I'll happily start. Thank you. Before modern technology was fully implemented into airplanes, many pilots had to rely on low altitude flying, using geographic landmarks and sometimes even bonfires to find their way in the air. You do not just have to be a great aviator, but a sound tracker as well. To this day, this skill is especially necessary in order to attempt to follow where our taxpayer money goes when airlines are bailed out. Follow the money, find the necessity to pass. First, you pass today's legislation to stop airline industry lobbying. When we limit how much airlines can get in government assistance, we also cut off taxpayer funded avenues for them to insert their interests into this very Congress. Whenever airlines needed bailouts, lobbying suspiciously increases. MapLite, an organization focused on transparency on money and politics found in their analysis published on March 27th of 2020, explaining that federal lobbying records to the end of 2019 shows that industry's lobbying peaked in 2008, with airlines spending $29.4 million to influence lawmakers amid a financial crisis. In 2019, they spent about $19.7 million in lobbying. Yet, interestingly enough, despite cuts to their own employees' paychecks, funding towards lobbying increased the following year. 
open secrets in 2020 found that airlines spent $25 million lobbying Congress. And those are the funds that we know about. But what initiatives are they exactly trying to accomplish with these lobbying efforts? In the map flight analysis, it was found that airlines are lobbying for instances that make families pay more for less space and benefits, fighting mask mandates and decreasing workers' rights. But how do we exactly straighten out airlines' financial priorities? Thomas Polini writes for Business Insider on December 28th of 2020, explaining that Southwest Airlines, for the first time in history, plan to furlough 7,000 workers 7,000 workers. Now, Senator Tong, you asked Senator Lin in questioning if limiting buybacks makes airline companies care about their workers. It is the exact limit that today's legislation puts in place that causes them to care about their workers and make sure they don't become unemployed. Because when payroll protection programs were implemented, they put limits on stock buybacks, like this legislation does. And 32,000 furloughed workers were put back to work. But the second reason you pass a legislation, despite the fact that this holds companies accountable from their political interests, is to increase bankruptcy declarations. With bailouts no longer a viable option for airlines, even if they refuse to cease back buying back their stocks, there's another beneficial option, and it's declaring Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Don't listen to Senator N when he tells you that an airline declaring bankruptcy is the end of the world, because he couldn't even tell you why debt buybacks are bad. We support uh, airlines uh, airlines declaring bankruptcy as opposed to debt buybacks, because according to Richard Squire of the Washington Post on March 22nd of 2020, it is more beneficial because it gives companies breathing room to keep operating while they reorganize their own companies. American, Delta, Frontier, Northwestern, United and U.S. Airways have all declared bankrupt bankruptcy and still come out intact. We allow airlines to actually reorganize and seek resolution instead of the continual purgatory of begging for bailouts. For true accountability, you pass this legislation. That's a speech of three minutes and 10 seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Tong. All right, today's legislation leverages bailouts uh, against um, buybacks from airline companies, correct? Yes. Okay, so is there a guarantee that an airline is going to get a bailout? There's no guarantee, but relying on trends, whenever we've limited their ability to buy back stocks, they've always put more money into bringing back furloughed workers. And that's more right, than- but We're limiting with that bailout, which in the first place wasn't even guaranteed to them, right? So why is that effective? Right, so that's why we encourage that even those who don't comply with today's gestation will now declare chapter 11 bankruptcy, which takes away all of those negative impacts of buybacks that don't allow them to allow- them to do now. Work. Hey, What pushes companies into like chapter 11 bankruptcy? So if a company basically isn't able to uh, resolve its financial issues, they turn to chapter 11. Yeah, I know a major reason that many companies are pushed to like, like the large companies are pushed to bankruptcy is because of their debt based buybacks. Yeah, they can't, find, they can't find resolution, but that yeah, also but, permits them to turn that debt yeah, into okay, my entire speech. So this legislation literally promotes debt based buybacks. So why are we just promoting bankruptcy? There's no because better bankruptcy is a more viable solution instead of them continually asking yeah, us for money and allow them to be questioning is now allowed to the negation, senators. All negative speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Dilip Kumar. Sorry, I think the chair hired everybody at Senator Dilip Kumar, D-I-L-E-E-P-K-U-M-A-R. There are a lot of judges. I'm just going to ask if anybody is not ready to let me know. If not, I'll just get started. Looks like everybody's good. Perfect. <clears throat> The affirmation in today's debate frames this legislation as an emergency landing to prevent corporate greed, but every single one of their arguments sit at ground level. Let's shift to a 30,000 foot view to understand exactly why you fail. So first, let's analyze the affirmation's arguments under their own framework. What happens to the quantity of stock buybacks under this legislation? Let me distance myself from Senator Nagarjuna on my side, who said that companies will use debt-based buybacks instead. I'm telling you, they won't even have to resort to debt in the first place. You instead encourage more stock buybacks instead of rainy day funds for these companies. In the status quo, many companies have a rainy day fund and they use those funds for stock buybacks when the value of their stock falls. These type of stock buybacks can often exceed 100% of a company's cash flow for just a few years, especially if the stock price is lower. In fact, CNBC explains on December 5th, 2019, that Oracle spent $75 billion on stock buybacks between 2016 and 2019 due to lower stock prices, 
despite the company's $19 billion cash flow. Airlines do the exact same thing by not using buybacks the majority of years, but spend all at once once it is necessary. Senator Lin told you about higher buybacks by airline companies during economic downturn. These funds are exactly why. So let's establish a comparative between the affirmative and negative worlds. In the world of the negation, companies put some of the cash flow towards a rainy day fund every year. And when an economic downturn hits, they put a lot of that money towards buybacks to capitalize on those lower stock prices. But in the world of the affirmation, the amount of stock buybacks don't actually change. All that happens is that instead of putting that money towards a rainy day fund, they'll just invest 50% of their cash flow every year to get the bailouts and avoid the penalties. Senator Lynn and Martinez want to tell companies to put money toward employees instead of buybacks. Well, so do I, senators, but today's legislation only changes the way in which these companies use those buybacks with disastrous impacts as a result. Look to Harvard Business Review on January 7, 2020. They say more consistent stock buybacks, especially during a strong economy, increase volatility in the long term. That's because this comes at the expense of people in investing in a company that's already overvalued. And that volatility affects every single American. Look to the Pew Research Center on March 25th, 2020, when they say 52% of Americans invest in the stock market. So when you increase the volatility in the airline industry, it's everyday Americans' retirement accounts that ultimately pay the price. I showed you a 30,000 foot view of the reality of today's legislation. Buckle your seatbelts. The affirmations arguments have crashed and burned. That's a speech of two minutes and 56 seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Martinez. I mean, without implementing this legislation, we're kind of reliant on air, like airline CEOs' own volition to help their workers. Where are we going to see those impacts access with the negations advocacy? Um, I would argue that it's far worse. There's, there's no perfect solution to ensuring that airline companies invest in their employees. But after you pass, they just give more of that money towards but stock last buybacks. Last December, when the PPP program put limits on stock buybacks, they brought back furloughed workers. Why won't we see that with today's sure. legislation that does the same? Senator Romney. Because we have the 50% cap. Hey, Senator. So you talk a lot about these stock buybacks, but how often does an airline company get bailed out in the first place? Um, every time we have an economic recession, it's specifically- Yeah, but it's, you, it's not super years. often, and these airlines aren't a big fan of it, correct? They don't want to have to rely on us giving them money to stay afloat. Sure. Okay, cool. If these stock buybacks are as good as you say, why are they in such an economic crisis right now? Because half the industry isn't operating at full capacity. Yeah, but didn't they have those rainy day funds you talked about? Time for questioning has now elapsed. We'll go on to a speech in the affirmation, Senators. All affirmative speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Gorin. I thank the chair for the judge's reference. My name is Senator Gorin, speak, uh, spelled G-O-R-I-N, speaking for the first time in this session in the affirmation. When everyone's ready, can I please get a smile or nod or some indication? Thank you. All right, lovely. To most people, the sky is the limit. To those who love aviation, the sky is home. As Air Force pilot Jerry Crawford's words fly through the chamber of this Congress, we must remember that sometimes we must set limits and affirm. First, passing today's legislation puts workers first by disincentivizing stock buybacks. That's because section one of today's legislation prevents federal bailouts if an airline spends over 50% of their free cash flows on stock buybacks in any of the five years preceding the bailout. Wagner, an American businessman and former Pennsylvania Pennsylvania Senator explains on April 16th of 2020 that while the CARES Act provided up to $25 billion in loan bailouts to U.S. airlines and an additional $25 billion to pay airline employee wages, it restricted stock buybacks on employees that received this bailout. He further reports that the new law prohibits airlines from buying back stocks and paying dividends until September 30th of 2021 and limits executive compensation. But what happens after this date? Airlines will be able to continue their practice of buying back stocks 
unregulated. Today's legislation propels us towards an improved narrative because now airline companies wanting federal bailouts in cases of emergencies post-2022 will no longer spend over 50% of their free cash flows on buyback of stocks. Jansen from the investment firm Galt Capital explains on February 8th of 2021 that companies often buy back stocks the moment they begin the, the market see, starts to steep in order to invest in itself and improve financial ratios. The problem is that this solution is only short term because in doing so companies spend their free cash flow preventing Preventing them from paying employees, increasing the chance that they need a federal bailout in the first place. Senator Dilip Kumar, even if the money gets put in incrementally, that means that it's even more stable because now companies guaranteed have a 50% minimum of cash that's going to go to employees. In cross-examination, Senator Zhu and, uh, and Najuna asks why companies would want to decrease stock buybacks in the first place. And the answer is they will, because if the pandemic has taught them anything, you cannot rely, you must rely on the federal government when anything happens or anything goes wrong. And the pandemic is one of the many different situations that are going to continue to happen in the future. That's why you were fault. Passing prevents future turbulence by instilling in a limits to buybacks. But why should we place a limit rather than eliminate buybacks completely? Because it enables companies to still protect their stock values to an extent while ensuring the ability to compensate employees in the process. Siegel from the New York University explains on January 16th of 2021 that companies' stock buybacks boost the economy by consolidating company ownership, preventing under-evaluation, and boosting key financial ratios. Thus, Senator Narjuna, a complete elimination of this practice would only hurt companies and therefore it would hurt the economy severely. That's why we still need to keep these stock buybacks in place. Senator Dilip Kumar, we only end up with issues when we see a decrease in that completely. Senators, the sky may be the limit, but it's time to ground airlines back to reality. That's a speech of two minutes and 55 seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Dilip Kumar. So if in the affirmative world, companies are now buying back their stocks in times of an economic boom, doesn't that overvalue those companies? I mean, here's the thing. If they're going to do it like a little by little, either way, you're still going to still have that 50% of cash flow that's going to be there. So that's, right, but that's a high percentage of the cash flow for them to right. put towards those buybacks, okay. especially Even if their stock price is high. Right. So I already explained to you that most of them don't do that unless like uh, they see an economic downturn. Because Senator it's not Wu. very beneficial for them. Thank you. So if an airline were to go bankrupt, would sure. they still be okay? If they're going bankrupt, they're bankrupt. No, because what, what, what the affirmative consistent position in this debate has been is that if an airline loses money, they're still okay. We shouldn't bail them out. They still have like so much profit. Is that, are, is that true? So if an airline needs a bailout, the federal government will continue, will give them a bailout as long as they meet what today's legislation asks for. I'm just asking you in a vacuum, right? If a company loses profit, like United loses time profit. Time for questioning has now elapsed. We'll move on to a speech in the negation. All negative speakers, you, please raise your plug. Senator Tong. I thank the chair. This is Senator William Tong, that's spelled T-O-N-G, representing the state of Illinois. Um, just let me know if you're not ready, or if you are, that's completely fine. All right, I think we're ready to go. With riots at the Capitol building, climate change worsening fires and hurricanes, and a virus still infecting thousands of Americans every day, it seems like the American airplane is experiencing some serious turbulence. But while today's legislation seems like we're turning on the seatbelt sign for the airline industry, it instead causes one of their engines to catch on fire, negate this bill. First, I want to put this question to rest. Will airlines stop buybacks once we pass today's legislation? The answer is categorically no, because I completely agree that airlines spend way too much money on stock buybacks, but the affirmation is fundamentally wrong when they say that this legislation stops the airlines from buying back that stock. Companies already have done this for the past 10 years, even though, according to William Lazonic of Harvard Business Review on January 7th of last year, that when companies buy back stock, they deprive themselves of the liquidity that might help them cope when sales and profits decline in an economic downturn. So that's the reason that Brandon Coach Coden of Bloomberg News on March 16th of 2020 says that the biggest U.S. airline spent 96% of free cash flow, not just in the last year, Senator Lynn, in the last decade. 
buying back their own shares. That was literally up to the point when planes had to be grounded because of COVID-19. So Senator Gorin, if you tell us that they only buy back in the face of economic downturn, there's no reason that today's legislation is going to stop them because you're conceding that they care more about buybacks than bailouts. Senator Lynn, executives aren't going to consider the chance of recession, especially if it's in the next five years, not, neither have they taken the chance of bailouts 100% for granted, so that leverage doesn't even work, Senator Martinez. The bottom line is today's legislation doesn't actually change how much airlines buy back their stock. But what is the problem? When we pass today's legislation, it causes the monopolization of the airline industry. I've already established that airlines aren't going to listen to us when we pass today's legislation because they don't have the foresight and will continue to buy back stock to line their pockets. But they also can't receive bailouts, so they're going to start losing money. That causes consolidation of the airline industry, which has already been a major problem because according to Thomas Polini of Business Insider, this time on March 21st of last year, the past two decades saw the number of major airlines in the U.S. cut in half. And according to Kevin M. Burke of The Hill on October 5th of 2017, now only four companies own 80% of the market. As a result of monopolization, he continues, passenger fares are $4.4 billion higher annually. But that's not the only problem with consolidation. Monopolies and monopsonies also decrease workers' options, Senator Lynn, so you're not actually helping them. Pass and you make this problem worse. So unless you want the airline industry to crash with the American economy sitting in the passenger cabin because we've made them too big to fail, negate. That's a speech of three minutes. Exactly all questions, please raise your placards. Senator Hi, Senator. I'm confused. Why would companies want to lose money? They don't want to lose money. Okay, so if we're, if we're saying we're going to bail them out if they meet these conditions, why would they suddenly not want this? Didn't you literally say in your speech that they would rather get the, or-, or No, I didn't. They're going to, you're, you said that they're going to buy back stock when in the face of economic downturn. And that's one what of they're my, doing in the status quo. That's yeah, what I Yeah, in the status quo. And one of my colleagues at litigation proved to you that they do so because they would rather- Senator Farage buybacks than bailouts. Right. So I actually agree with you that companies aren't going to immediately listen, but once they now have to take care and bail themselves out, doesn't that mean that they have to put aside funding as opposed to investing it in stock buybacks? Not necessarily, or they could be bought out by other companies, right? Executive Why would they agree to that? Wouldn't they rather be able to stay as an independent entity? No, not necessarily, right? I mean, in the time we see that small businesses are constantly being bought up by larger ones because- Okay, but there's four major airline companies. Why would those airline companies risk losing their entire right, business? But they can I also weather- now that to the Mon Dre speech in the affirmation. All affirmative speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Farage. I thank the chair for the judge's reference. That's Senator Farage. It's spelled F-A-R-A-J. I'm gonna get a quick sip of water and then I'll be ready to go. Let me know if you are not ready. All right. We can all agree that air travel is a vital part of any economy. And yes, I think that we should be willing to help them in the most trying of times. But when our government favors the millionaires over the millions that we represent, it's time that this Congress reigns in airline companies before they take the economy crashing down with them. So let me establish one important thing inside today's debate. I actually agree with Senator Tong on the negation that airline companies aren't going to immediately end their buybacks. But let's see why we can still access all of the affirmative impacts in a world where airlines don't immediately end their buybacks and lose their bailout. Because this situation would force airlines to prepare for future economic disaster. Senator Nargarjuna says that this will encourage debt finance buybacks, but Senator Dalit Kumar on the negation actually tells us why this is unlikely to happen. A March 2020 article by Richard Squire of the Washington Post explains that without a bailout, airlines now have two options. They can either renegotiate their terms of credit with their lenders, or they can file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. Now, Senator Martinez believes that airlines are going to choose Chapter 11. I want to personally distance myself and say that the more likely scenario is that airlines are going to be forced to renegotiate their terms of credit. And this is a good thing because it forces airlines to now value economic stability over the amount of profit that they can make. 
So instead of pouring millions of dollars into stock buybacks to artificially increase their stock prices, now they're going to have to choose to invest their money into less volatile, volatile areas of the market or simply put it aside in a rainy day fund. And Senator Dilip Kumar already told us that luckily, airlines already have that rainy day fund. So if we end bailouts, they're going to have to now expand this fund. This is the most important thing to remember inside today's round. We can prevent the reliance of airline companies on government bailouts. So now that funding can finally be spent in more important areas, like ensuring that our constituents can actually put food on the table and pay for their rent. But Senator Tong is still concerned about how this legislation would affect airline employees. American workers aren't even at, put at risk if they lose their bailouts, because bailouts don't even improve worker security. An October 2020 article by Veronique Darugi of the Mercatus Center at George Mason University explains that supporting all 35,000 furloughed workers for the, for the four major airline companies for six months would cost only $1.7 billion, not the $25 billion that these companies have been asking for. Senator Tong, airline companies have been demanding and receiving more than they ever need to actually provide stability for workers. Any additional money is not going to even help these workers. So we don't even have to worry about the risk of these workers losing their jobs. Let's protect our constituents and end this monopoly of these airline companies over our economy. That's a speech of three minutes and three seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Dalit Kumar. Hi. Hi. So true or false, airline executives care about their own bottom line. Obviously, yes. Yeah. So why would they invest in more employee funding if they could just put that money towards stock buybacks in times of- Right. So I wasn't saying that they're going to invest in employee funding. I was saying that they're going to put money into a rainy day fund so they can bail themselves out instead of having to file for bankruptcy. Why wouldn't they use that rainy day fund to pay for those stock buybacks? Because instead, if they paid for those stock, uh, stock buybacks, they're not going to be able to lift themselves up. Senator Tong. That would happen. Thank like you. Like they need some money. Sorry. All right. So you already told uh, Senator Jaleep Kumar that airline executives care about their bottom line. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So in the case that they are facing bankruptcy or are in a financially bad situation, why can't they just be bought out by another one? Because they're not going to want to be bought out. Like if these executives. But why would they not be right? If the executive cares finish. about their <laughs> own. If, if they care so much about their bottom line, they're going to want to preserve 100% of their profits. And that only happens- Time for they... questioning has now elapsed. We'll move on to a speech in the negation. All negative speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Yu. I thank the chair for the recognition for the reference of the chamber since there are new judges. Yoon, Y-O-O-N, rhymes with moon or even baboon. Uh, any pronouns are fine. Is anybody not ready at this point? I'll just get right into it. Wonderful. I will begin. It seems to me here that the affirmation knows as much about labor economics as I do about talking to girls, not very much. In a debate concerning economic affairs, we've heard minimal empiricism and quantification, far too much rhetoric and no consistent warranting. But once we finally delineate what's actually been said, the only path that'll remain is the negation. Fail for one key reason. And if the only thing you take away from my speech this round is this, let it be this. Stock buybacks are not bad. In fact, they help our very citizens. In this debate, both sides have framed this debate irresponsibly. Senator Lin, the sponsor, and Senator Nagarjuna, the first speaker on my side, are both wrong. Let me reframe this. Buybacks are not inherently bad. As Alex Edmonds of the Harvard Business Review and explains in September 2017, buybacks do two key things that are good for working class people. First, buybacks increase the value of the United States stock market. One thing that hasn't been clear this round is how buybacks actually work. Basically, when a company believes their stock price is too low, they will buy back their own stock to influence their stock price upwards. Say, if Delta believes their stock at $40 is too low, they'll buy back a few percentage points of their stock from the market to trend this upwards. Here's why this is good. The US market is global. When stock prices and values go upwards and foreign investors in other countries buy these at higher prices, more capital and economic velocity enters the United States, legitimizing these new stock prices. The impact is simple. The University of British Columbia explains in September 2018 that higher stock values resulting from buybacks increases the retirement accounts of over 60 million Americans by, on average, over 10%. Most companies engage in this, and it helps everyone invested into those companies. But second, 
Buybacks increase the value of labor as a whole. When foreign capital flows into the U.S. and foreign investors have to pay higher prices for equity in our companies, it offers more R&D capital and labor price capital for these companies. But here, this is why most speakers so far have lacked economic nuance. Senator Dilip Kumar briefly mentions that timing is a variable in all of this. No, timing is the only thing that matters because as Edmonds continues, it's when companies do this at times of consistent volatility above inflation, which means we need to focus on targeting banning these in those times when this is bad, not blanket ban them when they do good. But let's clash the other side. Senator Lin first tells us that stock buybacks can cause huge risks to the economy. And second, that this costs working people money. One response to economic risks. You're right, but this legislation is insolvent. If buybacks are bad at certain times, but good in certain times, then you bad them in the, ban them in the bad times and promote them in the good times. But then Senator Martinez echoes the rhetoric of Gary Johnson and tells us that bailouts are infinitely bad and that this would further disincentivize bailouts. Senator, bailouts on the political capital front will exist in any world, but further, bailouts and economic stimulus are what bring jobs back when done correctly. But then Senator Farage then tells us that these companies have rainy day funds instead in their world. That's also non-unique if we can negate and target those bad times only. At the end of the day, reframe this discourse. Don't buy the false narrative that these are always bad and have the nuance to understand that there are two sides to every coin. That's a speech of three minutes and three seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Lin. Hi, so in these instances when corporations invested into stock buybacks before COVID-19, that was obviously bad, right? No, I disagree. I tell you why? that they're good in certain times. They're only bad in times, and I tell you this is why they exist. They're only bad in times where the volatility of the market is above inflation rates. But you can't always it's tell when they're bad before that and actually you hits. Can and you can Let's predict that on a pretty afterwards. good metric. That's why the Harvard Business Review tells us target them in bad times, like promote them in good times. I'm saying that you can't anticipate bad times all the time. Senator Verma. You can tell when. Okay. Hi, so continuing off that logic chain, it's because we're capping it at 50%, doesn't that like have a safety net there? Like we're anticipating for good times. No, or because bad we times? need to, we, no. So when we need to let these companies make that determination for themselves, the reason why they invest. Why? Like 90%, but like, why? aren't we looking long-term and if they help in the long-term, why shouldn't we have this program implemented? No, no. So I tell you that like, if these companies like invest 90%, it raises our stock market, right? This is only bad in bad times. Like that's the consistent. So then won't you have to invest Invest less to get out of like get your stock higher like 50 percent well no we want time for questioning has now lapsed we'll move on to a speech in the affirmation all affirmative speakers please raise your placards any and all affirmative speakers the chair frowns upon a one-sided debate we'll move on to a negative speech all negative speakers please raise your placards senator wu thank you hi everyone senator wu first time today wu any indication when you're ready, I'm happy to begin. Um, I seem to be having a couple uh, like kind of spotty Wi-Fi, but if I kind of like lag out at any point, just like wave your hands around and I'll try to see you. But is everyone good? Okay, cool. <clears throat> this Congress acts as a pilot in the sense that it's our job to protect 330 million passengers across this country. But now that we're in a layover, it's time to truly reevaluate our flight path before we can take off again. First, the fundamental reason you negate is because now in the world of the affirmative, no one gets bailed out, period. The idealistic position of the affirmative is that we should legislate fringe problems in a time where there's immediate need for relief. Make no mistake, there is a reason why we do not have discussions like this outside of the current context. The affirmative seeks to withhold bailouts from all airlines. Let's make that clear. As Senator Lynn points out in the first speech of the S&P 500 airlines, they spent 96% of their free cash flows on buybacks. But buybacks are neither here nor there. This legislation is absolutism. I don't think this has been made clear enough. You are denying buybacks to every single major airline. But you can't just nickel and dime an entire industry this big, as Senator Tong already pointed out to you a few cycles ago. A bailout serves as a stimulus for the American economy that only runs when you have functioning airlines. If you do not reinvigorate that industry, it shifts costs onto consumers. 
raising travel prices and ticket fares for passengers across the country. This is a threshold question in nature, like Senators Tong and Nagarjuna warrant. If airlines are still losing money to some capacity, that means they still maintain organic incentives to preserve their status quo practices. In fact, Doug Cameron of the June 6, 2018 Wall Street Journal qualifies that when jet prices surge and carriers face financial pressures, they raise fares and pass costs onto flyers to recoup the billions of dollars guzzled up by gas prices. Major carriers like Delta, JetBlue, and United have been liberal with how high they can raise fares, but low-cost carriers have faltered under the crippling weight of those economic pressures. There are two implications to this evidence. First, insofar as those, po- those costs passed under consumers is less preferable than a stock buyback, you have a reason to reject this bill. But second, more importantly, the entire affirmative asks on this presumption that the reason you affirm is to discourage future buybacks by creating an incentive to be more responsible. Yet section four of this bill ensures that when this bill kicks in retroactively in 2022, if a company has engaged in buyback practices at all in 17, 18, 19, 20, or 21, they are ineligible. But as McKinsey and company astutely observed last November, the air travel industry is not going to recover to 2019 levels of traffic and revenue from the hit dealt by it from the pandemic until 2024. To me, it is a question of probability. What is more likely? Airlines naturally bounce back or they don't? Senator Farage, the analysis being made by my side isn't purely contextual. Bailouts seldom happen, but insofar as airlines are still stuck in the thick of this pandemic for another two, three years, this bill disallows our ability to reinvigorate that industry. If buybacks are neither here nor there, this bill uh, puts us in a permanent bind. The negation is the only side that deals with the now. That's a speech of three minutes and six seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Farage. Senator Gore, and I apologize. Hi, Senator. Did we grant funds in the form of buybacks, like most recently? Grant fund? You mean bailouts? Buyback. Do we grant buybacks to airlines right now, recently? Are they allowed to do buybacks? Yes. Right now? No, no. Right now, we granted bailout. Sorry, bailout. Oh. So, okay. So we've been bailing out these airline companies. What practices do you want to implement to prevent that from happening in the future? What practices? Okay, so the problem with absolutely banning every single bailout for every single major airline is that we're not banning bailouts. We're giving. We're saying Senator that you need fifty percent. Hi. So you're worried about prices increasing for consumers, right? Yes, I think that's less okay. preferable. Is it more or less difficult for con- for uh, companies to sell those t- sell those tickets right now? It's way more difficult right now. Right, because there's like not enough people trying to travel, right? Right, pent up demand. Okay, so when they're recovering, is it realistic that they're gonna all of a sudden get a ton more people who want tickets and they can actually increase those prices? No, what I'm telling you is that this is like a threshold analysis. If Wait, this why would up- Americans buy those tickets if they're so expensive and there's really no demand for it? Because there's no natural economic recovery without a bailout. Okay, but either way, unless you want to wait for four years, that's fine. Senators, the questioning has elapsed. We'll move on to a speech in the affirmation. All affirmative speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Verma. I thank the chair. For the benefit of my judges, I'm Senator Verma, spelled V-E-R-M-A. Speaking for the first time this session, can I get some sort of indication when you guys are ready? And I'll begin. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right. It seems that today's debate has gone in the wrong direction. Some would say we are just circling over the same argument but allow me to land the dispute entirely. First, you pass today's legislation to ensure accountability in the commercial cargo aviation industry, something that no other representative has brought up in today's debate. Today's legislation doesn't just target passenger airlines. Let's understand why this is so important. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in October of 2020 explained that cargo aircrafts are important for maintaining global supply chains and account for 35% of world trade value. Without buybacks, these impacts are out of risk. Passing today's bill will ensure that these cargo companies have such a safety net. This outweighs the monetary impacts the negation makes because we are looking at this long-term and big picture. There's been a lot of rehashing today's debate. So allow me to spend the rest of my three minutes to reference my fellow negation speakers. Senator N, you told us that buybacks are bad, but let me tell you why that's not the case. First, like Senator Yun told you in questioning, these companies aren't just going to make erratic decisions when it comes to major company moves. Your entire argument was based on a theory, but unfortunately, like your link, a a plane can't fly with actual fuel. Don't believe me. Believe Harvard Law School when they found that on a global sample of 17,487 buybacks, 
from 32 countries between 1998 and 2008, they found that of the 7,394 of them, they had a 1.3 increase in GDP for each company. And in the long term, they returned over 25% over three years. In your speech, you talk about thrusting forward. But unfortunately, senators, if we fail, we will plummet and crash like the stock market without buybacks. Senator Dleep Kumar, you distance yourself from Senator N, and your argument has gone unanswered up until now. You want to weigh on risk assessment, but unfortunately, your baggage won't fit in the overhead compartment. Fasten your seatbelt because I'm going to take you on a little trip. In your speech, you reference Oracle as one of the main companies who went through buybacks, and you tell us that it's bad, but I'm a little confused. Xu Hing Lu tells us on July 2nd of 2020 that because of buybacks between 2010 and 2020, their total employee count went up over by 50,000. Senator, your link falls just like the engines of the negations flight. Let's take a quick stop over to Senator Tong's argument. He tries to warn us about COVID and short-term feedback through buybacks. Senator Tong, it seems as if you're trying to take a short ride while the rest of the nation is on a long flight. Your impacts get outweighed in the end. Monopolies like Apple and Microsoft in the past decade would not have survived to the extent of success they are without these buybacks. Also, without buybacks, consumers are less likely to pull out of stocks and that they're fueling the companies overall. Senator Yun, you say that buybacks should happen on a case-by-case -case basis, but unfortunately, with this mentality, we're never going to get off the ground. Even further than this, you say that companies should be investing 90% minimum, but if we invest now in times of such need, 50% is that equivalent. Don't let the negation steer this country away from hope. Stand with me and pass. That's a speech of two minutes and 55 seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Yoon. Thank you, Chair. So, Senator, we've established the reason buybacks are bad is because they destabilize the market. I tell you, we know when this happens. When volatility is above inflation is when it's too risky. Why should we ban these in all times when they help 60 million people in good times? Okay, because you allude, you allude to the fact that in your speech, long term, buybacks are beneficial. And I tell you that now more than ever, when you're having buybacks, it takes a company from ground zero to at somewhere up. Right. So we agree. Yeah, the we buybacks agree. are good. But we're looking at That's why you pass. Hey, Senator, let's talk about that again. One thing I want to clarify with you, when it comes to these buybacks, is it better if this money is used to buy back these stocks or just sit in those company coffers? Uh, it's better if it's used to buy back the money. Exactly. So if I can prove that none of this money will actually go to bringing workers back, does that mean the negation wins today's debate? Sure. If you can prove that not a singular penny will go towards buybacks, then I guess. All right. Wait, no, Remember I'm saying question that. question has now elapsed. We'll move on to a speech in the negation. On negative speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Romke. Hello, y'all. This is Senator Romke. If all my judges can just give me a thumbs up, I'd be very happy to get started. Awesome. Awesome. Nice. Hello, everybody. This is your captain speaking. Please make sure your laptops are still, seat belts are fastened, and it appears that the captain of today's debate, the AF, have taken us into some turbulence. Let's understand today that the debate falls down to two key questions, and it's clear the negation wins on both of them. First, do workers really benefit when stock buybacks are eliminated? And the answer is absolutely not because none of this money will end up going to workers. A Harvard study in 2019 proposed the question about when stock buybacks are cut by Congress, what are airlines going to do in response? And they found exactly what's going to happen. Previously, when stock buybacks were restricted temporarily, we saw one key innovation. These companies started shell companies, funded them, and had them buy the stocks instead. Representative Lin, the entire affirmative position relies on this money getting to workers, but that never happens. Instead of the company themselves making these purchases, they just have a shell company do it for him. We still see these buybacks happening, so there's absolutely no improvement. However, let's live in the affirmation's magical world where this money somehow stays in the company. Even then, it still doesn't go to workers. CNBC explains to us on May 27th that pre-COVID-19, American airlines still plan to cut 30% of their workers. These airlines don't want these workers here in the first place. Representative Martinez, Representative Gloria, fundamentally, these people don't want to keep these workers in the system. So if they have this extra money, there's one place it's definitely not going, the workers. In the end of the day, economics is the only field in which two people can win the Nobel Prize for saying the exact opposite thing. However, between the two sides in today's debate, only one is noble.
However, the second question we have to ask ourselves is do stock buybacks actually give the airline industry any long-term stability? Oh, wait, I think we have another announcement from the capstan. <laughs> Attention, it seems that a carry-on has been lost by the affirmation. It contained their common sense. Let's get one thing clear. Representative Lynn proposes the idea that these stock buybacks give them money in the short term, and that's a bad thing, and it's better for them to go into bankruptcy. That seems counterintuitive because it is. At the end of the day, it's better for these companies to have short-term funds because they don't waste it or just line their executive pockets. Instead, they invest in their future. View from the Wing, a travel-based analysis firm, explains to us that airlines make money from these buybacks. And when they do, they invest that in the future. One good example of this is American Airlines. Right after completing a stock buyback, immediately bought a whole new fleet of Boeing 787s. This is exactly what we want to see. We don't want to force these companies to invest in things they've already moved on from, like pre previous human workers. Instead, we should allow them to buy this future technology that's going to keep them afloat. Everyone on the affirmation has this one misconception that CEOs are only focused on lining their pockets. They understand that long-term security for their company is far more possible. When I say that the affirmation took us on the trip, they're worried about the wrong type of trip. Young Tug explained to us best, when we hop off a flight, we all got rich on the way. Stand with me and fail today's legislation. It's a speech of three minutes and seven seconds. All questioners, please raise your inquiry time. before we begin, just quickly. State that. Yeah, I don't see my name on the, the questioning sheet anymore. Just a little confused on that. Senator Yoon? Hmm. I'll figure that out during this questioning block. Do you wish to ask a question? Uh, if it makes things harder, it's fine. Okay, I'll figure that out. I'm sorry. Um, Senator Martinez. Right. So why wouldn't companies want to invest in workers? I don't think there would be a company that exists without airline workers. No, no, no. What I'm saying is they already plan to cut a massive amount of workers. If we give them this money and you want it to go to workers, yeah, that's, that's not happening. That's not going to go to workers. That's what it's you're going arguing. To work. But airlines need workers. You can't automate yeah, their They business. need workers, but they don't need a lot. They'll keep okay, most of them, pay them low wages. Me, can you tell me in that Harvard study, did they see any instance of the PPP limits, uh, like airlines not bringing back workers? What airlines did is they only kept low-skilled, cheap workers. They didn't they pay them anything above minimum wage and focused workers. instead on investments in technology, automation. Can I answer the question? Senator Verma. Hey, Senator. So, okay, once again, you and your speech allude to the fact that companies do get short-term benefits from buybacks. So why can't we implement this bill short-term? This legislation is fundamentally flawed because buybacks also work long-term because the money they get from that buyback is oh, used so in long-term. so you're conceding to the fact that we do have long-term benefits too, correct? Yeah, buybacks are good. That's why I'm on so the So if net. they're beneficial short-term and long-term, why are you failing? By, wait, passing restricts buybacks. That's not good. Restricts by 50%. Time for questioning has now elapsed, Senators. Senator Yoon, you'll see I unblacked out your name. I have no idea how it ended up that way, but all of the speakers who had their placards raised did have precedence over you. Okay, seeing as everyone has spoken on this bill, we will move to vote on a bill to re no, on a bill to help airlines weather the storm. All those in favor of passing, please raise your placards. I count five. All those opposed? count six. Any and all abstentions should be none. On a vote of five to six to zero, this bill does fail. Are there any motions on the floor? Senator Farage. Seeing an actual break in debate, I move to a five-minute recess. Second. 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 Are there any objections? Seeing none, that is so ordered. Please be back here at 7.38. Okay, before I would I also encourage the chamber to take splits on the next bill because it did appear to be uneven when we did it earlier. Yeah, that's I was just going to call for that. Okay, so we're on our next bill is for American Rail. So everyone who wishes to speak on the affirmation, can you please raise your hand or your placard? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. How did that increase all of a sudden? Wasn't it like three? It, it went seven three the first time around. I will say this though, I flipped. Like I had prep on only that side, but um, there are some pretty good points on the negation. You guys should join me. Okay, if anyone prepped a neg and then decided to flip to the app, you can still use your neg, right? I don't think that's what happened. I think I think it was people who didn't like who didn't have a speech. You just didn't have anything. Yeah. 
Lord. <laughs> all those, okay, so all those who wish to go on the neg, can you please raise your hand to your placard? One, two. Is anyone undecided? Okay. <laughs> I'll try flipping. Okay, now we need more people on neg. So if you can. Does anyone have prep on neg? Because like if Verma and I both flip that flip there, we don't have like extensive prep on that. Is it currently three to eight? Mm -hmm. Yes, it was like the other way. And then it do we have a negative down. constructive? Negative constructive? Uh, I like, guess in like, like a one first neg. The first neg, yeah. yeah. Oh. I guess Andrew, you can take it. I don't have enough to do that yet. Like I flipped like last site last be, uh, bill. Would you all yeah, prefer to extended the recess by another five minutes, and then that gives you the time to go ahead and do that rather than end up in the middle of the debate and then after the first speech and suddenly there's nothing? Yeah. I personally okay. won't be able to speak for a cycle, but I'll try flipping to Meg. I'm not going to, yeah, I'm not going to get to like extend out a full speech in 10 minutes. What I was going to say is it seemed like it took us an hour to get like everyone one speech on the first item. And if we, if the second item follows suit, like we only need one hour, there's like an extra 30 minutes of cushion before the hard cap. So like recess to make sure we have cycles, like shouldn't be an issue. I'm just saying like, it just, it would be better to like put the recesses in the beginning. Like, like for example, I like, agree with you. If we're going to recess, recess, we should recess like 20, 25 minutes now. Yeah, I completely agree. I don't think we can do 20 minutes. I think it's like more like 10 to 15 minutes. I need to use a mushroom real quick. I'm sorry. There's now under a minute remaining in our recess. So if everyone could begin coming back and turning on your cameras, that would be great for a prompt start at 7.38. Um, Senator Crowley, I think we're going to go ahead and um, as soon as we get back, just so you know, we're gonna make a motion to go ahead and um, increase the recess by another five minutes. Sounds good. I was going to encourage that anyway, because we're moving quite efficiently. Could we do maybe more like seven minutes? I just need an extra. I think I can flip to Nick, I think. Okay, we can do, we, I can do seven minutes and request that then. Cool, thanks. Can we take one more split? Cause I don't want too many people flipping as well. I just wanna make sure we have the right number. <laughs> and I'll go ahead and run that real quick. Everyone who wants to speak on the affirmation, please raise your hand or your placard. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All those who wish to speak on the negation. One, two, Three, four, okay. Great, at 7.38, I call this session back to order. Motion. I move for a seven minute recess. Seconds. Are there any objections? Seeing none that is so ordered, please be back here at 7.45.
Does anyone know how much time we have left on the break? I think we have about two minutes. minutes. Okay, I'll just wait then. Also, Senator Farage, are you ready to give your nag in like the first cycle or? Because I think I could give mine after the first. I prefer to do second cycle just because, again, I just did this pretty quickly. So I want to make sure that I'm okay, sure. ready. Um, if you need me to, I can go first, but I need you to tell me now. I can, yeah, I'll, I'll go. There's now under a minute remaining in our recess. So if everyone could begin coming back and turning on your cameras, that would be great. I'm almost certain. Um, before the recess ends. Sorry, did I cut you off? Go ahead. Oh, no, no, go on, go on. Yeah. Cool, I can flip too, so that should make it a bit more balanced. Perfect. That'd make it almost easier. Now or do you need one more stuff? I hope it's not unbalanced again. That would be it, it, won't it was be seven, five before. One more, if, 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 please tell us if you flipped other than Senator Dilip Kumar. Let's go ahead and just do recounts again, if that works with everyone. All because those I also started flipping. All right, all those who wish to go on the affirmation, can you please raise your hand or your placard? One, two, three, four, five. All those who wish to go on the negation? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so I mean, we're pretty balanced either way at that point. Six, five splits always work. Yeah. Judge Chen, are you with us? It is 7.45, but we need to wait for all the judges. Great, at 7.45, I call the session into order. We will now begin debate on a bill to rev up American Rail. Is there an authorship, sponsorship? Senator Gorin, thank you. All right, I thank the chair. For the judge's reference, my name is Senator Gorin, spelled G-O-R-I-N, and I'm seeking for the second time in this session, this time on the affirmation. When everyone's ready, can I please get a smile or some indicator? Perfect. Thank you. All right. Don't go where the road leads. Instead, go where and leave a trail. While the author of these words are unknown, it's time this Congress make known the path towards transporting us to a better future and a firm. First, passing today's legislation boosts the economy by increasing productivity and mobility. That's because Section 1A and 1B of today's legislation establishes a Workers' Rail Authority, or the WRA, to connect the 50 largest cities and their metropolitan areas. Freud from the University of Wisconsin explains on March 23rd of 2021 that a high-speed rail connecting major cities and their surrounding metropolitan areas would increase job opportunities and accessibility since it would decrease the time it takes for workers to make it to their jobs. That's a difference between driving three to four hours in traffic versus taking a high-speed railway for 30 to 45 minutes. He further explains that this is especially true in Goldilocks zones, where it is too far to drive a car, but way too costly to fly by plane each day. The American Tr Public Transport Association quantifies in 2021 that congestion on our nation's roads cost $140 billion in lost time and productivity. And the US population is projected to grow by another 100 million people over the next 40 years, which only exacerbates the effects of congestion. The same article further reports that as a result, every dollar invested within the creation of a high-speed railway yields a $4 return in economic benefits. Passing increases the mobility of Americans, enabling them to travel faster using public transportation, which reduces logistical and environmental burdens of driving cars. This increase in physical mobility bolsters upward economic mo uh, mobility as well, because a study conducted by Harvard University in April of 2015 found that commuting time is the single strongest factor in the odds of escaping poverty, because the longer an average commute is in a given country, the worse the chances are for low-income families to move up the social ladder, because finding work and other opportunities becomes increasingly challenging. Thus, today's legislation lays the track for low-income Americans to fulfill their American dreams and turn them into reality. Moreover, 
passing puts Americans back to work by creating over 500,000 livable wage jobs in all sectors, from engineering and architecture to construction and management. The Environmental Energy Study Institute reports on July 23rd of 2019 that every $1 billion invested into public transportation, such as the, in the form of a high-speed rail, creates over 5, 500,000 jobs directly and thousands more indirectly within the cities whose economies are boosted by public transit. The Bureau of Labor Statistics reports on April 2nd of 2021 that currently the unemployment rate is 6%, meaning that 9.7 million people are out of work, unable to pay for food, rent, and other necessities. Senators, the trail we laid today helps us reach that better destination tomorrow. That's a speech of three minutes and seven seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Tong. Thank you. So you're saying that commute time is the singular factor that determines someone's social economic status? It's the study found that it's a single largest contributor to it. So it's not education. It's not about how much money your parents Education have. is actually is, is a factor as well. I'm not saying that it's the only factor. I'm saying it's a okay. And did your study say anything about or compare commuting to any of those other factors? So here's the thing. When you look at like increasing access to opportunities and education, like you have the education- There's a minute and 30 seconds of question remaining. Are there any further questioners? Seeing as we need to fill, Senator Tong. Okay. Um, so moving on to the rest of your speech, how do we know that people are actually gonna use these high-speed rails? Because we're, they would, because it it's much cheaper, especially if they live in the Goldilocks zones. Okay, so do Americans use a lot of public transport right now? I'd say because of COVID right now in the immediate, it's decreased. Or even pre-COVID, right? But like Pre compared to private transportation. Right. What so the mean? more we inputted uh, public transit projects, the more people use them. But we have so many of them and people we don't see it in New York. We saw it in private, D.C. private, do they? People take it more in often than New York and D.C. Hi, so obviously cities like New York, D.C., L.A., Chicago have really yeah. big public transportation systems. Yeah. But this legislation aims to make those in every single metropolitan area in the top 50. Yeah. In those areas, do people there utilize public transportation? I'd say they will with the high-speed rail because it's much faster to travel 150, I believe it's 150 miles per hour or but faster. We, already, we than do have things on a smaller home. scale though, like right Amtrak and those seats are rarely ever filled. Sure, but those can't go the same speeds. Like they haven't done that. Senator Jaleep Kumar. Does the average American commute from city to city on a daily basis? I would say they don't because it makes it's very difficult to do that. Today's legislation increases mobility, enabling that to happen. So if I live in New York, I'm not going to work in D.C. I feel like the average American lives in the city they work. Right. But you all. But here's the thing. You're going to increase the ability for people to seek jobs, especially if in they're, they're in the metropolitan areas that are surrounding those cities. So you're enabling them yeah, to work in cities, but still live outside of the cities. Because we're not using so it and the time for questioning has now elapsed. We'll move on to a speech in the negation. All negative speakers, please raise your placards. I thank the chair. Yeah, Senator Farage unopposed. Thank you for the judge's reference once again. That's Senator Farage, F A R A J, speaking a little bit sooner than I expected and not even on the side I expected. So look at that. Um, please let me know if there's um, anybody who needs extra time. Otherwise, we'll begin. All right. Innovation is one of the cornerstones of American democracy. But for far too long, we have dived headfirst into innovation just for the sake of progress without considering any of the implications. We might cause the development of high-speed rail to move forward, but we need to think about who we are all leaving behind. And that's why we negate. First, Senator Gorin talks about all of the benefits of this legislation for low-income Americans, but we have to vote no on today's legislation because all we do is further economic inequality. Section 2 details that these railways are going to be built in American metropolitans. Senator Gorin thinks that that's a good thing, but I disagree. The Natural Resources Defense Council, a pro bono group of law attorneys focusing on fighting inequality, details in their 2018 report on gentrification that railway systems attract affluent people to low-income areas at an exponential level. And that's because an unprecedented amount of Americans want to live in metropolitans next to high-quality transportation that can take them to their work, bars, gyms, and other places much faster. 
but passing today's legislation in its current state is only going to further that extreme gentrification in low income areas. The San Diego Union Tribune found in their study in 2018 that the building of a new railway system in the San Francisco Bay Area caused over 400 new luxury apartments to be built within five miles of it. With greater demand for new housing in that area, landlords are going to be able to double their rents, forcing thousands of low-income Americans out of their homes. Senator Gorin, none of your economic impacts of these people actually having jobs come into fruition because we displace low-income Americans. But why is extreme gentrification so detrimental? We push Americans to homelessness. The Government's Institute of Education and Science details in 2016 that the biggest catalyst of homelessness is gentrification, as low-income Americans in metropolitan areas are often older and live in pockets of lower-income housing. So when we take away those pockets, we make it almost impossible for them to find a home. Senator Gorin, I understand that today's legislation might have some good transportation benefits, but when we really consider that this legislation is going to harm Americans, we can't pass. Let's also realize that the National Coalition for Homelessness found that being unhoused will take 20 years off of your life. At this point, we are no longer talking about transportation policy, but rather the lives of our most marginalized Americans. Protect them when we negate this legislation. That's a speech of two minutes and 44 seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Gorin. Hi, Senator. So do rent controls protect against gentrification? But we don't have them in the status quo. Right. So, so no, what's stopping us from implementing policy such as rent control? Simply put, we don't have them in the status quo. And seeing the amount of backlash that we got when we implemented them in the past year, I don't think it's likely that this Congress will pass rent control. But we can. We're collected, right? Okay. So even the Senate, if these, High speed rail tr like care enables everyone to be connected in the United Senator States. Senator Nagarjuna. Also so are you saying that like mostly like rich people end up using like the railway? So what I'm saying essentially is when there's like these high speed railways where people can use them to get places much faster, people are automatically attracted to live near those yeah, areas okay. and that's going to displace low income. Yeah, I get that, right? So if like let's say rich people are using it, does that take them off the road? What do you mean? Right. Yes, they're potentially. They're not, gonna, they're not gonna use their car as much like- At the expense of the lives of thousands yeah, no, of No, less cars are gonna be on the road. Now low-income people have reduced like commute No, time because period. they can't even live near their work. So now- no, Senator Martinez. Time so before any a major infrastructure project is embarked on, cities, municipalities invest in impact statements. Why won't the High-Speed Rail Authority in conjunction with the Department of Transportation embark on those assessments and stop themselves from planning in areas that disenfranchise people? Because when we look at the content of today's legislation, if you look specifically at section two, it says that those are going to be built in metropolitan. That's where a high amount of low income families in are In California, your own state center- There are 30 seconds of questioning remaining. In my are there state any further questions? happen at a large rate. Thank you. Senator Martinez. I'll continue that. So the High Speed Rail Authority has already begun planning in your own state to initiate a High Speed Rail Authority. And in that, they've made reports on risk assessments for people displaced. No matter what, okay, no matter what, if you're connecting American metropolitans, you're automatically going to displace Americans because that will increase the value of the property surrounding them. We don't have to. That's why risk assessments exist. No, so that's literally what happens that in that way. There's you. nothing telling us that we have to do that. In fact, it'll connect America. But we do. The time for question has now lapsed. Move on to a speech and the affirmation. All affirmative speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Martinez. I thank the chair. That's Senator Martinez speaking on the affirmation of this piece of legislation. If any of my judges are not ready, let me know, as, uh, as well as my PO and my parley. But other than that, I'm ready to start. Thank you. A benefit of living in Florida is being only a mile away from the ocean. Even better, in the next several decades, my house can sell as beachfront property. Our preparation for the inevitable reality of climate change is laughable, but the economic and personal impacts of rising ocean levels are no joke. We can bear the storm if we fortify our country's foundation, transportation infrastructure, pass this bill. 
As my sixth year term in Congress finally comes to an end and culminates in my final speech, I've learned that the importance of using my voice is advocating for the most important issues in our country today, and especially those who are never able to use their voices to advocate for themselves. The first reason you pass today's legislation is to fight climate change, because poor infrastructure is a huge problem for communities at risk, like my own in Florida, to face the brunt of climate change, because most of our transportation infrastructure is not equipped to conform to changing global conditions. USAID's climate links explains that changes in the variability in magnitude of temperature, precipitation, rising sea levels, and extreme weather events can affect transportation infrastructure. Severe rain can cause temporary or permanent flooding of roads, bridges, and ports. But the benefit of building a high-speed rail system is that it is climate resilient. Section three of today's legislation states that the Department of Transportation will be working in conjunction with the High Speed Rail Authority. The HSRA has been key in creating frameworks for climate resili re resilient infrastructure. For example, in Senator Farage's own state of California, the HSRA created a report in 2017 outlining the environmental risks of a High Speed Rail Authority and how we can mitigate those impacts. And one of the goals for their planned High Speed Rail was to fortify the infrastructure against rising sea levels against California's coast. When we implement this standard nationwide, under their authority in conjunction with the Department of Transportation, we will no longer see our infrastructure fail because we're now fortifying it for the future by implementing an even stronger network. But the second reason you pass is to improve healthcare because a high-speed railway system will connect the majority of the United States and, as we've proven, reduce the necessity for other methods of transportation. That can improve people's ability to access um, healthcare necessities. In fact, Choi Kim and Parker to the Journal of Transport and Health in March of 2019, explaining that in North South Korea, connections to Seoul through a high-speed rail system allowed cancer patients to have better access to outpatient services. And Fergus O'Sullivan of Bloomberg tells us on March 26 of 2020 that in France, in order to adapt to the strains on the healthcare system because of the coronavirus pandemic, French authorities use the high-speed rail system to supplement emergency services in place of ambulances, which actually got people to hospita hospitals faster. We can better address pandemics and close rural healthcare disparities that cause there to be a gap in care when our entire nation is interconnected. That's why you passed today's legislation, not for economic impacts or for the feasibility of projects, for the people it helps. That's a speech of three minutes exactly. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Yoon. I think the chair. So Senator, um, what's your warrant on solving for climate change? Solving for climate change because current high-speed rail projects are climate resilient under the high-speed rail authority. Okay, so you're just saying that like they end up like not emitting, right? Whenever they provide a framework for their projects, they're always climate resilient and, sh and show models okay. on how to fight against the impacts okay. of climate change. So, all right, so on your human health impact, right? Like South Korea is like one fourth the size of California. The reason why it's so right. efficient. If you want an example, the same thing happened in China in which people from rural Senator provinces had access to urban healthcare. Hi, seeing all the benefits of, you know, the high-speed rail, doesn't it mean that more people are going to want to flock near those high-speed rails? Yes, and more people are going to have access. Okay, so for the people who already live there, where do they go? They're still going to remain there because it's not right. like building railroads on top but of- But there's not infinite space for people in one single area, right? Right, but most of it's really- Some people are going to be displaced. Can we agree have... on that part? I'm sorry? If some people are going to be displaced. Can we agree Someone on that part? has to be displaced under the high school. Why not? If there's Time not- Time question has now elapsed. We'll move on to a speech in the negation, senators. All negative speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Tong. I thank the chair. This is Senator William Tong, that's spelled T-O-N-G, speaking for presumably the final time this legislative session and for today. Um, just let me know if you're not ready or if you're ready, that's completely fine as well. Actually, that's better than fine. All right. If the last bill was a plummeting plane, today's legislation is a careening train that will cause us to crash with America's other policy priorities. I'm going to keep with my precedent of not signing on to runaway legislation and ask you to defeat this bill. First, I want to address the impacts of the affirmation by saying that Americans won't be incentivized to use rail. 
Don't buy into Senator Gorin's impacts about productivity, nor Mar Senator Martinez's impacts about connectivity, because geographically, America simply isn't built for high-speed rail. According to Adam Millsap of Forbes on April 15th of this year, high-speed rail does not perform well when population density is low or construction costs are exceptionally high. At 87 people per square mile, America's current population density is extremely low compared to countries with extensive rail systems. Senator Martinez brought up France and Japan. France has about 300 people per square mile and Japan has about 800. Today's legislation isn't going to offer the impacts they tell you. Additionally, we have other forms of transportation that Americans prefer to use. A 2017 analysis of air travel costs found that the average cost of short haul low cost flights less than 800 miles or three hours is only $5.41 and, uh, $5 and uh, cents per 100 kilometers in America. In other countries, that price is a lot higher. And of course, the American people simply enjoy the autonomy that private transportation gives them. That's why, according to the World Atlas on March 1st of 2018, 85.4% of Americans commute by personal car, van, or truck, while only 5.1% commute by public transport. Simply put, Senator Martinez's impacts about connectivity and rural health care, which by the way, doesn't even apply to today's legislation because today's legislation only builds rail to connect the metropolitan areas and uh, Senator Gorin's impacts about productivity all fall. But Senator Martinez, today's legislation also hurts the environment. That's because according to the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health on Jan in January of last year, the total CO2 emissions caused by the construction period of the Beijing Tianjin High Speed Railway was 3,451.7 kilotons. That's equal to the emissions that more than 750,000 cars would release in a year. Beijing and Tianjin are just 117 kilometers apart, but New York and Chicago are 1,271 kilometers apart. So if you construct these rails that end up not being utilized, as I've already told you, you simply increase emissions for no benefit whatsoever. That's problematic because the National Research Council explains that if America doesn't meet their Paris climate goal of lowering emissions uh, to re result in a 1.5 degree Celsius change in this century, crop yields will shrink by 15% and climate change could leave uh, to take the lives of 153 uh, million people. Today's Congress is not so powerless that this bill is the singular option for us to provide jobs to Americans. Don't pass a careening train, negate. That's a speech of three minutes and four seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Wu. Thank you. So on the last piece of legislation, you characterized the air industry as too big to fail. At the very least, when you create a high-speed rail that competes with air travel on pricing, on affordability, on everything that you could want, doesn't that incentivize some people to, instead of using planes, use trains? So in the last piece of legislation, I said the legislation would make the air industry too big to fail. Sure. I would say airlines should be to fail right now because we don't have any other options. Like well, we today's legislation China, isn't the, like we saw this isn't Korea, the like answer, right? right? This is going to cause a lot of emissions. Hi, Senator. So let's say no people take the train. Under Section 2, they can be used for cargo. So how do your impacts still apply? Well, okay, let's say you can use them for cargo, right? But even then, all these studies that the affirmation tell you about environmental impacts are under the assumption that- These high-speed trains are going to be environmentally friendly. That's what their purpose is. They're faster and no, more but that's under the friendly. assumption and taking into account the fact that people use these trains instead of using- uh, uh, cars no, it's not. Section two says Senator you can use it Arguments hinge completely the on the for questioning has now allowed. We'll use move on trains. to be speaking the affirmation senators. All affirmative speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Romke. Hello, y'all. This is Senator Romke speaking for the second time today. I know it's been a long round, so just a thumbs up, and I'll be happy to get going. Nice. This Congress has been filled with a bunch of funny guys cracking a lot of jokes. So let me tell you one as well. Amtrak. That's it. That's the joke. Now, while Amtrak itself is hilariously dysfunctional, the biggest joke in today's round are the extensions and recognitions of the line of thinking of negation. Stand with me and pass today. First, because it establishes financial security for Americans being left in the past. Let's talk about the elephant in the room. No, not my atrocious haircut, but the people who will be building this railway. 
The California High Speed Rail Authority organization explains to us that because of a lack of funding, multiple high speed rail projects in California were suddenly canceled. Why is this so important? Well, the LA Times explains twice on January 12th and March 21st that usually a lot of these construction companies would hire these workers in advance of being given the project. And afterwards, they would fire them on mops. Why is this so important? It created massive turnover and places a lot of construction workers out of work. This legislation gives those workers somewhere to go. The Bureau of Labor Statistics explains to us that construction has the highest average age of any field, with the average worker being 42.5 years old. Why is this so critical? Because until this Congress finally throws them a lifeline in terms of retraining for a separate job or creating sustainable jobs for these construction workers, we need to keep opportunities in the present for them to go to. At the end of the day, we were supposed to learn from the wise, not leave them out. The second reason we have to pass is because we decrease unemployment. Senators on both sides have been hotly contesting this, mainly Senator Gorin for the affirmation and Senator Farage on the negation. Let me clear this up but I'm gonna approach it from a different angle. Let's evaluate the overall opportunity for jobs under today's legislation. The Equality of Opportunity Program at Harvard details how transport is in fact critical to employment, not because they need to get to the job, but in the other way around, they will move to where the jobs are. Senator Farage explains that because we're building these new rail systems, then all of a sudden we'll see massive gentrification, but she leaves out one key fact, rail is big. You're not gonna be able to gentrify the entire city. There's just not enough rich people living in the city to do so. At the end of the day, let's get into the nitty gritty of why rail is so effective. The BCS explains to us that not only are these cities the most important cities because they're large, these cities are also also the 50 biggest cities with the highest unemployment rates. The reason these go together is the lack of public transportation. Now let's extend these impacts. The APRA Rail Association explains to us that public transport creates 50,000 jobs per billion dollars invested. This is a quantifiable impact. It's extremely important we create jobs in the status quo because already hundreds of thousands of Americans are out of work. Beyond this, Harvard explains to us that 62% of Americans across all income brackets avoided taking a job even if it paid more because the commute was difficult. Today's legislation fundamentally solves that. Stand with the affirmation, because if you go neg, then this entire debate falls off the rails. That's a speech of three minutes and 14 seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Luke Kumar. If we build an intercity rail network, are we gonna build a stop in every single neighborhood of a single city? This legislation isn't uniquely intercity because if you think about it, we're supplying a lot of funding and a ton of workers. Wherever we want to build these extra stops, we can. But the purpose of high speed rail is long distance travel. So if you only have yeah. about one to two, I mean, it's also a long city, distance. From like that gentrify the specific neighborhoods right, right. that you're in. Let me answer the question. It's also sure. a long distance from like central Dallas to rural farmhouses, and that's Senator another Barrage. line that's like economically viable to be. Okay. Quick yes or no question: If more people live in a city, does housing become more or less scarce? In an area, yes, but you're not okay, just going to see become, like. Let me ask a follow up question. All right, right, can I give you an explanation scarce? for my answer? Is housing is more scarce? Does the price go up or does it go down? It goes up, but let me explain why this right. doesn't occur under today's legislation. You're not gonna see 700,000 rich people appear out of thin air and just suddenly like gentrify the entire early. city. No matter what, if more people are there, you just told me that- There's a time for questioning the has now lapsed and move on to a speech like, and negation. You can just create rich people. All negative speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Yoon. I think the chair for the recognition is still Senator Yoon. Let's get the show on the road. I know everybody's tired. Um, is anybody not ready? Verbal objections or sounds good? I'll just get into it. I will begin. High speed rail in this country is like a fat hummingbird because while it sounds pretty, it just doesn't fly. While high speed rail sounds compelling because the concept itself is a break from the status quo and looks quite compelling because other countries have made it look nice, the facts of high speed rail are the opposite of compelling. So let's go over why a negation vote is crucial on today's legislation. First, fail because while high speed rail sounds like a futuristic idea, its implementation is regressive to working class jobs at its core. I have one word for this, monopsonies. So what is a monopsony? It's when one organization or a few organizations have a monopoly on the job market in a given area. What does this look like? 
I come from a small city in Southern California. In my city, one company controls the majority of employment opportunities, the Walt Disney Corporation. And why is this so bad? Because it reduces worker wages and benefits. As Brookings explains in May 2014, in Monopsonies, because one company or just a few companies control the labor market in a given area, workers' wages and benefits see on average for every urban region with a monopsony, low-skilled workers' wages drop by nearly 25%. Here's why this high-speed rail directly causes monopsonies. Senator Farage touches on this in questioning. Let me extend it. As ProPublica explains in February 2020, high-speed rail most certainly causes monopsonies because people flock to jobs only around these rail stations and collectively deconstructs low-skilled wa workers' wages systematically. Workers don't realize every low-skilled worker flocking to the same city makes it so that people work for less and lose wages. The impact is simple. There are over 384 census metropolitan areas without, with around 23 million low-skilled workers in them. 23 million people will lose 25% of their wages and benefits without realizing the job flock is what's making it even harder for these already struggling workers to put food on the table. Someone making $20,000 per year, which is already small, is now going to operate on 15,000, making it so that this Congress directly makes their lives harder. 23 million people drastically affected outweighs anything. But let's clash the negative. First, Senator Gorin tells us this is the key to poverty alleviation with one key piece of evidence, which tells us that commute times are the main cause of poverty. But the senator is really misleading when they confuse causation with correlation. The New York Times clarifies this very study in May 2015. Commute times and poverty show correlation, no proof of causation. Don't buy this argument that lowering commute times is the key to poverty reduction. Education and good wages is what logically solves poverty, which this doesn't solve. Then Senator Martinez tells us this will solve for climate change. This is categorically false. As the California Policy Institute writes in January 2017, building high-speed rail requires massive amounts of raw materials you have to mine, ship, and construct. Across all 3.8 million miles of the United States, you won't see a return on emissions for two decades. But further, the CPI extends most US states will adapt electric or hydrogen by 2050. This disincentivizes people to go to those types of cars, which are less emissions than these types of high speed rails. The most important figure this round is 23 million people you're going to adversely affect by passing. Stand with me and fail. That's a speech of three minutes and five seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Romke. Hey, Senator. So let's talk about those jobs again. Like I said, 62% of Americans didn't take a job that paid them more because of transit times. How does decreasing transit times not change this? Well, I tell you, decreasing these transit times leads everybody to go to the same place and low skilled workers lose 25% of their wages, right? That's, that's the, the Occam's. That doesn't make any sense. Today's legislation actively creates jobs, not just by constructing. Well, no, railroads. it makes everybody well, flock to the same place for jobs. How does that make sense if we're building so many because railroads? Because if there's one like railroad Senator in Los Angeles, Gorin. Right, everybody's going to go there. Hi, Senator. Let's even let's say that in like there's like one part of the city that becomes has a lot of economic growth. Right. Doesn't that mean more jobs are created because more shops are created, more business is booming. That's why right. you, you just put yourself in a double bind. Right. Because if people don't have like cars anymore. Right. They're just going to flock to the jobs around these high speed rail stations. They're not going to walk two hours like across Los Angeles. Are we eliminating cars? Places. We're saying that more people are, are going to take the rail instead of the car. But that's yeah, not and they're going to flock to the same place causing job flock okay. and losing everyone wages. Like how, okay, how do jobs disappear? Because now you're creating jobs. The question is now allowed to move on to a speech in the affirmation. All affirmative speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Nagarjuna. I thank the chair for everyone's reference. Senator Nagarjuna speaking for the second time today, N-A-G-A-R-J-U-N-A. -A -A. Again, Senator N is completely okay. I'm gonna ask if anyone's not ready, please let me know. Otherwise I'm just gonna get started. All right, cool. In the 19th century, it was the construction of the transcontinental railroad that signaled the end of the American frontier, but it also signaled a new life filled with easy connectivity and transportation. As that new life has fallen short in recent times, it gives us a reason to affirm today. But right now, American roads suffer from rampant congestion. Over the past few decades, cars have become cheaper and the population has skyrocketed, but American roads have barely changed and have been unable to accommodate the massive influx in drivers. This problem has gotten so severe that the INRIX, a global provider of transportation statistics, found in 2019 that congestion cost our economy $140 billion. Senator Tong, 
Many Americans have been forced to drive their own car on the road because we haven't given them feasible alternatives. It's simply not their choice like you tell us. And that's actually what we change when we affirm. Because while Senator Tong tells us that people won't actually use the high-speed railroad because we have a low population density, the Washington State Department of Transportation concluded in 2019 that creating a high-speed high -speed railroad would reduce the amount of drivers on the road by up to 20%. Now you don't need to take the car to get to work or drive to the city center. You can take a train, which doesn't take up space on the road. And let's even operate under Senator Farage's assumption that only affluent people will end up on the trains. That means that that 20% reduction in congestion helps the same low income population that Senator Farage is so concerned about. But why is it so crucial that we reduce traffic congestion? First, Senator Tong is so concerned about climate change and the environment. That's exactly what the affirmation protects. That's because Jonathan Levy at the Journal of Environmental Health on October 27, 2010, explained that when vehicles are idle in traffic, massive amounts of greenhouse gases are emitted right into the atmosphere. And this pollution frequently is concentrated in urban areas where low income Americans tend to live, just like Senator Farage says. But it gets even worse because the Harvard School of Public Health furthers in 2010 that more than 2,000 people die every year due to congestion related reasons and thousands more suffering from lung cancer and other diseases. But why else is it so crucial that we reduce congestion? It's because it alleviates poverty. Senator Yoon, you are so concerned about struggling workers, but what inflicts that more than the high-speed railroad? Like Senator Gorin tells us, Raj Chetty at Harvard University in April 2015 pro proves that the length of a low-income worker's commute time is one of the strongest factors in their odds of escaping poverty. Senator Farage, when we help alleviate poverty, we're ensuring that our constituents don't have to face the same risks of gentrification that you mentioned in your speech. So today's legislation facilitates mobility in two different ways. If Americans need to drive, the roads are less congested. And two, they can choose to skip driving and entirely hop on the train. So the Transcontinental Railroad allowed settler, settlers, settlers to forge a new life 150 years ago. Although that railroad may have been completed, the dream is far from over. Your affirmation ballot allows the next generation of Americans to fulfill that dream. That's a speech of three minutes and eight seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Yoon. I think the chair. So Senator, my CPI evidence tells you that high-speed rail, while better than gasoline, emits more than electric and hydrogen-powered cars, which all 50 states will transition to by 2050. Because your advocacy directly disincentivizes the purchase of these cars, it increases net emissions. How does that help people okay. affected by climate oh, change? No, like like literally if you look at any climate change statistics, we need to make change by like 2050 for the like climate change. Okay, but I, I also tell you that for over the next 20 years, you're going to see more climate change because you have to have like okay. three point yeah, eight I think a hundred people, Senator like Tom. Hundreds of people on a train is better. Let's talk about congestion. Senator Dalib Kumar brought up that um, the high-speed rail is going to connect very uh, distanced places, right? Like New York, Chicago, Chicago, Dallas, something like that, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so is the congestion happening within Chicago or between Chicago and a thousand miles? Actually to the both, right? Especially for low income. Workers. Okay, but which one does high speed rail actually solve for? It solves both because even within the city, they aren't going to need to drive around because they have that train system to get there in the first place. The time for questioning has now elapsed. We'll move on to a speech in the negation. All negative speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Lynn. Hi, everyone. That's Senator Lynn, just spelled L I N. Speaking for the second time today, I was a sponsorship last time, if that helps. Whenever y'all are ready. Awesome, 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 great. On the first bill of this round, we rode an airplane. And now on the second bill, we're traveling on high-speed rails. It seems that this Congress has an addiction to transportation, but that makes sense because we love traveling away from the truth and logic as fast as possible in pursuit of solutions that don't even work in the first place. I was the first speaker in this round, but I want to offer the first speech that stops this train of a debate from crashing severely. What are the impacts to rural or low income Americans? Because that's really the biggest stakeholder that everyone in today's debate has hold to the highest pedestal. The people who are suffering the most in America should probably be benefited the most by our legislation. 
Senator Gorin and Martinez both tell us that we'll connect rural and low income people to urban centers. That's the only way they access their impacts, a better market ability and increased healthcare accessibility. But section 1B already tells you that the railway system is going to connect major US cities and metropolitan areas and their surrounding metropolitan areas. Which is why when Senator Romke tells you that it decreases rail time, that's not true. Well, it would be true for executives who live in New York and need to grab lunch and a meeting in LA, but not for people who live in rural Texas and need to visit Dallas for a job interview. They wouldn't be impacted in the slightest. The Washington Post in April of 2021 explains the very California project that Senator Romke mentions, but it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows like he presents it. Because it was meant to connect the largest metropolitan areas, exactly like this legislation operates, stop points weren't in low-income communities. They were in areas with no population, so they wouldn't disrupt neighborhoods or infrastructure. But let's pretend and say that this is somehow a long-term effect. Then in 10 years, we're going to interrupt our railway lines and increase them and provide them in areas that don't even offer any profit for these corporations and expand the system entirely. Still, the negation outweighs. Listen to Senator Yoon when he tells you that at best, you give access to workers to places they couldn't visit before, but access to the very same places. Even if you give accessibility, putting it in a direct transit way doesn't increase the amount of market availability or the jobs that are offered. It only makes it so that you veer people into the same crowded areas. But second, what happens to climate change? Because here it's where it's very important to understand how this rail is even going to operate in the first place. Senator N and Martinez both tell you that high-speed rails offer a sustainable option, and on face, they're right. The problem is that assumption is predicated on people actually using it to its maximum capacity. They don't for two main reasons. First, because the Federal Road Administration's 8,600-mile high-speed proposal already explains that it would carry 25 billion passengers per year. That's 0.5% of all passenger travel in the US. But even the second one, what Senator Verma experiences or explains during questioning is freight. But the Center for Clean Air Policy, a proponent for high-speed rails in 2016, already explained that high-speed rail systems can't carry freight because heavy freight cars can't exist safely on the same lightweight high-speed passenger cars. Because of that, you don't access any of the climate change impacts when it's not being used to its maximum capability. That's why you fail. That's a speech of three minutes and 13 seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Nargajuna and Senator Tong, that's granted. Senator Nargajuna, your question. So if like the evidence shows that like congestion decreases when people are like when the high speed railroads build, does that mean people are using it? That's predicated on two things, right? The first is that those high-speed railways are connecting people who don't have access to public transportation in the first place. I already explained to you that that's not true. No, because a high-speed railroad is a bigger incentive to like other sorts of public transportation. I'm sure people would want to use like a high-speed railroad than a bus. And you're connecting it to metropolitan areas specifically and not extending it past there, which I mean- plenty of people want to travel through like metropolitan areas. That's where the highest population density is. Senator Wu. Metropolitan area to metropolitan area. Thank you. So in a world where we produce a climate resilient option, or like at, at the very least, we have another transportation option, right? You would agree to that. I mean, it's an option, but it also experiences five more megawatts than like a regular train would. Sure, sure, sure. So if we warrant you at the end of this debate that at the end of the day, if you have some amount of individuals using high-speed rail over things like airplanes, and that reduces emissions over the next couple of decades, couple of years, is that a reason to affirm? No, because there are a lot of other studies that also prove why airplane travel, especially when considering- Time for questioning has now elapsed. We'll move on to a speech in the affirmation. All affirmative speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Wu. Thank you. Senator Wu, second time today. Uh, can everybody see and hear me okay? My room's getting kind of dark. Uh, thumbs up when you're ready. Okay. <clears throat> There's a popular slogan that we've all heard, think globally, act locally. When writing policy, it is often the case that we balance the two. Yet in our recent years, our policy reflects simply, think locally, act locally. From a policymaking standpoint, we are being pinned down by our consistent inability to think big, to dream, to think beyond the confines of our pragmatism. I implore the Senate to please 
please start thinking bigger. At the end of the day, this piece of legislation is not that complicated. At the end of the debate, the easiest way to vote affirmative is because a connected America organically energizes new communities, what we call exurbs. Senator Tong, the promise of this bill isn't some fantasy that the affirmative just invented. Research carried out by economists at Tsinghua University and UCLA, published in the National Academy of Sciences, found in 2013 that bullet train systems connecting China's largest cities to other megacities have made second tier cities more attractive for workers, stimulating an entire new category of exurbs besides urban centers like Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou. On the Senate floor just hours ago, we were talking about how to prop up struggling K through 12 schools in this country. A connected America means we create thriving communities outside of Chicago, New York, LA, Houston, and Philly, more so than any other appropriations or spending framework can. What can high-speed rail bring to this country? Well, what it brought to China, what it brought to Korea, what it brought to Hong Kong, but double that. The United States is in a position by passing this legislation to reap all of the same benefits and sow even more rewards. Importantly, Senator Farage, to your argument about people living in those cities, I have two layers of responses. Let's review. First, a 2019 study conducted by the states of Washington and Oregon in 2019 found that bullet trains make smaller cities more attractive for employers, bringing them closer to lower-priced housing for workers, providing the swift connection to sustained business operations. But more importantly, what's the implication? That means the workforce lives in the new communities and no longer has to rely on public transit or motor vehicles to get to work. But more importantly, modernizing climate resilient infrastructure directly competes with air travel to reduce emissions. This is what I've been saying for the entire debate, first alluded to in cross-examination with Senator Tong. The Environmental Defense Fund tells us in October of 2016 that this program could prevent 2.5 billion tons of CO2 emissions into the atmosphere over its first 15 years, specifically because it competes against air travel in the long term, reducing emissions. Senator Lin, keep in mind, this analysis I just read to you was conducted assuming only the top half of the top 10 megacities in the United States would routinely use this system. Meaning Senator Yoon, over the next 15 years, if you reduce even marginally the amount of reliance that Americans have on airplanes, that is monumental. It directly offsets the emissions that rail can independently produce. The analysis that my side is making is not specific to this year or the next. This bill is not a way into the future. It is the way into the future. That's a speech of three minutes and six seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Lynn. Hi, why would people want to move away from urban centers and into smaller cities or suburbs when the trains aren't connected to those suburbs? Like they would have so to drive say, to the stop points, right? Okay, so let's get a little bit more particular. When you say people, are you talking about like workers or are you talking about employers? Uh, you were talking about workers in your speech, so workers. So my study commissioned by Washington and Oregon in 20, 2019 found that when you have bullet trains, it makes smaller cities more attractive for employers to go to. And also those smaller cities happen to have lower so priced would, housing for workers. That would be more attractive for employers if they're also- Senator Dilip Kumar. If Americans don't actually use the public transportation under today's legislation, where's the positive benefit of decreased air travel? They do use it. My study from the Environmental Defense Fund contextualizes that even if only the top 50% of the top 10 megacities routinely use uh, high right. speed it's trains. It's not the megacities themselves that matter. It's the people that use it. Low-income Americans can't afford it. So what's the point? We're talking about an environmental impact here, right? So if that number of people uses it, that means 2.5 billion tons of CO2 emissions. Time for question has now elapsed. Senator Tong, that is granted. We're now in line for a speech in the negation. All negative speakers, please raise your plaque. Senator Dilip Kumar. Hi, everybody. That's Senator Dilip Kumar speaking for the second and probably last time today. I'll just ask him, but he's not ready to let me know. If not, I'm happy to go. He's good. Perfect. <clears throat> the first high speed rail was the Japanese Shinkansen at a time when the rest of the world was closing their steam locomotive tracks, the Japanese were drilling it through mountains to connect Tokyo to Osaka. In this debate, however, we don't need drills to find the holes in the affirmations arguments. Let's go through the affirmative advocacy and see why you fail on any front. This entire debate has been predicated on the framework that we actually create this rail network in the first place. Let me explain how much like this bill, that framework comes crumbling down. 
Reuters explains on April 15, 2021, that three days ago, six counties sued the Dallas to help Houston high-speed rail line over eminent domain and environmental issues. And that wasn't an isolated scenario. If you'd like to build rail networks across the country, that generally requires acquiring people's private property through eminent domain. Senator Nargajuna, the number of cars on the road doesn't change one bit because the WRA is too busy litigating lawsuits rather than building railways. And Senator Wu, we don't create bustling exurbs because, fun fact, Americans aren't a, fan, aren't a fan of the government taking their property without their permission. But let's look at the principal affirmative advocacy that we reduce climate change. Senator Martinez and Wu tell us that a high-speed rail network ensures climate resilient infrastructure. I already showed you that the affirmative affirmation never even accesses these impacts because this rail network takes decades to get built. But the true danger is what happens when we wait. A March 2019 study in the Journal of Sustainability explains that large construction projects are one of the greatest contributors to the increase of particulate matter in the air. That particulate matter has serious impacts on both the environment and human health. Senator Farage tells you that the increase in homelessness under this legislation destroys the health of our constituents. You don't even need to see gentrification for negative health impacts. Just building this network does that for you. The EPA explains in April 2021 that exposure to such particles can affect both the lungs and the heart, creating a variety of problems like premature death and people with pre-existing conditions. Senator Gorin, the 500,000 jobs you say we create under this legislation are jobs that put our constituents' lives at risk. So either people aren't going to take these jobs in the first place, or they do and endanger their health in the process. It's the time frame that truly matters. The negation outweighs because negative impacts are compounded by the fact that any, positive, any possible positive environmental impacts aren't accessed until decades later. Understand one key fact. Climate change is an immediate issue. We can't afford to waste decades polluting the environment, waiting for positive returns that never come. The affirmation wants our constituents to avoid the potholes in our roads and with more high-speed rail, but they can't avoid the holes in this legislation. I'm urging you to fail. That's a speech of three minutes and three seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Romke. Hey, Senator, you say this rail will never get built because of all these lawsuits, right? Yeah. So is there already existing massive public infrastructure like connecting these cities? Yeah, sure. I'm not saying it's- Yeah, negative. highways, right? So sure. if we've sure. already gotten the eminent really domain to build I'm saying highways- I'm saying a really long time. All right. If we've already got the eminent domain to build these highways, why can't we build the rail alongside and just like because the same- thing? 30 years to build those highways. We can't wait 30 years to build this rail. But we've already way. gotten approval to use those areas. Senator Verma. Hi, Senator. So let's take the AF at their highest ground. Let's just assume we reduce climate change by having these high-speed rails. Why shouldn't we sure. invest now? Because we don't. I can't take the affirmation at their highest ground because that never happens. What do you mean? Why? Why wouldn't it happen? Because we don't build the rail networks fast enough to have positive impacts. I'm not do saying- Do rail have... networks use the same tracks or do you have to build new ones? If you want high-speed rail networks, those generally require new infrastructure. No, it doesn't. So like, why in this case, would you not have to, um, why wouldn't we pass? I can't contend with that because that's objectively Time false. for questioning has now elapsed. We move on to a speech and the affirmation. All affirmative speakers, please raise your placards. Any and all affirmative speakers. Seeing none, the chair frowns upon a one-sided debate, but we'll move on to the negation. Any and all ne negative speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Verma. Hello, everyone. This is Senator Verma, V-E-R-M-A, speaking for the second and final time of the session. Can I just get any sort of indication when you guys are ready? Awesome, 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 sweet. Great. One of my constituents named Thomas the Train called me just yesterday, and he told me to stand on negation of today's bill. At first, I was a bit confused, but after he explained it all to me, it started to make sense. It seems like the affirmation has lost their ticket in today's round. So allow me to throw them off the train and slow down this high-speed debate. First, you fail because high-speed railways don't actually fix the problem. They simply replace them with a fancier coat of paint. Senator Romke, you frame your entire speech around creating jobs, but let me tell you why we actually lose jobs with the passing of today's bill. First, understand that high-speed railways are just making new trains, not creating new tracks. 
Andrew Nash writes that when you create high-speed railways, all you do is add them to the tracks that are already there. That's crucial because with greater technology means greater machine manufacturing, meaning that you offset labor and maintenance done to older model trains, displacing even more jobs. Forbes writes in 2020 that the past few years alone, there have been 60 million jobs offset by robot technology and a clear sight of that automotive industry. This is only going to continue and perpetuate in the AF world. Senator N, you talk about commute time, but how does that change when there's no incentive to take these trains in the first place? Senator Martinez on your own side said that the system is ideal in Korea. Senator Yoon reminds you that South Korea is one fourth the size of California. So I'm confused on such a link. Sure, you can offer us the solution about creating more track, but in your own speech, you talk about commute time and how it's a priority to your constituents. And if there's more crowding with cars and trains, you fall under your own concession. Don't give the American people false hope. Senator Gorin, your claims have gone unresponded to this entire debate, which is quite surprising because you were the first speaker in today's round. I, as the caboose, will take your claims and add them to the coal that burns to run to the train. Your claims about an increased economy relies on access to jobs. But how do you increase access to jobs when these constituents still have to take a car to the train and from the train to their job, they take another car? So you're advocating that they take a car and a train and pay for both. I refuse to let this happen. Senator Wu, you talk about the airline industry and how if we pass today's bill, you're going to have less, if we pass today's bill, you're going to have discrepancy there. But like the airlines, you're flying high with your arguments concerning to our reality. Your impacts are all short term. Train rides are long, just like the impacts. So Senator Ramke, when me, when you and the rest of the affirmation thinks Amtrak is a joke, I think that our constituents deserve better. This bill only perpetuates the problem that we see in the status quo. It offers no real solvency to the problems that our constituents are failing. I see where each and every one of you are coming from, but I must stand in negation of today's bill. Fail. That's a speech of two minutes and 59 seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Gorin. Hi, Senator. Is it cheaper to fly by plane or to go by train? Train. Okay, so in that case, why wouldn't people use this train to go ahead and travel distances? Okay, sure. Okay, so you're conceding the fact that people will use this train. People okay. will use trains in either wow. world. So okay. making high-speed trains doesn't incentivize users to use trains Wait, more. And not? it displaces so more jobs. Time, the travel time decreases from hours to minutes. Okay, sure. Faster trains means less jobs. Wait, how is it more jobs? We're literally creating 500,000 jobs. They're removing jobs, jobs because you increase technology. Senator Yoon. On your side, but I want to challenge you on why people wouldn't take these trains. If it's cheaper to take this train, and I agree that is bad, but why wouldn't they take the train? Okay, sure. First of all, I'm advocating that we don't have these trains because of the fact that we're going to offset jobs in the status quo. Let them take the trains, but as a government, we have to make a decision looking towards the long term. And in the long term, if we're removing more jobs, it's not going to be any beneficial. Right, but in the third part of your speech, like your your like assumptions kind of rely on that, right? Like whether or not they take the trains. No, my assumptions say that when you create these new trains, you use the same tracks. These senator, these people are not using the trains. The in the time why, why would they use them in the future? Senator Tong. I move the question. Seconds. Second. Are there any objections? Seeing none, we will now vote on a bill to rev up American Rail. All those in favor of passing, please raise your placards. I count five. Any and all opposed? I count five. Any and all abstentions? We should have one. Sorry, my audio cut out when you said something like right before. I'm on the negation just for reference. Great. Okay. On a vote of five to six to zero, this bill does fail. Senator Farage. I move to adjourn. Second. Are there any objections? Okay. Seeing none at the parley's discretion, this session is adjourned at 8.42 p.m. Um, Eastern time, and that's about 20 minutes early.
So great job, everyone. Thank you so much for allowing me to be your PO. We got through 22 speeches and 51 questions. For our judges, I am a competitor. And if you think I did a good job leading the chamber efficiently, I'd appreciate it if that was reflected in your ranks. Once again, I'm Senator Crowley. Thank you all for judging and good luck to my fellow competitors. And I'll turn it over to the Farley. Sure, before I go, do the judges want to say anything? Y'all. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say y'all were great and good luck. Yeah, I'm basically the same. Um, this is tough. This was a great round. Each of you deserve to be here. Um, proud of each of you. And yeah, awesome. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, no, I have nothing more to say. This is going to be really hard even for me after rank one I'll, through 12. Go ahead. I'll add one last thing, which is like, Back, back, way back when, when I was still a competitor, it was known that the hardest break the entire year was, was, was TOC semis to TOC finals. So just being here is awesome. And congrats to everyone who moves on. If you don't move on, like it's real tough, but it was a wonderful round. Yeah, I agree with that. I was, I was just gonna say like the difference between my five or like my six and my 12 is, is marginal. It, it's, it's this thing. It, it, it's really, really hard at that point. You know, it's it's like, I, I don't understand why a 12 exists. So yeah, that's, that's sort of how it is for me. Um, but if you guys, uh, I mean, most of the feedback's probably there. At this level, I don't even know if you guys need feedback, but um, yeah, so it was awesome. Uh, congrats again and good luck to everyone. Thank you so much. And if I never see you guys again, have blessed lives. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for judging. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, a question for the uh, parliamentarian. Oh, Parley left. Do you know if um, what time breaks are posted? No. Okay. All right. Thank you.